Members, Darawa Nona Darawa Nanawo, Yangu Narawari, Duni Manyan, Nanawo Wari Darawa Wari, Naginda, Dindi, Darawa, Narawo Boon, Lin Jamara Lejinian. Members, the words I've just spoken are in the language of the traditional custodians and translate to, this is Ngunnawal country. Today we are gathering on Ngunnawal country. We always pay respects to elders, female and male, and Ngunnawal country. Members, I ask that we now stand in silence and pray or reflect on our responsibilities for the people of the Australian Capital Territory. Thank you, members. <coughs> Mrs. Kickett. I need to move a motion of no confidence in Mr. Gentleman as the Minister for Corrections. Is leave granted? Yes. Mrs. Kickett. I move that this assembly expresses no confidence in Mick Gentleman, MLA, as Minister for Corrections. Question is that that motion be agreed. Mrs. Kickett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I am compelled to bring this motion before the assembly today. The series of unfortunate events that has brought us to this point should astound anyone. I too would be stunned if I hadn't become desensitised to this government's incompetent mismanagement of the prison in the short time that I have held this portfolio. In those nine months, we have seen a multitude of failures from this minister across almost all aspects of the prison. Let me summarise the serious issues that have led to this motion of no confidence in Mick Gentleman. Over the past nine months, we have seen short staffing in the prison cause excessive lock-ins and overtime hours. We have seen two riots, a detainee mistakenly released and at large for close to a week, repeatedly, repeated delays in the rollout of an upgraded database and a $20 million bail program that housed only 44 people. There have been unclear policies, the sluggish drafting of vitally important policies, a deferred reintegration centre, disproportionate numbers of strip searches, ma mass incarceration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, and recently an escape. This motion joins another expression of no confidence. After the detainee escape, the AMC staff held a vote of no confidence in a member of management. All officers on duty and roughly 30 officers who came in off shift raised their hands in favour. Clearly, I am not alone in believing that Minister Gentleman and this government are jeopardising the safety of our corrections officers through their careless management. In November 2020, the AMC experienced its first ever riot. 27 detainees aggressively confronted officers and lit multiple fires, destroying an entire accommodation unit and causing $5.7 million in property damage. The prison hasn't fully recovered. The wing can be rebuilt. But we may never know the damage inflicted on the mental health of the corrections officers. The minister's failures put officers' safety and potentially their lives on the line. As we now know, this government failed to provide adequate emergency management training in the lead up to the riot. Only 33% of the staff reported that they were familiar with AMC emergency instructions. Only 23% said that emergency instructions were clear, and only a meagre 9% agreed that earlier training had been effective in responding to this incident. 26% of staff stated that they had not participated. 76% uh, of staff stated that they had not participated in a training exercise for a similar incident. Lack of training re-emerged just a few days after the riot when a cottage was set ablaze, resulting in the loss of 28 beds for several weeks. One correction officer described the intensity of the fire this way. 
This fire was so hot that our boots were melting to the tiles and the steel handrails radiated a frightening amount of heat along their entire length. All four officers who engaged the fire had lapsed fire refresher training. Another example of the minister putting corrections officers in harm's way. In the past month, two more incidences have eroded public confidence in the minister's ability to do his job effectively. The mistaken release of a detainee and the dangerous escape of another. On the 20th of July, Canberra residents learned that a detainee had been mistakenly released before his release date. This detainee walked free and was at large for close to a week. The government called it human error. Madam Speaker, I reject that claim, and here's why. Blaming human error scapegoats staff for their own failings, and I will not stand for it. Our corrections staff put themselves in harm's way on an hourly basis every single day, and it is shameful for the government to hide behind them. Responsibility for this mistaken release lies solely with Minister Gentleman and his failure to provide correction staff with appropriate tools. The government noted that information on detainees is kept on an electronic database that requires manual checks across multiple files. What was not said is that this database software was developed in 1985 and was considered antiquated when the government bought it in 2004. This database and its recording methods have been criticised since at least 2011. The Auditor General in 2015 stated that they make it difficult for correction staff to respond to requests for information on detainees and noted that officers, quote, emphasized the laborious nature of collating data using correction services record systems. The inspector reported that the current database had frustrated other reviewers going back for years. If the previous reviewers, the Auditor General and the inspector, all regard the government's record keeping system as unfit for purpose, then I rejected the government's claim human error caused the mistaken release of the detainee. Wow. Clearly, it was the minister's fault for forcing staff to rely on an antiquated system known to be flawed. An upgrade to this database was supposed to have been completed by mid-2018, but of course, this government has failed to make that happen. The next incident was more serious, placing corrections officers' lives and the general public in danger. Media outlets as far away as Illinois and Sri Lanka reported it, and hundreds of social media users commented on it, making this government's humiliating prison mismanagement truly global. Returning to the AMC from the Canberra Hospital, three corrections officers in the Camry were attacked by a much larger and heavier vehicle. Taking evasive action, the officers deviated from their route, pursued the entire time. They were forced to run red lights and drive onto oncoming traffic, but the sedan was repeatedly rammed like a rag doll in the heart of our city. After a physical altercation between a correction officer and the detainee, the detainee escaped. Photos taken afterwards showed the front bumper mostly detached from the vehicle, significant crumble damage to the right-hand side of the car, a shredded front tire, a boot that could no longer close, and a ruined rear bumper. Imagine riding in that vehicle when it was being rammed by a bigger vehicle. Most Canberrans would be unfamiliar with prison policies, but online commentary overwhelmingly stated it was obvious that a Camry was not suitable for prisoner escorts. Corrections officers also thought that using a Camry was a bad idea. Unsurprisingly, the inspector had earlier found that the Camry was, quote, 
unsuitable as a general use escort vehicle and was confused why an at-risk detainee could not be transported safely in a larger seat capacity vehicle that would provide more room for the detainee and a safe distancing of staff. So use of the Camry as an escort vehicle for prisoners has been unanimously declared an irresponsible decision by the public, by corrections officers, and by the inspector. Yet, the minister did not stop its usage after the inspector's review. Once again, Minister Gentleman failed to keep corrections officers safe on their job, putting their lives and the lives of community members in danger. His decision damns him. There is no one else responsible for the continued use of the Camry. The recommendations and findings came out under his watch. This is not the fault of the previous minister, nor is it the fault of the corrections staff. Solely it is the fault of the Minister for Corrections, Mick Gentleman. It is his fault. Where is his responsibility? One could wonder, is there even any point in having the minister resign from his already abandoned post? His absenteeism indicates he has already abandoned the portfolio in spirit. And perhaps not only in spirit. After assuming the corrections portfolio and insisting his predecessor did not leave the portfolio in the mess, Minister Gentleman moved quickly to establish an oversight committee for the AMC to develop a blueprint for change. At the time, I expressed the misgivings about this idea. I was concerned that it would add an additional layer of bureaucracy and slow improvements at the AMC even further. I was also concerned that the oversight committee would allow the minister to take a step back from the prison and adopt a hands-off approach. The minister's recent absence in relation to the prison indicates he is doing just that. What is the point of having a minister who passes off his responsibility to a committee? A prison is a place where a government should have the most control and the most opportunity to enact its vision. This government is failing miserably. It has no excuse and there is no outside force onto which it can shift responsibility. The buck stops with the minister and he is accountable. In, the, in his short nine months as minister, he has repeatedly placed the lives and safe corrections officers at risk. We have no confidence in him. I may be the one speaking now. I may be the one for all the more vocal critics of the minister. But I am not the only one the minister is accountable to. He is accountable to correction staff as well because they matter and their work environment matters. He owes it to them to ensure that they have a safe work environment and the opportunity to learn new skills to protect themselves. I speak now to the ACT Greens. The parliamentary agreement for the 9th Assem Legislative Assembly lays out three specific circumstances where the Greens can support a motion of no confidence. These include instances of proven corruption, gross negligence, or significant non-adherence to this agreement, or the Ministerial Code of Conduct. In the parliamentary agreement for this Assembly, the circumstances have been expanded. My hope is that this expansion occurred because the Greens members want more freedom to hold this government to account. They can support a motion of no confidence put forward by the opposition where the government engages in conduct that threatens public confidence in the integrity of the government or public administration. The failures of this minister, crowned by the very public escape of an inmate not only constitutes gross negligence, but has threatened and does threaten public confidence in the integrity of this government and its administration of the prison. Mm -hmm. It would be hard to find anyone in Canberra who keeps a close eye on the news, who is confident that the government is effectively running the prison. The Greens are clearly within their rights to support this motion. This government must do better. 
And it starts with Minister <laughs> Mick Gentleman divesting himself of the corrections portfolio. Madam Speaker, I commend this motion to the Assembly. Yeah. Yeah. Question is the motion is agreed. Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Now, Madam Speaker, I, I have always stood up for workers and will continue to do so. I've done this across all my portfolios and took the same approach when I took over the corrections portfolio in November last year. Managing prisons in any jurisdiction in Australia is challenging. Ours is no different. And this was the clear message I received when I became Minister from the oversight bodies, from stakeholders, staff, management and the union. During my short time in my portfolio, I've met with corrections officers and staff across the entirety of ACT Corrective Services. The clear message from them to me has been one of hope. They are confident in the blueprint for change process, which I set up shortly after commencing in the portfolio, and have a great deal of confidence in the new Commissioner. Madam Speaker, I've heard the message of hope repeatedly including recently at a mobile office, and this morning the CPSU texted me to again indicate their confidence that their members have in me as their minister. We do need to support staff, and this work is underway, and I'll continue to support the Commissioner in doing this. I've also had updates on the blueprint for change process from the independent chair. She is confident and hopeful that progress is being made. As Minister, I'm also pleased to have been able to work with the Commissioner and his team to move women detainees back to their purpose-built accommodation. This was another issue raised with me when I took over the portfolio. The message of hope from staff is also echoed by stakeholders. And I acknowledge there are improvements to be made to do uh, and support detainees better, and this work is also underway. Yes, there have been incidents since last year's election, but prisons are complex and do not come without challenge. What differentiates the AMC from others is the level of oversight it has. As the Inspector of Correctional Services has remarked to me, the AMC has the most oversight of any prison in Australia. This is a good thing. It means, as Minister, I can obtain independent advice, and I've not hesitated in doing this and will continue to do so. This independent oversight provides transparency in the management of the AMC. For example, reports from the Inspector are tabled in this Assembly by you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we must respect the independence of these oversight bodies. It's important we don't pressure or seek to sway their advice through public commentary as they undertake reviews. In the case of the escape incident on the 9th of July, the police investigation has resulted in charges being laid and the resulting matters will be before the courts. I remind members of the subjudice conventions. I also draw the Shadow Attorney-General's attention to the need to ensure the proceedings before the courts are free and fair. The inspector's review will result in a government report, which as always will be tabled in the Legislative Assembly and publicly available. The government response will also be publicly available because this government is committed to transparency. Given the inspector's review and court proceedings, I have refrained from commenting and I'm extremely conscious of the power that our words in this place can have, and I don't want to jeopardise our legal processes. However, I look forward to both publicly, uh, uh, the public proceedings, which will shed light on that incident. Madam Speaker, unlike the opposition, I will show our support for our correction staff, not only in words, but also in action. In contrast, the Shadow Minister has criticised and undermined the Blueprint for Change process, a process that is welcomed by officers and their union. Madam Speaker, let's stop this grandstanding and get on with the updates on the pandemic, housing and homelessness. Question is the motion be agreed. Mr Braddock. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I will note Mrs Kickett was compelled to bring this motion she seems to have been compelled to brief the Canberra Times yesterday. 
She seems to have been compelled, but not so far as to actually write down any details in the particular motion. It is just one line that is brought to this assembly with no justification. It's as if the assembly need to get the vibe of the thing, which is what I was required to do this morning from reading the Canberra Times, where she describes a number of events that have occurred, not necessarily linking back to mix, sorry, Mr. Gentleman's performance as minister. Some of these events took. Some of these events occurred Mrs. Cooker, even you were before Mr. Silence. Gentleman was actually taking on the ministerial responsibility. This litany of events highlights corrections is a challenging portfolio in any jurisdiction, and Canberra is no exception. But there's no such thing as an easy portfolio for a minister. Jails are hard and horrible places. They involve the application of force and removal of freedoms on people who have history of non-compliance and violence. Being a prison guard is a difficult and stressful job, and I would like to thank those guards for their hard work and dedication. Yes, there are problems with the AMC. A lot of these stem from flaws in its original designs. These do not lend themselves to quick and easy fixes. They are complex and difficult to resolve. <coughs> Mr. Gentleman has explained the measures he has undertaken since taking responsibility for this portfolio, and I look forward to seeing how these measures play out. I wish Mr. Gentleman the best in this challenging role, and look forward, as the Green spokesperson for corrections, to continue and to work with Mr. Gentleman so that we can improve the outcomes for all guards and prisoners in the corrections portfolio. Therefore, the Greens do not support this motion. Thank you. The question is, members, can I just remind that this is a serious motion, one of the most serious that will get to the place. Mrs Kickett was heard in silence, and I expect all members to be heard in silence. So the question is that the motion be agreed. Ms Lee. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This motion of no confidence that Mrs Kickett brings today is about our corrections officers, our police, our ambulance and fire brigade, our detainees and our community. The Minister for Corrections has demonstrated time and time again that he is not fit to hold this ministry. Under this minister's watch, we have seen the management of our prisons go from bad to worse and from worse to untenable. The scale of this minister's failures is astonishing and it is inconceivable that this chief minister has allowed this minister to continue in his post. Headline after headline of the problems plaguing our prisons paints an alarming picture of just how bad this minister's performance is. Madam Speaker, please allow me to share just a few. Canberra prison riot at the AMC as disturbance prompts emergency response. Poor discipline and violence inside AMC has guards at breaking point whistleblower. Fires lit during AMC riot forces guards to use gas. Confrontation between officers and 28 prisoners at Canberra's jail. Prison riot caused by drunk inmates. Canberra prison staff angry over lack of tools and training, union says. Emergency services called to another fire at AMC, second incident in a week. Less than 10% of prison staff effectively trained to handle riot, inspector. Confusion over who is in charge at Canberra Prison, report. Investigation into prison praises staff, criticises ex-commissioner. ACT, Corrective Services Commissioner, suddenly dumped from role. Ex-ACT prison boss bags $327,000 roll as riot report tabled. Canberra prison guards not respected or heard union. Guards at breaking point, whistleblower. Women forced to walk past their domestic violence sexual assault perpetrators at AMC. Prisoner upkeep cost in the AMC, highest in the nation. Centre to help prisoners reintegrate into society, failing a running joke, an AMC detainee says. Aboriginal women strip searched in view of male detainees 
to be probed by Human Rights Commission. ACT Indigenous women strip searched twice as often at the AMC. Prison warned Camry not fit for transport two weeks before escape. Like a Hollywood movie, women rams Jeep into police car to free inmate being transported. AMC inmate mistakenly released from jail. ACT government blames human error for mistakenly releasing prisoner. It's not sustainable. Overtime hours triple for Canberra's prison guards. Assaults on corrections officers increase fivefold. Why can't the toxic prison stay out of the news? Madam Speaker, the Territory's longest serving Chief Minister, Labor's own John Stanhope, has raised time and time again the significant issues with the management of our prisons. In relation to this government's rejection of our call for an independent inquiry into systemic racism earlier this year, Mr Stanhope said, and I quote, the minister, it appears, has apparently chosen to not believe the woman's claims. Claims about her treatment, including, it would seem, her belief that racism is an issue at and within the AMC. Corrections Minister, gentlemen, as spokesperson for the ALP and the Greens, has in both words and actions effectively conveyed that they don't believe her. They don't believe that she is telling the truth or alternatively, they don't think her experience or the concerns expressed by Julie Tongs and the broader Aboriginal community about the pernicious presence of institutional racism in the ACT are serious enough to warrant a detailed and independent response. Again, I assume Labor and the Greens opposed the inquiry for political reasons. They were simply not prepared to risk the Liberal Party being recognised for championing a progressive cause. The only reasonable alternative is, of course, that they don't care." End quote. Coming from the Chief Minister who opened the Alexander Abercorn Hay Centre in 2008, it is quite telling, Madam Speaker, that he would publish such damning comments on the performance of this minister and the actions of this government. In relation to the abhorrent regime of strip searches conducted at the ABC under the current minister, Mr Stanhope said, and I quote, of 796 occasions of women being stripped in this period, incidentally while being filmed, a total of only 12 or 0.015 per cent were found to have contraband on their persons. In other words, in 784 of 796 searches, no contraband was discovered and the consequent trauma, humiliation and degradation suffered by the women was unwarranted and unjustifiable." End quote. Madam Speaker, if the members opposite don't want to believe us, if they don't want to believe the corrections officers, if they don't want to believe the detainees, then at least believe what our community Aboriginal elders are saying. In response to the Minister's refusal to launch an investigation into systemic racism at the AMC, Winanga Nimitajar's Julie Tongs said, and I quote, this Labor Greens government are progressive on selective issues. Unfortunately, Aboriginal disadvantage isn't one of them. It reinforces the belief across the Aboriginal community that their concerns are not a priority with this so-called progressive government. An Aboriginal person in Canberra is 19.4 times more likely to go to prison 
than a non-Aboriginal person. Why would any Aboriginal person have any faith in the ACT justice system?" End quote. Madam Speaker, these are the words, the desperate words of a woman who has seen the horrendous impact of prison in our community. These are the words, the desperate words of a woman who knows this government has the power to do something and is bitterly disappointed and angry that nothing is being done. And ironically, the ACT Greens told us during the 2020 campaign that they would fight for, and I quote, the criminal justice system to respect the human rights of victims, alleged and convicted offenders, to end racism, racial bias and racial profiling across the criminal justice system, for people held in correctional facilities to be provided with a standard of care that ensures they exit detention in good health and with a reduced likelihood of reoffending." end quote. Well, Madam Speaker, they squandered the opportunity to achieve this last time. I urge them not to squander it today. Is this the better normal that they want to see for our city? And let's not forget that this is a minister who has allowed, through his gross negligence and lack of care, for our corrections officers to come into harm's way. The same minister who has the responsibility to support and protect our workers in this city. This is untenable. Madam Speaker, Mr Braddock talked about the difficulties with managing prisons, that they are difficult places. That doesn't give this minister an excuse not to step up. In fact, it is incumbent on him to take further steps, extra care and extra duty to make sure that our detainees, that our corrections officers and our community are kept safe. I commend Mrs Kickett's motion to the Assembly. The Minister's record speaks for itself and, it mu and he must go. Yeah. The question is, the motion be agreed. Mr Barr. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the Government will not be supporting the no confidence motion uh, outlined uh, by the Shadow Minister. And I want to take the opportunity to express my strong support for Minister Gentleman and the work that he is undertaking in the corrections portfolio. Minister Gentleman brings experience, compassion and a desire to work with key stakeholders to implement a series of changes within the portfolio. He brings goodwill, a strong progressive commitment to reform and the capacity to deliver change. And he does so in a measured and inclusive way. Why he has been a minister across many different portfolios in this place for many, many years. He is experienced. He works well with the ACT Public Service and with stakeholders. I think anyone who has witnessed his work over many years would appreciate that style and that approach. The sort of measured ministerial role you want in a portfolio as challenging as corrections. And it stands in marked contrast, Madam Speaker, to what we've witnessed this morning. This is a difficult and challenging area, but I don't think anyone in the community would doubt Minister Gentleman's commitment as a representative, a long-standing representative in this place, and as a diligent and engaged minister. Upon taking the portfolio, he's put in place a range of mechanisms and measures to engage with the key stakeholders to deliver a blueprint for change and he is implementing those reforms. So what we have witnessed this morning, Madam Speaker, is opposition for opposition's sake, the sort of standard negativity, the sort of standard negativity that you get from a long-term opposition, bereft of any new ideas of their own, Madam Speaker, and an opportunity seeking an opportunity to grandstand and score political points of a dedicated and engaged minister. Mr Gentleman is undertaking 
a series of difficult reforms. But he has the full support of his colleagues in order to achieve that. And I want to thank him for that work and have a very clear understanding of the challenges associated with delivering it. But I'm confident that he will be able to do so with the goodwill and in partnership with the key stakeholders. That's what's needed now. Not shouty, negative opposition hubbub for the sake of it, Madam Speaker, which is what we see a lot of from the Shadow Minister. We will not be supporting this no confidence motion. Question is the motion be agreed, Mr. Rattenbury. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. As Mr. Braddock has outlined, the ACT Greens will not be supporting this no confidence motion today. We do not believe it is warranted, and we have confidence in Mr. Gentleman as the Minister for Corrections. Uh, as he himself outlined, this is a challenging portfolio, and uh, I think I feel well placed to make that observation. Corrections is a difficult space. We have people who don't want to be there uh, in custody who undertake a range of behaviours uh, that we need to uh, put in place the systems to deal with. Now, Mr Gentleman has outlined his focus on improvement for the AMC. Just as when I took the portfolio, there were challenges in the space, Mr Gentleman has also come into the portfolio with issues that need to be resolved. The AMC has been on a process of improvement since it was opened. We still have, compared to places like New South Wales and Victoria, a relatively young correction system. We don't have the century or so of processes built up and systems in place, but I think the ACT correction system has made significant steps in the 12 years or so that the AMC has been open. And I know that Minister General is, is committed to continuing that journey of making sure that we have a high standard, safe, rehabilitative correction system here in the ACT. Now, it's been noted this morning that the ACT has one of the most transparent correction systems in the country. And I think that's a good reflection on our jurisdiction. Mechanisms like the Inspector for Correctional Services mean that members of this place probably know more about the ACT's correction system than any other member of parliament in Australia. And that is a good thing. It is better that these things are out there. And I think our community benefits from that as well in both understanding the complexity of dealing with the correction system, but also uh, knowing what the government needs to do to continue to improve it. Well, I know that Minister Gentleman is committed to working for better outcomes, both for the detainees and for staff. Because that's both sides of the equation we need to really focus on in these discussions. We've got two really important sets of stakeholders here. And at the end of the day, the biggest set of people we have in mind is the community, because if we run a good correction system, the community as a whole will be safer. I'm certainly committed to working with Minister Gentleman for better justice outcomes overall. It's not just about the jail, it's about thinking about how do we invest right through the justice systems to make this community as safe as possible. But in terms of today's motion, we have not heard anything from the opposition which supports their motion. What we've heard... <laughs> what we have heard... <laughs> members. What we've heard is a series of slights that, that are about the challenges that do arise in a correction system. This is not some fantasy world that the Liberal Party is trying to describe. These things do happen. The question is what the Minister does to respond to it. And I have confidence that Minister Gentleman is taking the right steps to continue to drive the improvement we need to see in our correction system a journey we have been on over an extended period of time to get to the best place we can be with our correction system. And I will, as I say, the Greens will support him to achieve those steps. Uh, we will not be supporting the motion today. Question is the motion be agreed? Mrs Jones. I thank you, Madam Speaker. It's astounding that Minister Rattenbury would get up in this place and defend this portfolio when he was the minister who for many years created the mess that we're in today. 
Unfortunately, nothing that Minister Gentleman has done in the meantime has changed the game significantly. As a result, we have no confidence in Minister Gentleman. At least Mr Barr has accepted that there is a problem. That's the first time in this place somebody has come in here in a debate and accepted that there is actually a problem. He defended Mr Gentleman's ability to resolve the problem. Nonetheless, we at least are at the point now where there is acceptance from the government, begrudging final acceptance that there is a problem. There has been a problem for a number of years. Mr Rattenbury has no right to defend the minister when he was the minister and now sits in the cabinet that's overseen this nonsense. The people of the ACT don't need to be made to feel stupid by Minister Rattenbury when they come to us laughing and absolutely shocked that a Jeep ramming a Camry has become the biggest joke in this city over the last two weeks. That is the discussion in supermarkets, that is the discussion outside schools, that is the discussion in people's kitchens. Can you believe it? We have become the mockery of the entire country, and rightly deserved, because despite what the Minister says about us having the greatest oversight of any government of our prisons, the things that the inspector says are not implemented. That is the problem here. We have known that the Camry was not acceptable, and yet, nothing has been done to change that. And nothing that any minister has come here today has to say has made us believe that anything is being done to resolve that problem before this escape occurred. Why is it that that Camry was still being used? Why is it that a database decided in 1985 that requires people to check multiple platforms after 12 years of the prison operating is still operating? What changed after the last time a prisoner was accidentally let go home? Why was the prisoner then told to please hand himself in? Someone who'd been denied bail. What took so long? Took him a week to be then finally escorted back to the prison. We have had a state of emergency last term in the prison and nothing that Minister Gentleman has done has genuinely changed the fear that officers have and have had for many years that the prison is a tinderbox ready to explode. That inmates have far too much power in that place and that it, there is not an appropriate regime, there is not an appropriate order, that there are too many opportunities for people to take illicit substances, harm each other, harm themselves, and that there are more things that can be done about it. I spent years in this place making suggestions to Minister Rattenbury about things that could actually be done to improve the situation with sharp implements, with lighters, with um, Guards feeling completely like they are being abandoned by this government in a very difficult workplace. I have met with more than one prison guard who over the period of the 12 years that this government has been in charge of that prison have actually started to break down mentally because of their experiences at work. It is just untenable that the Chief Minister and that Minister Rattenbury and that the whole Cabinet here as well as the crossbench from the Greens, will stand up and back in this minister who has not made enough changes since taking over to give anybody the impression that things are turning around. What a joke. What an absolute joke. Transparency is good and complexity is used here far too often as an excuse. Nobody sits around in camera saying, oh, it must be very simple to run a prison. It must be greatly simple to run a hospital. That is not the argument that's being put by any reasonable member of the community. However, it is your job to run it. It is your job as the Cabinet. It is Minister Gentleman's job as the Minister for this area to change so that we can actually see an end to these problems. There are very minimal changes that have occurred since he started. At the very least, I support the move of the women, and that should have happened years ago. But it is too little, too slow, people are being harmed, 
Officers' livelihoods are on the line because they may not actually be able to work anymore after being in these stressful situations. People's psychological state can only handle so much distress, so much intimidation, so much trauma before they actually start breaking down. And these are tough people who have put themselves on the line week after week, year after year, in our correction system as officers. And if we don't treat them with the respect that they deserve of a safe and reasonable work environment, then we do not deserve to be here. And Minister Gentleman does not deserve to be here because there are still grave safety issues. There are still training deficiencies. The prison is still a tinderbox and they go to work afraid. And any of us who have family who have worn a uniform to a difficult job at work know that eventually, when the psychological state of our ACT government employees start to break down, that needs to be put fairly at the feet of the Minister. In this case, Minister Gentleman has not acted fast enough to change what at least we now have as an agreed position that the prison has a lot of problems. Can't blame anybody else can't say that it's OK, it's not OK. And I would like to see a much swifter change so that we don't see prisoners escaping and being let out on the loose when they shouldn't be, and where we can actually see a change enough in that prison system so that there is a daily program, so that people are not bored, so we can start to address the fact that they all have lighters, so that they do not have sharp implements to harm each other with, and so that they are not bored all the time, which has been a problem ever since that facility opened. Money flows too freely around there, and there are drug problems, as the minister well knows. He has not convinced us, all the Canberra people, that he is addressing this appropriately or fast enough, and therefore he should go. Yeah. Yeah. Question is the motion be agreed. Thank you, Madam Ms. Speaker, and Barry. I want to um, speak briefly on uh, this motion and uh, extend my support to my colleague, Mick Gentleman, who, who I've known for a number of years before coming into this place, and I know of his care and his uh, careful consideration in roles like this one, and it's why he put his hand up to be the Minister for Corrections in the ACT, because he has a, a dedication to that job and to the corrections officers, as well as the detainees. So much so, Madam Speaker, that a couple of weeks ago, after the uh, well-known incidences that have been discussed in this place occurred, Minister Gentleman and I uh, visited the AMC, and Minister Gentleman spent that time talking to as many of correctional officers as possible, listening to them about their concerns, and, uh, and trying his very hardest to extend some hope to those correctional officers, rather than coming in here and making a huge fuss about something that needed a dedicated minister to start paying attention to those correction officers in the way that Mick Gentleman did. And so I support him for that work. And while we were in there, Minister Gentleman and I went and spoke to the female uh, detainees who, un under Mr. Minister Gentleman's uh, role, leadership, has moved from uh, to the, uh, the <coughs> specially purpose-built women's care centre accommodation facility. And we got to speak to and listen to the uh, female detainees about their experiences, of course, understanding very clearly that they have experienced complex trauma, family and sexual assaults, as well as coming from complex and complicated lives. Uh, Minister Gentleman's uh, caring nature in that environment was well felt by the, uh, by the female detainees, and they were grateful for his visit to talking to them and listening to their concerns as well. In addition to that, working with Minister Gentleman in his role as Minister for Corrections, I've been able to extend the Women's Return to Work grants to the detainees in the AMC, female detainees, and we got to speak to and hear from one of the female detainees who had been a successful applicant of that grant and how she'd had used that grant to further her education for uh, employment when she's able to um, return to the community after her time in the AMC. And her, she was eternally grateful for the support that Minister Gentleman and I had provided through that return to, uh, return to Work grant and how that could possibly extend, be extended to other female detainees. And Minister Gentleman and I will work on that process to ensure that female detainees can get the uh, work experience and training that they need so that when they do return to community that they can stay uh, in community and out of the justice system. 
Finally, Minister Gentleman also uh, developed a new women offenders framework, which is ensuring that staff with the best are uh, provided with the best practice principles to better support female detainees at the Alexander McConnickley Centre. So, uh, in a very short period of time, my experience of working with Minister Gentleman in this, in as in his role as Corrections Minister, has been forthright, has been caring, and has been considerate in how he has worked with the female detainees, with my office and the Office for Women, but importantly providing corrections officers in that place a, a, some hope that, uh, that he will work with them and with their union, the CPSU, which he described this morning, uh, that they had sent him a text of their support and confidence in him and in that role as well. So in that vein, Madam uh, Speaker, of course we don't support the motion today. The question is that the motion be agreed. To close, Mrs Kickett. Yes, Madam Speaker. Thank you. In response to McGentleman, how he says that he's always step up for our workers. If that was the case, if that was correct, he would not allow the corrections officers to use an unsuitable vehicle. He would give training to corrections officers so they are prepared for riots. He is not stepping up for our workers. What he is doing currently is that he is waking up from his sleep as a Minister for Corrections in the nine months. That's what you're doing. You're not stepping up. You are waking up from your sleepy sleep. The Minister also met with the staff and he commented on the message of hope. Let me reassure you that the message of hope is for you to step down as a Minister of Corrections. The AMC, you mentioned, has an independent oversight body is because you cannot implement a very simple... Ms. ...discussions on motions in the Assembly are to be directed to the Chair and not to the Minister? It's through the Chair. Thank you. Mrs Kicker. Yes, thank you. My apology. Um, Chair, as the Minister of Corrections has mentioned, that the AMC has independent oversight body. It is because the Minister cannot implement a simple recommendation, such as providing adequate emergency training for our corrections officers. Yeah. He needs training wheels in the oversight committee to tell him that here, Mr. Gentleman, it says in the recommendation to provide training for the corrections officers. Please do it. That's not an experienced minister's attitude. That is an attitude of an inexperienced, sleepy minister. The minister also ref uh, refers to, ref he refrained from commenting on a serious event. This is a sign of his weakness and uselessness of a minister. That is not how an adult works in the real world when a serious incident happens under his watch. His behaviour is immature and he is not fit to be the Minister of Corrections. And in response to the Greens uh, spokesperson for the Corrections, Andrew Braddock, just go back and read my speech and be educated on why this is a motion that is valid. The Chief Minister talks about political points. This is not about political points. This is about doing the right thing. The right thing for our corrections officers. The government has been in government for so long that they are blinded and are fixated on their mismanagement that they think all is well, that they think it is good. That is not reality. They have demonstrated that even though they have been in government for years, they are still babies on a dummy that doesn't know how to govern a prison. And when you can't govern a prison, you can't govern a territory. So this motion that I have brought to the Assembly today is long overdue. Some may say that Mr. Gentleman has only held the portfolio for less than a year and that many of the literal fires he has had to put out were ultimately the fault of Mr. Rattenbury. I say that the years-long failings of the AMC are the responsibility of the entire government. Since the opening of the prison, the, this government has flopped and stumbled its way from crisis to crisis. And its response to its errors in the past has been the same as it was today. To dodge responsibility, to pass it on to someone else. 
When will this government take responsibility for the sad state of our prison? This motion may have been defeated, but it still served at least one purpose, to ensure that this government knows that we in the opposition and the people of Canberra have no confidence in the minister, in Minister Gentleman, and that his miserable management of the AMC will no longer be tolerated. The government's failings are no longer contained to the prison, where the government can hope that fences will hide the problems within. Its failings were in full view on the 9th of July all over Oxley Street, Hindmarsh Drive and Canberra Avenue. And let's not forget the previous escapes from the prison of two detainees in 2016, one of whom was at large for eight days. I am disappointed that this motion was not supported by the Greens, who continue to show themselves as spineless, useless MLAs. I know I am joined by many Canberrans who were hoping the Greens would actively condemn government shortcomings and not just blow hot air. Unfortunately, the so-called crossbench have showed themselves only capable of crossing the Canberras who had a silver of hope that they would use their influence to hold the government to account. I want to mention a group that I think are often forgotten. Minister Gentleman is accountable to officers' families and loved ones. Everyone who goes to work has the right to come home safely. Corrections officers have the right to know that when they say goodbye to their loved ones, they will see them home safe again. The minister disrespects these families by not placing the safety of their loved ones as a priority. I worry for our corrections officers and the staff at the AMC who must continue to endure a government that does not put their safety first and doesn't appreciate the work they do. I wish for them to know that I will continue as well as my colleagues with the Canberra Liberals to have their backs and listen to their concerns. I also worry for the safety of our community. It is not just detainee escapes that endanger Canberrans, but also the failings of this government to rehabilitate detainees and prevent further reoffending. To Canberrans, I say the Canberra Liberals are the only party that will, meaning, that will take meaningful actions to hold this government to account and to improve community safety. Thank you. Yeah. The question is that the motion, Mrs Kicketts, be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those who say no, aye. the noes have it. Aye. Division required, ring the bells. There is a pair in place. Uh, Miss Lauder and... I would say all those are present are present. Lock the doors. So, members, the question before you is that Miss Kickett's um, motion of no confidence be agreed, and I'll call the clerk. Mr. Barr? No. Ms. Berry? Mr. Braddock? No. Ms. Birch? No. Mr. Kane? Aye. Ms. Castley? Ms. Chain? No. Ms. Clay? No. Ms. Davidson? No. Mr. Davis? No. Mr. Gentleman? No. Mr. Hanson? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Kickett? Yes. Ms. Lauder? Ms. Lee? Yes. Mr. Milligan? Yes. Ms. Orr? No. Mr. Parton? Yes. Dr. Patterson? No. Mr. Patterson? No. Mr. Rattenbury? No. Mr. Steele? No. Ms. Stephen Smith? No. Ms. Vazzarotti? No.
The result of the divisions are ayes 8, noes 15, therefore it's resolved in the negative. Thank you, members. I'll call the clerk and we'll move to petitions. Uh, Mr Madam Hanson. Madam Speaker, uh, I move a leave of absence for Ms Lauder for this sitting week for personal reasons. Question is the absence for Ms Lauder be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Thank you, Mr Hanson. Now I'll call the clerk for petitions. The following uh, petition, e-petitions has been lodged uh, by Mr Braddock from 714 residents requesting that the Assembly call on the Suburban Land Agency and the Minister for Planning to suspend the auction of sites in Gungarland Town Centre until a number of actions have been undertaken. By Mr Pedersen from 509 residents, requesting that the Assembly call on the ACT <coughs> Government to fund significant upgrades to the Nichols Oval amenities, including changing facilities, rehabilitation of the turf and a new community centre. By Mrs Jones from 1,527 residents, requesting that the Assembly call on the ACT Government to amend the Red Hill Integrated Plan to remove the development on the Federal Golf Course and reject amendments to the Territory Plan that would enable a housing development. By Ms Lee from 516 residents, requesting that the Assembly reject Draft Variation 375 to the Territory Plan relating to a manor house development in Griffith. In accordance with Standing Order 99A, these petitions will be referred to the Standing Committee on Planning, Transport and City Services. And the terms of these petitions will be recorded in Hansard and copies referred to the appropriate ministers for response pursuant to Standing Order 100. The following responses to petitions have been lodged by a minister. By Mr Gentleman as Minister for Planning and Land Management, dated the 14th of July 2021, in response to petitions lodged by Ms Birch on 20 April 2021 concerning the proposed development of Ch Chisholm Village, and by Mr Steele as Minister for Transport and City Services dated the 29th of June 2021 in response to petitions lodged by Mr Pedersen on 20th and the 23rd of April 2021 concerning proposed upgrades to Yerby Pond. Pursuant to Standing Order 98A, I propose the question that the petitions and response and so lodge be noted. So the question is that that motion be agreed. Ms Lee. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I seek leave to table an out of order petition of 337 signatures to supplement the petition lodged in my name. Is leave granted? Yes. Granted, Ms Lee. Thank you. And uh, I speak on the petition by the Griffith Narrabundo Community Association, or the GNCA, uh, calling on the Assembly to reject uh, draft variation 375. In total, with the out-of-order petition, it's signed by a total of 853 residents. And I want to be clear, Madam Speaker, that despite the spin by the Minister for Planning, the Canberra Liberals do not oppose demonstration housing. The demonstration housing project, which includes Manor House in Griffith, plays an important role in showcasing different types of development and giving Canberrans more agency to choose from different ways of living. What the Canberra Liberals do oppose, however, Madam Speaker, is poor planning. And we have seen some of the worst cases of poor planning under this Labor Greens government. And we do share the concerns of the community of an RZ2 development happening on an RZ1 block. The community is fed up with planning decisions that go against what the community wants, what the community expects, and more importantly, the community is fed up with a government that does not comply with its own planning rules. The petitioners contend that spot variations to the territory plan should not be used as a mechanism to allow dense development on RZ1 blocks, and we share those concerns. <clears throat> there has also been some commentary in the media that the minister has labelled this petition a, quote, deliberately misleading scare campaign, end quote. This is a huge slap in the face and a huge disrespect to the members of the GNCA, but also for the over 850 residents in my electorate who are raising genuine concerns and expressing genuine no confidence in the minister's ability to adhere to its own planning laws. As a local member, Madam Speaker, I cannot ignore more than the 500 objections that were raised to the draft variation back in April. And as an assembly, we cannot ignore the 850 signatures uh, to this petition and this issue either. That is why the people elect us to represent their views in this place. And that is why I sponsored this petition. 
The Canberra Liberals support development that is in line with community expectations and only in the last month the Minister for Planning announced that we need to start again with our planning laws. I mean, a long overdue but an inconceivable admission of this government's long-standing failures when it comes to planning in our city. We know that the Canberra community have little confidence in our planning system and this is yet, yet another way of undermining community expectations on what they will see in our suburbs. I implore all members in this place, especially the members of the committee, um, that this draft variation will be referred to, to remember the 853 residents who signed this petition. Now, Madam Speaker, I note that as a variation to the Territory Plan, DV375 will be referred to the uh, Standing Committee on Planning, Transport and City Services, and I sincerely hope that the committee looks into this draft variation when they do so, that they also remember the wording of the petition and the 853 residents who signed it. We are, after all, here to serve the community. Uh, finally, can I thank the Griffith Narrabunda Community Association and in particular their chair, David Denham, for his work in collecting the signatures, engaging with members of the community and for bringing this important matter to the Assembly. The question is the motion be agreed. Mr Patterson. Speaker, and I rise today to thank the Gungahlin Eagles Rugby Union Club and the wider Gungahlin community for their hard work in bringing this petition forward about Nichols Oval. They've done an amazing job to collect over 500 signatures. The Nichols Oval has served as the local sporting hub for the community of Nichols, but also the wider Gungahlin district for over 20 years. Most importantly, it's also home to the Eagles. The local community would like to see their facilities improved, and I think they're right. A little bit of TLC at Nichols Oval would be very appreciated. The central issues that the community would like to see addressed are the change rooms and the turf quality. In the past 20 years, the amenities at Nichols haven't changed, and 20 years ago, we weren't building facilities with quite the same wisdom that we do now. We didn't build any female change rooms. It's pretty obvious, if you don't have the changing facilities for women, it makes their participation more challenging. Early this year, I wrote to Minister Berry on behalf of the club to request this upgrade, and the Minister has noted the request and will consider it amongst competing priorities. I believe that this petition should showcase just how much community support there is for the project. The second issue the community would like to see addressed is the turf quality. A recent TCCS physical and chemical analysis report showed that there are a number of issues with the field. The report indicated excessive compaction issues, low soil aeration, low infiltration and hydraulic conductivity rates causing shallow rooting and a lack of vigour and resilience of the turf. The recommendations made by TCCS was either a complete reconstruction or the option to install suitable drainage over the entire site. I believe that this work is still in the works, but the community would like to see it resolved as turf issues cause injuries. And no one wants to play on unsafe ground. Madam Speaker, I'm hopeful that we can make Nichols Oval a top-notch facility once again, and I want to once again thank the Gungahlin Eagles for bringing this forward. Question is that the motion be agreed. Mr Braddock. Madam Speaker, and I wish to speak to the petition lodged in my name of the suspension of sales in the Gungahlin Town Centre. It may be no surprise to the members here that I have an intense interest in the future of Gungahlin Town Centre and ensuring that the community gets a town centre to be proud of. A town centre that serves the community. A town centre that the community has helped shape. It is in this spirit I am proud to present this petition and thank the Gungahlin Community Council for the work they have done in obtaining signatures to it. I would like to note, to note petitions like this are a symptom of a diminution of trust. When the community does not have trust in the planning system, they have no choice but to resort to absolutes, to call for all sales to stop. And I support them in their frustration, their disillusionment, their weariness and exasperation in a system that has repeatedly failed them. And as a community, we are facing a time imperative. As the final blocks are sold and built on, the opportunity door closes. The door closes on our ability to craft a town centre that works for everyone, that provides a sense of place, employment, services, community and economic activity. My motion, passed by this Assembly, forms just one block in helping rebuild that trust in the community. 
by ensuring that future sales are more in line with community views. The Planning, Transport and City Services inquiry into draft variation 364 is also currently underway and is another block to rebuilding that trust. I hope this petition gives the committee members food for thought about the opinions of Gungahlin residents. And with one block after another, we rebuild that trust, because if we don't, we are left with nothing but absolutes. Thank you. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Ms Stephen Smith. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. I rise today to provide an update on the COVID-19 situation in the ACT and the plans, preparations and actions the government continues to take to protect the health and wellbeing of Canberrans. The COVID-19 situation across the country is constantly changing, and over the past month, millions of Australians have been affected by travel restrictions, stay-at-home orders and clusters in their local region. Fortunately, the situation in the ACT remains strong with no locally acquired cases and a high uptake of vaccination appointments. This is in large part thanks to the incredible efforts of our public health officials and the Canberra community right throughout this pandemic. So while we continue to be well placed in our COVID-19 response, we cannot afford to become complacent. Mr Assistant Speaker, the COVID-19 situation across Australia has changed significantly since my last update on the 22nd of June 2021. We've seen outbreaks in New South Wales and Victoria, as well as new locally acquired cases in Queensland, South Australia, Western Australia and the Northern Territory. Each of these jurisdictions has tightened their public health restrictions and implemented stay-at-home orders in an effort to slow the spread of the virus. The ACT government has been closely monitoring the situation in each jurisdiction, and our health and compliance teams have been working tirelessly to protect Canberra from any potential outbreak. This has generally involved mirroring the restrictions in place in other jurisdictions to support their public health response and protect the ACT community from the risk of seeding. I'm pleased to report that there have been no positive cases detected in the ACT, despite the increased risk of incursions, particularly from New South Wales. We've seen our testing rates increase in response to new cases and outbreaks across the country, and I want to thank the entire community for continuing to do the right thing to keep Canberra safe and strong. The COVID-19 situation in New South Wales is continuing to evolve, with a range of public health restrictions having been put in place across the state, including stay-at-home orders for the Greater Sydney region and in some areas within regional New South Wales in, in response to ongoing community transmission. On the 16th of June 2021, a positive case was recorded in a worker transporting international flight crew. This case led to the identification of several exposure locations in the eastern suburbs of Sydney and case numbers began to increase as more people were confirmed as close and casual contacts. As a result, the New South Wales Government introduced stay-at-home orders for the local government areas of City of Sydney, Waverley, Randwick, Canada Bay, Inner West, Bayside and Willara from 4pm on the 23rd of June. The ACT mirrored these stay-at-home requirements with ACT residents required to complete an online declaration and non-ACT residents required to seek an exemption before travel. On the 25th of June, following an assessment of the situation in Sydney, and the ACT extended the existing stay-at-home requirements to cover all local government areas in metropolitan Sydney. The following day, the New South Wales Government announced that the stay-at-home order would be expanded to cover all of Greater Sydney, the Blue Mountains, Central Coast, Wollongong and Shell Harbour for anyone who had been in these areas since the 21st of June 2021. The ACT acknowledged the increased risk of the situation in New South Wales to the Canberra community and moved quickly to expand stay-at-home requirements for all travellers who had left the Greater Sydney region from the 21st of June 2021. In response to a rise in locally acquired cases in the Greater Sydney region, particularly as cases continued to be in the community while infectious, the ACT declared Greater Sydney, the Blue Mountains, Central Coast, Wollongong and Shell Harbour as COVID-19 affected areas from 11.59pm on the 9th of July. Anyone who left these COVID-19 affected areas on or after 11.59pm on the 9th of July and travelled to the ACT was required to enter quarantine for 14 days upon their arrival to the ACT rather than adhering to the stay-at-home requirements. These travel restrictions remain in place, with ACT and non-ACT residents seeking to travel from these COVID-19 affected areas required to apply for an exemption from ACT Health prior to their travel. <clears throat> Returning ACT residents are granted an exemption once there has been verification of identity and residency in the ACT and confirmation of the location and suitability of the quarantine premises. 
However, we strongly advise Canberrans not to travel to Greater Sydney, Central Coast, the Blue Mountains, Wollongong and Shell Harbour regions of New South Wales at this time. On the 13th of July, ACG Health was informed of a positive COVID-19 case in an individual who worked in a construction site in Goulburn on the 9th of July and that a number of contacts were potentially residing in the ACT. In response to this, ACG Health worked closely with New South Wales Health to identify 26 contacts in the ACT who were all classed as casual contacts based on risk assessments. ACG Health supported these individuals to get tested and remain in isolation until they received a negative test result. Fortunately, all 26 casual contacts have returned negative tests and were subsequently released from isolation. In addition to the travel restrictions to the Greater Sydney region, stay-at-home requirements were implemented for anyone travelling from the local government areas of Orange, Blaney and Cabon on or after the 21st of July, after an individual transited through these areas of regional New South Wales on the 17th of July while infectious with COVID-19. Several exposure locations were identified and the New South Wales Government instructed people in these local government areas to follow its stay-at-home orders until 12.01am on the 28th of July. The ACT lifted its stay-at-home requirement for Orange, Blaney and Cabon LGAs following the conclusion of the New South Wales Government's orders. The ACT will continue to monitor the situation in New South Wales, in particular the surrounding region, and we may introduce further travel restrictions if they are needed to minimise the risk of virus transmission in the ACT. Bless you. Madam Speaker, since my last update to the Assembly, the states of Victoria and South Australia and local government areas of the, in the Northern Territory, Western Australia and Queensland have been under stay-at-home orders for periods of time due to outbreaks linked to interstate incursions of COVID-19. In response to these stay-at-home restrictions, the ACT government mirrored the requirements set by the jurisdictions with ACT residents required to complete a declaration form within 24 hours prior to entering, entering the ACT from the impacted jurisdiction and non-ACT residents only permitted to enter with an approved exemption. Once in the ACT, impacted individuals were required to stay at home except for essential purposes and wear a mask when leaving home. On Saturday the 31st of July, a stay-at-home order was introduced for 11 local government areas identified by the Queensland Government. Given the risk associated with the fact there is a missing link for an overseas traveller to the known cases in South East Queensland, the ACT has implemented a stay-at-home requirement for anyone who left these LGAs on or after the 21st of July. Yesterday, in line with the Queensland Government announcement that its stay-at-home order would be as extended until Sunday the 8th of August, the ACT's stay-at-home requirement was also extended. We are closely monitoring the situation in South East Queensland and will continue to assess, assess the risk to Canberrans as it involves. The ACT Government encourages Canberrans to minimise interstate travel at this time and to be prepared to reconsider plans at short notice. We understand that this is a difficult time for many people in our community and we acknowledge the impact that travel restrictions have on families, workers and our border communities. The Chief Health Officer will continue to assess the risk of interstate outbreaks to the ACT and amend our travel restrictions as necessary. With state outbreaks continuing to occur across the country, it is also once again a stark reminder for all of us to maintain our COVID safe behaviours and keep up to date with the latest health advice to protect our community. This includes staying home if you're unwell, getting tested for COVID-19 if, if experiencing any COVID-19 symptoms, physically distancing from people you do not know, practising careful hand and respiratory hygiene, using the Check-in Canberra app when out and about for contact tracing purposes, and booking your COVID-19 vaccination appointment when eligible to protect yourself and the community. Our fantastic digital team continues to refine and update the Check-in Canberra app, responding to feedback and suggestions from the community. The latest version of the app was re released on the 21st of July and included the ability to check in offline, which allows check-ins to occur without a data connection. This means that if there is no signal or a user doesn't have phone data and can't access Wi-Fi, people can still check in and the data will be uploaded when the phone next has access to data. The update also included improved user functionality, such as frequent location check-in, flashlight toggle for check-ins in poorly lit places, as well as allowing the app to redirect to New South Wales to the New South Wales check-in web form when scanning New South Wales codes. The digital solutions team who built the app will continue to work with the community to ensure that the user experience is excellent while keeping us safe and allowing efficient and effective contact tracing. Mr Assistant Speaker, the COVID-19 vaccination program continues to progress steadily in the number of vaccines administered in the ACT. 
delivering a safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine program is the priority for the ACT government. And today we can report that we have reached 50% of adults in the ACT having had a first dose of vaccine and 25% fully vaccinated. In addition, those in the oldest age groups have high levels of vaccination, with almost 92% of those aged 70 and over vaccinated with one dose and more than 50% covered with two doses, including 50% of 70 to 79 year olds and 53% of those aged 80 and over. Vaccination is a priority that was reinforced by the Doherty Institute modelling work discussed at National Cabinet on Friday the 30th of July, which outlined the pathway to reduce restrictions, reduce likelihood of stay-at-home orders and reduced impact on people's lives is to have more than 80% of eligible Australians vaccinated with both doses. We are working hard to make that a reality and to ensure that Canberrans and those from the surrounding region can readily access the vaccine as it becomes available from the Commonwealth. The ACT government is anticipating a significant increase in vaccine supply from the Commonwealth, putting the ACT in a good position to open more appointments to eligible Canberrans. Indeed, today we have been able to announce that appointments at ACT government vaccination hubs are now open to 30 to 39 year olds. Through an improved clinic model, our clinics have increased capacity to administer more than 14,000 doses per week. Half of the additional 4,000 vaccine appointments per week are reserved for high-risk eligibility groups, including healthcare disability and aged care workers. The ACT government is continuing to implement program changes with efforts focused on improving the uptake amongst these high-risk groups. The Access and Sensory COVID-19 clinic for people with disability at Garen continues to be well received by the Canberra community. Through some successful innovation in clinic flow, Canberra Health Services has been able to double, double the number of appointments each week without compromising its surface to individuals and their carers. Mr Assistant Speaker, the ACT government has been focused on ensuring equity of access to vaccines for those Canberrans unlikely to engage with health services. This may include homeless and housing insecure populations, culturally and ling linguistically diverse communities, people living with drug and alcohol dependencies or mental health challenges, and some congregate living arrangements, including secure facilities, supported accommodation and refuges. To ensure we are reaching these Canberrans, we are working with key stakeholders to develop and implement programs to support COVID-19 vaccination. At the end of June, the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee, or AHPPC, recommended to National Cabinet that the residential aged care workforce be vaccinated against COVID-19 as a condition of working in residential aged care facilities. To assist in facilitating this requirement, our health officials are continuing to liaise directly with residential aged care facilities and community groups to further promote uptake of vaccinations to workers, as well as offering any workers the option to be contacted directly to book their vaccination appointment and skip booking lines. On Thursday the 22nd of July, the Prime Minister announced all community pharmacies across Australia will be eligible to request their involvement in the AstraZeneca rollout. The Prime Minister noted it was expected that pharmacies should be able to begin administering AstraZeneca from mid-August. The Chief Health Officer has recently amended the relevant regulation to support this decision. The supply of vaccines to primary care is also increasing substantially. There are currently 21 general practices with access to Pfizer vaccine and another five practices coming online in the next week. Weekly supply to primary care is estimated to increase to 6,300 Pfizer doses in the first week of August, increasing to 7,200 doses in the last week of August. For AstraZeneca, there are more than 80 participating GP and Commonwealth-led respiratory assessment clinics administering this COVID-19 vaccination in the ACT. Thank you to Canberrans who have already stepped up to receive a COVID-19 vaccination, and I encourage all Canberrans to get vaccinated when they are eligible. Mr Assistant Speaker, since my last update to the Assembly, the ACT government has implemented two new public health direct restrictions in response to the increasing COVID-19 cases across the country and the risks associated with more infectious strains of coronavirus, including the Delta variant. Following the implementation of stay-at-home orders across the Greater Sydney region and tighter public health restrictions for regional New South Wales, the Chief Health Officer advised the ACT government of the need to mandate the use of face masks in indoor settings in the ACT where physical distancing was, not, was difficult or not possible. This resulted in a new public health direction coming to, into effect from midnight on the 28th of June 2021, requiring anyone 12 years of age or over to wear a face mask in indoor settings, including supermarkets, shopping centres, retail, hospitality venues, public transport and taxi and ride share services, hairdressers and personal services, gyms and high-risk settings such as health and aged care facilities. 
Although this was the first time throughout the pandemic that Canberrans were required to wear masks, our community wholeheartedly embraced this important public health measure. With the COVID-19 situation in regional New South Wales stabilising and no cases identified in the ACT, the ACT government was able to lift the mask requirement from 11.59pm on the 9th of July. The government is still encouraging Canberrans to wear face masks when they are in indoor spaces where physical distancing is not possible, such as public transport or crowded indoor venues, to help protect our community as we continue to respond to the risk of COVID-19. The use of the Check in Canberra app became mandatory for all retail settings, public transport and taxi and ride share services from the 15th of July, in addition to restricted businesses and venues. In addition, the 15 minute period when check in wasn't required upon entry to a business or venue has been removed. This means all patrons must check in when entering a premise with check in Canberra, regardless of how long they are planning to spend in the venue. As of the 31st of July, more than 17,000 venues had registered with check in Canberra. More than 30 million people had checked in, well, more than 30 million check ins had been recorded, and the app had been downloaded 912,000 times. We have seen the benefits of the widespread use of contact tracing apps in responding to outbreaks, and these new changes to Check in Canberra will enable ACT Health's contact tracing teams to respond even more quickly and effectively if a case is identified in the ACT. Mr Assistant Speaker, the ACT continues to support the return of government officials, diplomats and their families, with a total of 2,300 individuals completing quarantine at home or in managed quarantine facilities as of the 29th of July. In preparation for this week's federal parliamentary sitting, ACT Health has worked closely with the Australian Government Department of Health and parliamentary presiding officers to implement risk mitigation measures within Parliament House. These measures include reduced occupancy limits across the building, restricting public access, requesting parliamentarians to reduce the number of staff present in their offices, and increase cleaning and sanitising of commun communal areas. With several states still recording new cases of COVID-19 and Greater Sydney still in lockdown, ACT Health will continue to work closely with Commonwealth parliamentary and medical officials to address the risk that parliamentarians and staff may seed cases into the ACT. In closing, Mr Assistant Speaker, the Chief Health Officer provided her latest report to me on the status of the public health emergency due to COVID-19 in the ACT on the 10th of July, which I now table. This report outlined the COVID-19 situation here in the ACT and across Australia, including operational activity that has been undertaken in the ACT by the ACT's health and compliance authorities. The Chief Health Officer recommended that the public health emergency remain in place at this time due to the ongoing risk of COVID-19 to the Canberra community. The current situation in Australia is a serious challenge for all of us. It is vital that we continue to work together as a community to minimise the risk of transmission within the ACT and all do our part to support the ongoing public health response. I present a copy of the statement and move that the Assembly take note of the paper. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Does that opinion say aye? Country no. I think the ayes have it. Ms. Stephen Smith. Thank you, Mr. Assistant Speaker. On the 31st of March 2021, the Assembly supported a motion about improvements to services for people who have experienced sexual assault. That motion was brought forward by Mrs. Jones, and I want to acknowledge again the shared commitment that was evident across the chamber to improving services and outcomes in this space. The resolution has passed called on the ACT government to investigate the accessibility and availability of the Canberra Rape Crisis Centre and Canberra's Forensic and Mental Medical uh, Sexual Assault Care or FAMSAC service. The government committed to report back to the Assembly on the progress of matters regarding the Assembly resolution on the 30, of the 31st of March by the first sitting day in August 2021. First, I am pleased to report that information on how to access ACT Government sexual assault care and support services was updated on the ACT Health website on the 1st of April 2021. This update ensures that appropriate and consistent contact points are easy to find in what is a traumatic and difficult time for vic victim survivors. It is important to emphasise that access to appropriate health services following sexual assault follows a no-wrong-door approach. A person can access services by presenting to an emergency department, calling the numbers that are provided online or via their contact with ACT policing should they choose to report the matter to police. The service offered by FAMSAC is free to all patients and information and treatment is strictly confidential. 
I also note Deputy Chief Minister Berry's recent announcement on 29th of June of the increase in the Safer Families levy. This commitment to an increase in funding of $2.2 million over four years for more frontline domestic violence and rape crisis services in the ACT will enable Canberra Rape Crisis Centre and the Domestic Violence Crisis Service to meet increased service demand. As I did in the earlier debate, I want to acknowledge the work of the FAMSAC service and recognise this service as the gold standard when providing medical care and or forensic examination to people following sexual assault. The FAMSAC team ensure they offer a safe and caring environment for victim survivors of sexual assault, and they lead Australia in accessibility, service provision and expertise. The philosophy embedded in the treatment and care provided by the doctors and nurses in the FAMSAC team is to ensure that they are meeting the patient's needs and respecting their choices. A person who has experienced sexual assault and presented at an emergency department may not be sure of what they want to do next, and so the FAMSAC service makes sure they are supported to make the choices that are right for them. FAMSAC does this by also working closely with other organisations that support people in the Canberra community following sexual assault, such as the Canberra Rape Crisis Centre. Everyone who accesses FAMSAC is offered medical support and this treatment and care is provided through a trauma-informed care lens. Currently, FAMSAC is accredited as a training facility for specialist staff by the Faculty of Clinical Forensic Medicine within the Royal College of Pathologists of Australia. FAMSAC is committed to providing the best evidence-based care they possibly can and I commend them for the work they do in supporting the Canberra community 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I would also like to acknowledge the important work of the ACT Policing Sexual Assault and Child Abuse Team, or SACAT. While all detectives within ACT Policing are trained to investigate sexual offences, SACAT is a specialised team whose primary function is the investigation of sexual assault offences against adults and children. SACAT also provides a 24-hour response and works closely with the Canberra Rape Crisis Centre and Canberra Hospital's FAMSAC team. Their first priority is always to ensure the mental and physical safety and wellbeing of victims and survivors of sexual assault. Between July 2020 and June 2021, there were 508 sexual assault offences reported to ACT Policing. ACT Policing that acknowledges that not all victim survivors want their reports to proceed to prosecution in the courts, and that for those victim survivors who do, it can be a distressing and difficult process. ACT Policing works clo closely with the Canberra Rape Crisis Centre, which provides confidential counselling services free of charge and can assist victim survivors with attending hospital, provide advice and support through criminal justice processes and offer referral to practitioners to assist in recovery. SACAT detectives undertake specialist sexual assault investigation training. ACT Policing is continuing to develop relevant skills and expertise within SACAT and across ACT Policing more broadly. In ad additionally, both SACA and FAMSAC offer training programs to other organisations to facilitate a collaborative approach to provide support to victim survivors. All SACA investigators must undertake a mental health review every six months to ensure their own mental wellbeing when investigating these crimes. Supporting our workforces to provide these services is a vital part of delivering specialist support to victim survivors. ACT Policing has recently commenced a review of the SACAT to identify if current practices and policies within the SACAT can be enhanced, enhanced. The review will look to identify structural, procedural or policy changes that could increase efficiency and effectiveness in this, of the area, including ensuring the team is best placed to continue to support the strategic direction of ACT Policing and the mental health and wellbeing of the investigators in the area. Since the Assembly resolution, the ACT Government has initiated a large program of work looking at all matters related to sexual assault in the ACT. An event was held by the Deputy Chief Minister on the 28th of April to announce the establishment of the Sexual Assault Prevention and Response Program. The event was attended by relevant ministers, other MLAs, all Directors General and key community stakeholders. The program is being overseen by a steering committee and three working groups focused on prevention, response and law reform in relation to sexual assault in the ACT. Over the next three to four months, the steering committee and the working groups will consider what reforms are needed in the ACT to improve prevention and responses to victim survivors. Before the end of the year, the steering committee will provide its recommendations to the government for consideration. The work of the steering committee is incredibly important, and in the context of a difficult year that's heard many crucial conversations across the world, 
This work will be key to ensuring the accessibility of services for victim survivors is and continues to be a priority across government. Both organisations that were subject to the Assembly resolution, FAMSAC and Canberra Rape Crisis Centre, are stakeholders in this work and are represented on the steering committee. As part of the Sexual Assault Prevention and Response Program, a response working group has been established to focus on service provision and police response informed by victim survivor experience. The ACT Health Directorate and Canberra Health Services are committed to working with the Sexual Assault Prevention and Response Program on how the health system can better support victims, survive, victim survivors of sexual assault. I present a copy of the statement and move that the Assembly take note of the paper. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Mrs Jones. Yes, just briefly, I thank the Minister for her statement back to the Assembly regarding the resolution, which now um, has presumably been essentially completed. I note the uh, addition of phone numbers to call on the website of ACT Health, which is associated with the Minister's mentioned changes to the website, which is one of the specifics that was called for during the debate, and I thank her for that improvement. I look forward to seeing the, um, the work of the Steering Committee on Sexual Assault, and uh, in particular I will be putting a lens over that work when it's completed to, um, to analyse whether from our perspective the case of someone who experiences rape in the ACT and their ability to get forensically tested, if that is their choice, is um, as smooth as it possibly can be. And we look forward to that continued work. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those that have been say aye. aye. The country no. I think the ayes have it. Chief Minister. Assistant Speaker. Uh, following a motion in the Assembly uh, from Dr Patterson, I'm pleased to be able to announce the ACT Government will provide annual funding to support the establishment of a new community council for the Malonglo Valley. The valley is a rapidly growing part of the city and by the end of this year will be home to around 10,000 Canberrans. Uh, and once fully developed in the coming decades, the population of the valley is anticipated to reach around 60,000. To date, Mr Assistant Speaker, uh, views of Malonglo Valley residents have been represented uh, by a small number of residents on the Western Creek Community Council. I'd like to acknowledge the Western Creek Council's uh, for its work in support of the Malonglo Valley uh, community. But the time is now right, Mr Assistant Speaker, uh, for the Malonglo Valley to have its own local community forum. The ACT Government uh, is of course engaging in a busy capital works program for the Malonglo Valley. It includes, amongst other things, the construction of new schools, a new commercial centre, uh, and the Malonglo Bridge. As the Territory Government expands the delivery, work, the delivery of works in the region, uh, we recognise the need uh, to encourage a further community engagement through a community council. Now, since becoming incorporated on the 21st, uh, sorry, on the, in March of 2021, uh, the Malonglo Valley Community Forum has held five public meetings, uh, attracting a combined audience of around 500. So off to a good start, uh, Mr Assistant Speaker. And pleasingly, the forum has taken the view that it needs to actively engage with young people in the region, uh, and their June meeting is focused on identifying the needs of young people in the Malonglo Valley, uh, and they are seeking the active participation of students uh, from the Charles Western School, and I congratulate them for doing that. Uh, as we do with all community councils, Mr Assistant Speaker, uh, we encourage the new community forum to engage widely with what we know are a diverse range of communities who live and work in the Malonglo Valley. And this includes younger residents, time poor families, families with English as a second language, and people who may be less inclined to engage uh, in traditional community events. There is a significant program of investment uh, in the Malonglo Valley underway. Construction continues at pace and the ACT government looks forward to working with the new forum and its members on our plan for the region. Uh, and I again thank uh, Dr Patterson for uh, her leadership and representation uh, of this community uh, through bringing the motion to the assembly that has allowed the creation uh, uh, and supported the creation uh, of this new Community Forum. Uh, I present a copy of the statement and move that the Assembly take note of the paper. 
The question is that the motion be agreed to. Dr. Patterson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Assistant Speaker. Um, I would also like to thank you, uh, Chief Minister, and um, congratulate you on uh, uh, supporting the motion and making the Malonglo Valley Community Council a reality. I would also like to thank all my colleagues uh, in the chamber for their support of this motion. Most of you will remember that this was the first motion that I moved in the Assembly in February this year, and it was to call on the ACT government to support the establishment of a community council for the Malonglo Valley. I moved this motion following requests from passionate and inspired community residents. These individuals were already leading change and building a strong sense of community in Malonglo. They recognised that the area had unique needs distinct from other areas across Canberra and needed its own level of representation. Malonglo Valley is the ACT's newest greenfield development and fastest growing suburban area. Residents of Malonglo Valley sought positive, constructive solutions and worked with myself as an elected representative and with the ACT government to work out how to best represent and benefit their community now and into the future. I am so pleased to be, have been part of this journey to date and I look forward to continuing to support this group and the community as it begins to evolve. The establishment of the Malonglo Valley Community Council is a great example of democracy in action whereby community members come forward, present an idea to government, tripartisan support was provided, and the community, ACT government staff, and elected members here in the Assembly worked hard and worked together to make it happen. Examples like this demonstrate the difference and impact members of our community can have in helping to shape their future and that of their friends, relatives, and neighbourhoods. I want all members of the ACT community to never, feel, uh, to never underestimate the power or opportunity they have as democratic citizens and by working collaboratively and constructively with elected members and the ACT government. Across the ACT, community councils are a great, great way for residents to get involved in what's happening in their area and to advocate to government to shape positive future outcomes. Across the ACT, there are now eight community councils. These groups operate as non-political, not-for-profit organisations, representing a broad range of interests and the needs of their community. The community councils often feed back to the ACT government on issues affecting planning, traffic and transport, community safety, the environment, amongst other matters. Most community councils meet monthly to discuss matters important to them and receive presentations on specific areas and topics of relevance. The meetings are open to all residents and anyone can participate by attending meetings, staying up to date and providing comment and input through Facebook pages, websites, news newsletters and other communication uh, channels. The more diverse the range of community members participating in community councils, the stronger the outcome that can be achieved and reflect the diversity of our communities. In establishing the Malonglo Valley Community Council, the ACT government has sought to ensure diverse membership that is reflective and inclusive of the area's broad population and demographics by encouraging the council to explore innovative engagement me methods. I've seen this already occurring and I commend the group in its less formal role as the Malonglo Valley Community Forum in engaging with students at the local school to provide a welcome and introduction to each meetings. They've also uh, 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 provided their students run their own meeting. What a great way to involve, inspire and empower future community leaders. In attending each of these groups, uh, each of the group's meetings already this year, I've been impressed with the wide range of issues discussed, the diversity of guest presenters and the energy and passion of residents wanting to help shape the future of the area. I understand that the election for positions on the Malonglo Valley Community Council will be held in October, and I encourage local residents to nominate and to attend the meetings to have their say and to get involved. I also want to stress the importance of Malonglo Valley residents' engagement in the census. The next census is due on the 10th of August, and currently I think residents are receiving um, letters to inform them that they can fill out the census now in respect to their living situation on the night of the 10th of August. 
The census gives government businesses, government and businesses, not for not for profits. Um, uh, it gives them data to help make important decisions. This information is important to identify the needs of a growing community and to anticipate and plan for future trends. Given that the last census was conducted five years ago, it is critically important that Malongo residents' data is recorded so that their, their um, current situation can be reflected in government policy. I'd also like to acknowledge the support uh, of the Western Creek Community Council in supporting Malongo over the years to get to a point where now they have their own council. So in closing, I'd like to again congratulate everyone involved in this outcome and I look forward to working with the Malonglo Valley Community Council now and into the future. Thank you. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Minister Steele. Mr Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to talk about Canberra's newest community council and Canberra's newest region. And I recall speaking on Dr Patterson's motion in February, her first in the Assembly, which called on the Government to establish a community council for the Malongolo Valley. And I'm really pleased, this, pleased that this has come to fruition, both for the Malongolo community and as an example of what a good local member can achieve in this place like Dr Patterson. The Malongolo Valley isn't just our city's newest region, it's also the fastest growing one. Um, when I first spoke on this topic in February, the population was around 9,500 residents. We can now expect that that's probably over 10,000 and, of course, will grow uh, much larger in the coming decades. Every day, more people are choosing to make their home in the Malongolo Valley and it's great to represent a community that has its whole future ahead of it. When I talk to people uh, in the Malongolo Valley when I'm out in the community, I hear so much optimism about uh, their new community and also so many great ideas and aspirations about how they'd like to make the region's facilities and services and infrastructure the best that they can be. Back in February, Dr Patterson's motion outlined the importance of the Malonglo Valley having a representative community council, a body that can provide representative stakeholder voices as the government consults on a wide range of really significant infrastructure projects and also services and programs that are already shaping the region I recently gave an update to the Assembly about the transport infrastructure investments that the government is making in the Malongolo Valley that are either underway or being planned at the moment. And we know that the new Malongolo Community Council will play a really important role in helping to uh, provide uh, information, provide to their own community about those projects, but also get them involved in the planning and design of those projects going forward. And there's a lot of big pieces of work to come in the infrastructure space, like the completion of John Gorton Drive, among others, and the new bridge over the Malongolo River being a top priority, uh, but also uh, a whole range of other work, particularly in the planning space with new estate uh, developments, which no doubt they will have a role in helping to inform, particularly in relation to the Malongolo um, Commercial Centre, which is going to be, a, of course, a really important hub for the Malongolo Valley. Uh, and of course, all of the other things that make a community like new public schools that are being planned in the Malongolo Valley, new community facilities, and they've played a really important role already in helping shape the Coombs and Wright village um, on Fred Daly Avenue. Of course, we'd like to engage with them in terms of co-design on a new library and community centre in the future located in the, the commercial centre. And the Malongolo um, Valley Community Forum has already uh, demonstrated their really valuable role in engaging with us on uh, what we can do in the interim to provide community facilities and was really pleased that they were able to work with the community to identify a range of groups that wanted to use a community space in the interim. They demonstrated that the size of the facility that was needed uh, would be around 300 square metres uh, and that it would be used regularly by many different community groups which has contributed I think to a very great result in the Malongolo Valley. So this is the, these are the kinds of things that good local community councils and government achieve and government can achieve when we work constructively together to understand the community's needs and find collaborative solutions. And I'm really looking forward to further engagement with the group in its new form as a community council. I've been to several of their meetings and it's great to be able to engage with such a mature group now, even though they are a new group, as they've demonstrated real maturity, um, really their ability to work constructively with government, with the many agencies that, that they deal with, particularly in 
a growing area like the Malonglo Valley and with the suburban land agency in particular to get really great outcomes and very pleased to work with them in their new form. Thank you. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Mrs Jones. Mr Assistant Speaker, I rise to um, add my voice to the um, positive um, discussion today with regard to the new Malonglo Valley Community Council and uh, thank members present for all the work that's gone into setting that up and uh, the Chief Minister in making that uh, decision as Treasurer to fund it. Um, money is a necessity to make the community work and that's why we pay our rates and our taxes so that this, uh, exactly this sort of activity can occur. Uh, I want to also put on record my thanks to the Western Creek Community Council for their additional effort over many years in advocating for the needs of this area, particularly previous Chair Tom Anderson and Deputy Chair Pat McGinn. Um, we all know that the issues associated with the um, oncoming uh, commercial centre, the bridge, the uh, driver behaviour on the main road and the need for many more facilities will go on. And uh, I'm so pleased that the humble but determined Monique Brower, the Details King, Ryan Hemsley and all members of the executive team have committed to this work and I'm really looking forward to working with you as you go um, forward in this very important community work. Uh, can I just put on record that uh, my concerns for the area have started to peak again over traffic given the delays that we've now know will come with the stage 2A and all the major arterials coming from the south side into the city and I hope that there's early work being done to manage that traffic flow given that the bridge isn't yet here across the uh, river. And also, um, given that Minister Berry is here, I thought it would also be worth putting on notice conversations that I've had with members of the Community Council that it would be awesome if the Evelyn Scott School, once they have their hall open, would open it to events as well. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Uh, Minister Davidson. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to hear that the Malonglo Valley Community Forum is being supported to become a community council. The role of community councils is important in enabling local residents to have their voice heard on issues relating to planning and development, as well as local services, social inclusion and strengthening communities. As an MLA from Murrumbidgee and a regular at local community council meetings since 2006, I'm very pleased to see the Malonglo Valley Community Forum recognised and funded as a community council for the growing suburbs of the valley. Every community council develops its own way of engaging with the community and advocating on issues to government. While still a very new community council, Malonglo Valley Community Forum has already shown that it is a council seeking to raise the voices of a diversity of residents across different age groups, cultural backgrounds and interests. Meetings have been streamed live for those unable to participate in person, an important way of supporting participation from people with caring responsibilities or physically distancing because of COVID. The different approaches taken at some of the meetings include panel discussions, presentations from directorates and MLAs and workshopping ideas. This has led to some very interesting and engaging meetings and I believe has contributed to some of the successes they have already achieved in successfully advocating for access to community facilities and improvements in planning and development. I look forward to continuing to engage with Malonglo, uh, the Malonglo Community Council on a range of issues. While many community councils have a focus on planning and development, it's important to remember that a community is its people first and foremost. Having spent many hours on data analysis on social determinants of health, social inequality and pathways into the justice system in my previous work, there are a few issues I would very much like to hear about from the Malonglo Valley Community Forum. These include public transport and active travel access, sports, recreation, arts and cultural activities and their role in social inclusion and strengthening communities, employment and education opportunities, and access to health and wellbeing and community support services. As a new community council, it's exciting to see them develop their own unique community council culture under the guidance of Ryan Hemsley and Monique Brower, and I look forward to seeing their hopes for a better future for everyone in the Malonglo Valley community. And I leave you with a quote from General Leah Organa, do me a personal favour, be optimistic. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Yeah. <laughs> Minister Barry. And I'm happy to provide an update to the Assembly on the government's growing and renewing public housing program at the beginning of its third year of operation. 
I'm proud to be leading the government's work in providing safe and secure social housing for those in our community who need it most, and of course the incredible work Housing ACT does to achieve this. This government has established an unparalleled program of public housing renewal, representing more than $1.2 billion investment over 10 years from 2015 to 25, and the renewal of over 20 per cent of the ACT's public housing portfolio. Firstly, through the Public Housing Renewal Program, where the ACT government invested $608 million in renewing the public housing portfolio through the construction and purchase of 1,288 replacement dwellings for those tenants who were relocated from older homes at the end of their building life cycle. I then announced the Growing and Renewing Public Housing Program in May 2019 as part of the ACT housing strategy focusing on improving tenant outcomes by continuing to upgrade Canberra's ageing public housing stock and in doing so supporting the broader renewal of Canberra's city and urban areas. In August 2020, the government announced the expansion of the program, providing longer term, a longer term economic stimulus through the allocation of an additional $52 million to fund land purchases and construction of 60 additional new public housing dwellings. This also included the expansion of the program for a sixth year to 30 June 2025. I can advise the Assembly that the additional land allocated under stimulus actions has now been fully expanded and is being prepared for the delivery of new dwellings. Additionally, in November 2020, the government committed to a further expansion of the program by delivering an additional 140 new public housing dwellings through the 10th Assembly Parliamentary and Governing Agreement. <clears throat> in total, the revised Growing and Renewing program aims to renew 1,000 dwellings and add an extra 400 dwellings to the public housing portfolio by June 2025. It will deliver these by redeveloping approximately 700 new dwellings on existing housing ACT sites, building approximately 420 new dwellings inclusive of the additional 60 dwellings announced as part of the economic survival package in August 2020 on land acquired in both new and established suburbs across Canberra and delivering 280 dwellings inclusive of the additional 140 dwellings announced in the parliamentary and governing agreement through the acquisition of private dwellings or expressions of interest processes. The program is progressing well and the structures developed over the last two years will underpin the successful delivery of the expanded program. Since the start of this commitment in July 2019 through to 30 June 2021, the program has purchased 89 land sites to construct on, demolished 125 public housing dwellings to allow for renewal, delivered 126 dwellings through the construction program and acquired 71 dwellings from the market. Mr Assistant Speaker, this is a very substantial program and the current pipeline has the program team working on construction of approximately 272 dwellings, the design of 545 dwellings and the demolition of approximately 70 dwellings. In 2020, 2021, Housing ACT through Tenders ACT implemented an expression of interest process seeking proposals from builders, developers and the public for land, house and land packages multi-unit developments and any other proposals that would meet the requirements of the program. Housing ACT is currently assess assessing proposals received through this process. As has occurred under the previous public housing renewal program, Housing ACT has dedicated team of staff that are working with tenants to ensure that they're receiving support and assistance during the relocation process, as well as post relocation. Tenant relocation officers work closely with tenants to understand their needs prior to relocation in order to match a tenant to a suitable property. The relocation officers aim to support tenants to have continuity of services and supports to make a smooth transition and further assist by ensuring tenants are settled into their community. Some of the ways the tenant relocation officers do this is by introducing tenants to local amenities if necessary and connecting tenants to additional support services when required. Public housing not only provides people with a home, but new friendships as well. I became aware recently of the lovely story of a group of women 
who lived on the same street for many years, but not all were known to others until they moved into the same complex. When they met up, they quickly discovered a shared love of gardening and brought that shared passion into the new housing development. At the opening of the comp this complex in Dixon, I was warmly invited into their homes and I could see the love and care they have brought and the great work already underway with the new garden barely a week after they moved in. As at June 30, 2021, the program has seen relocation offices, offers made to over 485 households with 190 households already living in their new home and a further 102 households waiting for a suitable property to relocate. While the expanded program sets targets to renew 1,000 properties and grow the portfolio by at least 400 homes, achievements of these targets will not be linear and the program will be flexible in its delivery to ensure the needs of current and future tenants are, properly being, are appropriately being met. Mr Assistant Speaker, the program supports the provision of safe, affordable and appropriate housing to help those most in need in our community to secure and sustain long-term and appropriate housing contributing to a safer and more inclusive community. Mr Assistant Speaker, I present a copy of this statement and ask that the Assembly take note of the paper. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. And with an eye on the clock, 12.02, Minister Fasserotti. Thank you, Mr. Assist Mr Assistant Speaker. As we enter our Homelessness Week, I'd like to provide an update to the Assembly on new programs to address homelessness in the ACT. The experience or risk of homelessness is one of the most distressing and difficult occurrences that can happen to someone. When we lose our home, we lose our sense of security and stability that helps us make decisions about other things in our life. The people that work in Canberra's specialist homelessness sector understand the complexity and the distress that face people at risk or experiencing homelessness. Canberra's specialist homelessness sector is passionate and hardworking and offers person-centred services. They understand that when you're not working with people who are often managing complex situ situations, it's not a one-size-fits-all. They often play an essential role in our efforts as government to end homelessness across the ACT. Through OneLink, the Territory Central Intake Provider for, the, for Homelessness Services, people experiencing or at risk of homelessness discuss their situation with OneLink's trained staff and are linked to appropriate specialist help, whether that is primarily accommodation or other concerns. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the ACT government has worked quickly and closely with the sector to provide the support that they required so they could keep delivering essential services. In March 2020, Housing ACT participated in three focus groups to look at the issues specific to women's services that was chaired by Tura Women's Inc., Rough Sleepers and Homelessness, chaired by Catholic Care, and Congregate or Shared Living Accommodation centers, Settings, chaired by Havelock Housing Association. Discussed in all groups was the provision of suitable accommodations for those experiencing homelessness, domestic and family violence, or living in shared accommodation settings, particularly if anyone in those situations was affected by COVID-19 and needed to self-isolate or quarantine. Based on this collaboration with the sector, in April 2020, the ACT government provided $3 million to, to meet the anticipated increase in demand on services from the impact of COVID-19 and support new initiatives. Through this, we have delivered a client support fund of $330,000 for the existing central referral agency OneLink to respond to increased demand in, on the homelessness services sector. As of June 30, 2021, approximately 73 individuals and families have received the support through this service. An example of this fund being used is a partnership with the YWCA Canberra and Agenda Agenda. One link filled a service gap for tra transgender people at risk of or experiencing homelessness and established a 12-month shared, shared housing model of supported accommodation. 
We delivered $832,000 for emergency and long-term accommodation support for men, women and children to keep them COVID safe. This resulted in innovative and responsive solutions, including expanding the Axel Housing Pilot Rough Sleepers program through COVID-19. The program is based on housing first principles and provides a wraparound support that is needed to sustain a tenancy and not result in exits into homelessness after COVID-19. As of the 30th of June, 2021, 26 people are currently engaged with the program. We upgraded and opened the winter launch run by Argyle Community Housing as temporary accommodation for men experiencing homelessness during COVID-19. From May to October in 2020, the lodge provided temporary accommodation and appropriate exits for 121 men experiencing homelessness during the colder months. Importing, importantly, 44 of these clients were able to exit into longer term housing, such as Havelock House, Ainsley Village, or into pro the private market. As of June, 20, of June 30, 2021, a further 28 men have been accommodated since the service recommenced on the 3rd of May, 2021. Funding has been provided to Catholic Care to provide safe housing for women and children experiencing homelessness during COVID-19. As of 30 June 2021, MacKillop House has housed approximately 56 clients and provides support services to build their capacities and to live independently. Funding for OneLink has increased its, to con increase its capacity to coordinate referrals for temporary accommodation options such as hoteling, including service providers of congruent living accommodation where the client needs to self-isolate and quarantine. This program has assisted 140 individuals and families up to the 30th of June 2021. We've also provided funding to upgrade and furnish existing public housing pro op properties to operate as crisis and shelter accommodation. Through listening, collaboration and innovation and planning, we're supporting the community and mitigating some of the impacts of COVID-19. But our work is not done. Through the parliamentary and governing agreement, the ACT government has committed a further $18 million over four years to further expand the capacity of the specialist homelessness sector. In the first tranche, the ACT government has delivered $1.95 million to boost the sector, including expanding the early morning centre to a seven day a week service with an additional $300,000 over two years. It was a pleasure to attend the launch of this service with my um, Assembly colleague, Mr Mark Parton. Increasing emergency support and accommodation funding to one link by $450,000 over two years to continue to provide further tenancy and client support services. And the continuation of MacKillop House and Winter Lodge services that were established in response to COVID-19 and the successful Axel Housing Program with a combined $1.2 million over two years. In addition, the ACT government has provided $700,000 over four years to ACT Shelter to increase its capacity as a peak body, providing systemic advocacy and policy advice on social housing, homelessness and affordable housing. The government remains committed to collaborating with the sector through a joint planning process to not only support new contract arrangements post-2023, but also to continue to build upon and improve outcomes under the ACT housing strategy so more Canberrans can have access to a safe, secure home. In May this year, the government agreed to, a ser to service funding agreements to the a ACT's 27 funded specialist homelessness service providers to be extended to June 2023. The, the extension of funding arrangements for a further two years means that more collaboration between government and service providers, including the development of a shared outcome-based framework. This includes working together to move human services to a commissioning for outcomes environment over the next several years. Commissioning is about a genuine partnership 
and co-design between government, sector partners and the community to plan, improve and, where necessary, redesign services to meet people's needs. As the, as the first of many in this strategic partnership, Minister Berry and I hosted a ministerial roundtable with homelessness sector CEOs and related peak organisations on the 6th of July this year. The meeting was an opportunity to deeply listen and discuss the values underpinning this strategic partnership, key planning elements, timelines, sector engagement and governance options for the next 18 months. The service funding agreement extension continues a community sector, includes a community sector sustainability review, jointly funded by the Community Services Directorate, Directorate and Community Services Sector, due to be finalised at the end of 2021. The review will be used to examine the level and cost of services, outputs and outcomes, and the needs of, the sect of all sector st stakeholders to inform future design and service system enhancements to improve outcomes for the sector and the community. As we, as we move forward, it is important that, all, that our services can continue to meet the needs of existing cohorts and are prepared to respond to emerging needs. The sector has demonstrate, it's demonstrated its capacity to respond, to ra respond rapidly to changing needs and circumstances during COVID-19. The ACT government thanks them for their selfless hard work. While I have spoken about the new, new, new initiatives focused on supporting our community, it's important to recognise the services that have worked tirelessly to help people experiencing homelessness throughout this ongoing pandemic. Street to Home provides daily support and case management to Canberrans experiencing homelessness. Workers actively seek those sleeping rough and engage with them to build relationships and understand, and this is based on understanding and respect. Red Cross Roadhouse, the Early Morning Centre, and the Blue Door at Ainsley Village all provide free food services. Red, Red Cross Roadhouse and the Early Morning Centre provide dining options for patrons and guests in compliance with COVID-19 restrictions. The Early Morning Centre also hosts several inclusive and skills building support services, including arts and crafts classes, phone and computer and internet access, some of which have been able to be recommenced since May 2021. I'd like to thank these services for their commitment and support of the COVID-19 physical distancing restrictions. This includes providing face masks, help and check, checking in people sleeping rough through the check-in Canberra app who may not have access to a mobile phone. I would also like to mention and thank Housing ACT staff who continue to deliver and adapt services to the community throughout the COVID-19 pandemic in line with the restrictions. While standard face-to-face -face visits were on hold between March 2020 and June 2020, Housing ACT made phone contact with public housing tenants to check on their health and wellbeing. The start of the pandemic caused a lot of financial stress for Canberrans and hit public housing tenants particularly hard. One of the ACT government's first responses was to provide a one-off $250 payment to public housing households. Housing ACT worked diligently to ensure that all households received this funding. The central access point for tenants, located at the Nature Conservation House in Belconnen, has remained opened to ensure that all households are receiving, uh, have remained open to ensure that everyone has a, fa a degree of face-to-face -face support. Importantly, this period, this, the, this period significant, importantly, this period signified true collaboration across our, our government with Housing ACT, ACT Health and the Community Services Directorate to undertake logistical planning and preparedness for, the out, for outbreak management. The, lo the Local Response Team Action Plan outlines Housing ACT's response in the event of an outbreak in a multi-unit complex and is updated regularly. Mr Assistant Speaker, the programs developed and implemented 
increase the level of collaboration and innovation within the sector to improve outcomes for at-risk Canberrans and the community. COVID-19 has left a significant mark across Australia. The responses, programs and services highlighted today demonstrate that Canberra remains prepared to face the challenges and respond with community at the centre of decision making. As we continue with the lingering impact of the pandemic, we must build on this progress so that all Canberrans have access to a safe and secure home. I present a copy of the statement and move that the Assembly take note of the paper. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Minister Davidson. Thank you. I thank Minister Vassarotti for outlining the ACT Government's plans to support people experiencing or at risk of homelessness in our city and the expansion of services at the early morning centre, including food relief. As the Assistant Minister for Families and Community Services, I'd like to provide some additional information about food relief services. When a household is in housing stress, paying more than 30 per cent of their income in housing costs such as private rent or mortgage repayments, the risk of homelessness increases. For Canberrans who have no choice but to pay more than 30 per cent of their income on housing, food relief is a vital support. A 2019 report by ATCOS, Food Security, Food Assistance and the Affordability of Healthy Food in Canberra, found that 3.6 per cent of Canberrans were living in a household that in the past 12 months had run out of food and not been able to afford to buy more. This is about half the number of people who were living in poverty in February this year and demonstrates the direct relationship that poverty has on food security. Cuts to JobKeeper and the completely inadequate rate of JobSeeker will have increased the numbers of Canberrans experiencing food security problems since February. Women's Health Matters 2018 report on physical activity and healthy eating said that some women found food bank services helped their household to eat healthy by having access to low-cost fruit and vegetables. Some of those accessing food bank services include people experiencing insecure work, people with chronic health conditions who have additional medical expenses and reduced ability to earn income, and people who don't have a permanent residence visa. One of the women who participated in the research for this report said, with three kids to feed, the only way that I can afford to get them vegetables at every meal and meat three times a week and fruit to take to school is to come to these places. Women talked about the need for more support for local food bank services, including community education to know where they are, how to access them, and easier to access locations for people who don't drive. Food relief is provided throughout Canberra by community organisations, including Communities at Work, Woden Community Service, Companion House, YWCA Canberra, Holy Cross Tucker Box, Guggen Gulwan Youth Aboriginal Corporation and many others. In March of 2020, Canberra Relief Network was established to respond to an urgent food security need and extended until 30 June 2021, related to availability and affordability of food and basic household supplies during the COVID-19 pandemic. Canberra Relief Network has provided vital support to more than 2,800 Canberra households through delivery of more than 14,700 food hampers and more than 8,500 hygiene hampers, including baby items. While the economic impacts of the pandemic continue, the way in which we respond to the need for food relief is changing to reflect the barriers experienced by Canberrans who are struggling, struggling with affordability. Localised food relief from services people know and trust enables support not only for access to food, but also connection to other supports that may be needed, such as housing, mental health, family services and more. In the weeks leading up to the closure of the Canberra Relief Network, people who contacted the CRN were given the details of how to receive food support through other community organisations after 30 June. Community partners were also provided information about the, the ceasing of the service and reminded to ensure their clients knew they needed to seek alternative support services and where to find them. The CRN call centre phone number is still active and will be until the end of September, so anyone who contacts the service is able to be connected with a community organisation that can offer support. Following the end of the Canberra Relief Network, ACT Government has been working with a network of community sector food relief providers on ways we can improve food relief in the ACT long term. Strengthening food relief services in the ACT includes ensuring autonomy for those accessing support, such as the ability to choose what they access rather than being supplied with a standard box, multiple access points geographically as well as opening days and times, and linking food relief to other social services and supports. 
I look forward to providing the Assembly with more details about long-term support for Canberra's community sector food relief providers as our work with the network progresses. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I understand there's a wish of the Assembly to suspend for lunch. That being so, the Chair will be resumed at 2pm. Thank you, members. We'll move to questions without notice and I'll call the Leader of the Opposition, Ms Lee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, Minister, on the 9th of July, a detainee escaped custody in broad daylight within a few hundred metres of schools and playgrounds after the Toyota Camry he was travelling in was intentionally and repeatedly rammed. The Inspector of Correctional Services had months ago found the Camry unsuitable for escort purposes. Moreover, Court Transport Unit, or CTU, officers described it as, quote, unfit for purpose, end quote, and had stopped using it. You have now halted the use of the Camry despite initially defending it. Minister, how did we get to the point where this detainee was able to escape? Mr Gentleman. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Ms Lee for the question. First of all, let me commend the bravery of the corrections officers who were involved in the incident of the day. I have met with them uh, personally and the uh, uh, foresight, courage and skill uh, that they put forward during that incident uh, should be well uh, commended. Our staff do a brilliant job uh, and a very difficult job as well and I thank them for the work that they do do, especially when something like this happens. Of course, the matter is subject to a police investigation as well as being before the courts. ACT Corrections is undertaking an internal review and it has been referred to the Inspector of Correctional Services as a critical incident. And when these investigations are concluded, I'll be able to make a further statement as to what occurred. Ms Lee, supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, why did it take a brazen daytime assault on corrections staff in a busy Canberra suburban street to finally convince you to stop using Camrys in line with the inspector's finding back in November 2020. Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam. I should point out, of course, that the um, inspector's uh, research was particularly on the court transport unit, not on the Camrys used for transport to hospital. Uh, so it was after the event and the discussion with the commissioner uh, that uh, I gave the advice to cease using uh, the Camrys, unless it's exceptional circumstances, uh, and of course that's a procedure put in place. Mr Hanson. Minister, given that the detainee was able to sprint from the crime scene, why was he not adequately restrained, and are you now reviewing the risk assessment procedures for escorts? Mr Gentleman. Uh, yes, Madam Speaker, we are reviewing, uh, of course, the operation uh, of that particular escort. Uh, he was restrained, I understand, by custodial officers, uh, and the rest of that will be uh, matters for the ins uh, Corrections Inspectorate and ACT Policing. Mrs Jones, you have a supplementary? No, you have, have a, a question. question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, to the Minister for Corrections. As we know, in July, as mentioned, a detainee was able to escape from custody. The Camry he was being transported in had been declared unsuitable by the Inspector of Correctional Services for transporting inmates. The Inspector also said that another vehicle court transport unit must be replaced as soon as possible. Two more vehicles were also being considered for replacement. The procurement of an additional vehicle followed inappropriate practices and WorkSafe ACT had to issue a prohibition notice for it. Minister, what does it say about yours and your predecessor's performance that as of November 2020, all CTU vehicles were either being assessed for replacement, being replaced, under a workforce prohibition, deemed unsuitable or had a serious design flaw? Mr Gentleman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The 2020 Court Transport Unit review focused on the Court Transport Unit's fleet of vehicles. Uh, following that review, ACT Corrective Services has implemented, updated and improved procurement procedures for contra uh, court transport vehicles, and the CTU report did make a comment that the Camrys were unsuitable, largely due to their size, for the transport of detainees. It did not, however, make a formal recommendation in relation to the safety of the Camrys and did not 
uh, review AMC transport vehicles. Supplementary, Mrs Jones. Mr. Does it take a formal recommendation for common sense to prevail on how many Camrys were being used by the CTU? What will happen to them now that they are no longer being used? Mr Gentleman? Do you need the question repeated, well, Mr thank Gentleman? Well, you, Madam Speaker. Well, uh, I don't approve the use of the vehicles. They're done uh, particularly by um, corrections operational procedures. Uh, so it, I don't think it comes down to myself to allocate them what vehicles they should use. Uh, of course, uh, Camrys are an ANCAP 5 rated vehicle, quite safe on ACT roads. Uh, and they have, of course, of, of course, been the subject of human rights uh, uh, recommendations, Madam Speaker, for the way that detainees should be transported, uh, particularly in these circumstances, to medical facilities. Mrs Kicker. Thank you, Minister. How much does the government pay SG Fleet to lease each individual CTU vehicle? Mr Gentleman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have to take the question of that detail on notice. Questions without notice. Mr Davis. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Mental Health. Minister, I was delighted last week to see that Headspace has opened up a brand new facility in my electorate of Brindabella. Can you please update the Assembly on what you're doing and the ACT government is doing to support the mental health and wellbeing, particularly of young people in Tuggeranong? Mr. Da Mrs. Davidson. Uh, I thank Mr. Davis for the question. Uh, Headspace Tuggeranong will be an important addition to the mental health service system in the ACT, particularly for children and young people on the south side. Uh, it's a, a very well integrated part of the ACT's mental health sector. It offers a, an important step for children and young people who are experiencing mild to moderate mental health concerns. Uh, schools in Tuggeranong can also offer the Black Dog Institute's Youth Aware of Mental Health program. There's a free program that's offered to Year 9 students and gives them a, a toolkit of uh, things that, and skills that they can use to look after their mental health and wellbeing and to look out for signs of mental illness or distress in themselves or their peers. And I note that there's been now more than 3,000 uh, young people in Year 9 who have participated in that Youth Aware of Mental Health program, which means that more than half of the 15-16 uh, year olds in the ACT will have had access to that program. So that means that either they or someone in their social network will have been given those skills um, and uh, will be able to look out for mental health in their peers. Supplementary, Mr Davis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, earlier in estimates I heard about the youth navigation portal that your office is leading. Can you explain in more detail what that portal will do and advise when it will start? Ms Davidson. Yes. Uh, the youth navigation portal uh, is a very important tool to help young people in finding and accessing the right services and supports for their needs at the time. Uh, where it's up to at the moment, following a procurement uh, request for a quote process, Mary Mead has been selected as the community organisation to lead and manage the portal. Uh, and the Office for Mental Health and Wellbeing and Mary Mead are working closely to continue stakeholder engagement and consultation with children and young people and parents and carers and with service providers. Uh, in early July of 2021, Cap Gemini was selected to build the IT component of the portal, uh, and that was through a separate request for, quote, procurement process, uh, and the design process is currently underway. Um, it will have an iterative release, and the first release will be in late September of 2021. Mrs Jones. I thank you, Minister. How much of Headspace Tuggeranong is funded by the ACT government and how much is fed funded by the Federal Liberal Government? Ms Davidson. Uh, Headspace in Tuggeranong is a Commonwealth program. Uh, it fits into a broad and diverse range of mental health services within the ACT and we're very happy to have it here. Questions without notice. Mr Hanson. Uh, Madam Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Corrections. Minister, on the 20th of July this year, Canberra found out that a detainee had been mistakenly re released from jail before completing his sentence. This detainee is a repeat offender who had already been denied bail. After being told to hand himself in, he said that he would try. But ultimately, close to a week later, a warrant had to be issued for his arrest when he failed to turn himself in. You blamed human error caused by a database that requires manual checks across multiple files. This database system dates back to 1985, and the Inspector of Corrections said it was probably antiquated when the government bought it. Minister, for how long was this detainee at large under your watch? 
Mr. Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank Mr. Hanson for the question. The accidental release was due to human error. Uh, detainees can often be sentenced for a charge while also being on remand before either the Magistrates Court and or the Supreme Court, and the current release processes require manual checks of documents to occur. Due to the human error in this case, information in relation to this detainee's remand was missed. Unfortunately, sometimes this does happen. Uh, none of us are perfect, Madam Speaker, and we all make mistakes, uh, but we do learn from Madam Speaker, and uh, we will... Mrs Jones, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We do learn for it, and of course we will uh, uh, review this situation and put in place practices that will make it safer for detainees in the Canberra public. Mr Hanson. Minister, why do you stand by your decision to blame ACT correction staff, given the database they were forced to use is described as antiquated? Mr Gentleman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, that was the advice uh, provided to me uh, by the briefing from our Corrections uh, Chief Officer. Dr Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Minister, I was wondering if you could outline how uh, you're working with correction officers to review these incidents. Mr Gentleman. Mr Patterson, for the question, uh, there are, have been a number of reviews uh, of particular cases and the AMC over many years, Madam Speaker, many recommendations which your government has agreed to, and we're working through those recommendations through the Blueprint for Change program uh, and the, uh, of course, committee that's in place headed by Ms Nixon, Madam Speaker, who has a vast uh, background in corrections and other policing matters. Uh, she's already put it back to me uh, that she's pleased with the results so far and the input, particularly from corrections officers, and feels that it is going well. Uh, so I look forward uh, to the rest of the recommendations from the committee, the implementation uh, of those uh, for better opportunities for our staff into the future and conditions for detainees at the AMC. Questions without notice? Ms All. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Transport and City Services. Minister, can you please update the Assembly on the expansion of the light rail network to Woden? Mr Steele. Well, I thank uh, Ms Orr for her question and, and her interest in light rail and the benefits it will provide in expanding to Woden for Gungahlin residents as well as for the rest of the city. Certainly it comes at an interesting time for the light rail project. It is our city's biggest ever infrastructure build. And I'm pleased to advise the Assembly that key preparatory works are already underway. The first physical works on the project are planned to start before the end of this month. We have commenced work to translocate the Golden Sun Moth population from the northern part of the median on Commonwealth Avenue. And we recognise that protecting Canberra's environment and heritage throughout this project is essential. Early works to relocate utilities will commence shortly. This will involve moving critical water and communication utility assets from their current position along the southern section of London Circuit to a new alignment via Edinburgh Avenue, Vernon Circle and Constitution Avenue. This will pave the way for London Circuit to be raised to an at-grade intersection with Commonwealth Avenue. Major works on this part of the project will commence in the first half of next year. Delivering light rail to Wodham will create over 6,000 jobs. It will give Canberrans on the south side more convenient and reliable transport options, help prevent future traffic gridlock and cut transport emissions for a cleaner environment. Stage two of light rail will ensure that Canberra grows to be a more vibrant, sustainable and connected city. And it's important that we get on with delivering this future focused investment now as we deliver a better public transport system before our city experiences the same traffic problems that other cities face. Supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, what is the ACT government doing about the disruption associated with the project? Mr Steele. I think we saw for her supplementary. The ACT government is being upfront with the community that the construction of light rail will be disruptive for Canberra's road network while we build a more vibrant, sustainable and connected city. Because of this project and parallel work that's being undertaken by the National Capital Authority, lane closures and diversions will need to be in place on Commonwealth Avenue for an extended period of years. This will see more traffic dispersed onto routes like Kings Avenue and Parks Way. The construction will mainly impact those coming from the south side into the city, but there will be flow on impact for the rest of the road traffic network. I want to assure members in this place and all Canberrans that we are putting in place significant preparation and planning to minimise this disruption. We don't want to see Canberrans stuck in their cars in daily gridlock 
And that's why we've formed a disruption task force that brings together expertise in road and tr public transport network planning, behaviour change, communications and community engagement. Right now, the disruption task force is making plans to mitigate the construction impacts by identifying opportunities to manage network demand, provide alternative transport options and invest in new infrastructure like road network improvements on other routes. We'll also be communicating early and often with the community and business during the disruption to give Canberrans the information that they need to make choices about how they, how they move around our city and to help to keep other people moving as well. We'll be supporting Canberrans through this time because we understand that disruption on this scale uh, is coming and we need a clear and coordinated response led by government. Dr Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, given your warning the Canberra community about the disruption now, when will construction begin? Mr Steele. I'm really pleased to say that construction on light rail to Woden is starting this year. The first package of works involves setting up construction site compounds and undertaking utility relocation works. This work must be completed prior to raising London circuit to reduce the risk of damage to critical utilities during the project's major construction works. There will be some local traffic impacts associated with these works, but they'll be relatively minor. While these early works are underway, we'll be preparing the major project documentation to receive approval from the NCA and undertaking procurement for a project delivery partner. The first major works to raise London Circuit will then get underway from around quarter two of next year. This will require a number of road closures as the current clover leaves and the Commonwealth Avenue overpass over London Circuit are progressively dismantled. We're encouraging the community to keep up to, to date with the project by signing up for email alerts via the Light Rail to Woden website at act.gov.au slash light rail to Woden. This website also has lots of maps and information on the specific routes that will be affected by construction. These will be continually updated as construction progresses and the government will be communicating clearly and early and regularly across a range of channels as the construction program gets underway. I'd like to thank the community in advance for their patience and understanding as we deliver this important infrastructure project that will benefit Canberrans for generations to come. Questions without notice? Mr Parton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to uh, the Minister for Corrections. In December of 2017, Minister, a detainee was mistakenly released from the jail. Now, Mr Rattenbury said at the time that a review of the process would be conducted to ensure that this error did not reoccur. In July 2021, Canberra found out that yet another detainee was mistakenly released from the jail before completing his sentence. The government again said that a review of this incident would be undertaken to ensure that it would not happen again. Minister, what policies and procedures changed following the review in 2017, given that clearly the changes have not been sufficient? Mr Gentleman. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Mr Parton for the question. I will refer him, of course, to the previous answer uh, of the question of a similar vein. Uh, of course, the uh, two instances were separate uh, and of different circumstances, Madam Speaker. As I said, we will, of course, have a look at this review uh, and, and uh, of course, ensure that... Point of order. Uh, Resume your seat, point of order. Madam Speaker, on relevance, the question asked what changed last time. The Minister has not actually answered that at all. I ask you to bring him to the question, which is what has changed since that first incident? Yes, there's no point of order. You took the point of order 20 seconds in. He still has plenty of times to answer. He's made reference that the review is in place and there were different circumstances. Minister, you can continue. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Of course, uh, over the years we have had a number of incidents at AMC uh, and many of the recommendations occurring from those incidents have been about uh, the way we operate with uh, our staff and the uh, opportunity to increase their training across the ACT. I can say uh, since November 2020, significant strides have been made in increasing mandatory training compliance for custodial oh, officers no. within ACT. On relevance, the Minister is now going to broad-based training, but we're asking about systemic changes that were made to ensure that a release wouldn't happen again. He has not mentioned that at all yet in his answer. I believe he's on topic and there is no point of order, Minister. You have 30-odd seconds to continue, if you wish. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'm not sure about the opposition, but we certainly believe that training is an important part of how custodial officers can operate within the AMC to ensure safety for the future, and these releases don't occur. Uh, since that date, as I mentioned, uh, between January and April 21, the proportion of staff who have grown up, uh, of course, now up to date with mandatory training has improved. Breathing apparatus uh, training compliance has increased from 38 per cent to 47 per cent. On relevance, what does mandatory appar breathing apparatus training have to do with releasing detainees and the processes involved? Time has expired, Mrs Jones. You have a supplementary, Mr Yes, Clark. I do. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, why is the database that was being used in 2017 the same database that's being used in July 2021? Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. As we've said, uh, a review of this incident is being take, uh, undertaken and uh, any identified deficits within these processes will be rectified at the earliest opportunity. And so uh, when we look at the uh, specific issues around databases, there are specific sets of technology that are uh, drawn up, if you like, for correctional services across Australia. Uh, this particular one uh, is quite uh, resource intensive and we are reviewing it. We're looking to ensure that this doesn't happen again. Mr Hanson. Minister, given the review done in 2017 that didn't prevent the mistaken early release of detainees, what reasons do Canberrans have to believe that a review of the incident in July will actually change anything? Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, I'll refer uh, the member to my previous answer in that we have, of course, when there's been reviews, instigate, inst instigated changes uh, in performance, Madam Speaker, instigated changes in operational arrangements at AMC uh, to, ensure that, uh, the, to ensure that staff are safe into the future and detainees are well uh, remanded. Questions without notice, Mr Milligan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Corrections. On the 12th of May this year, there was yet another riot and fire at the AMC. The fire resulted in an accommodation unit being taken offline. An officer's station was burned and detainees had to be relocated. As of the 18th of June, the accommodation unit was still unable to house detainees. Minister, how much longer will this accommodation unit be unusable? Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. It will be some time. Uh, it takes quite a bit of work to uh, engage in corruption staff and, of course, repairs at the AMC due to its particular nature being a secure installation. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, the area is safe for those workers and safe for detainees. Uh, so we do move detainees around the AMC uh, to ensure that repairers can get in uh, and do those operations. Uh, and I don't have a final timeline on that repair. Supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, what is the estimated cost to Canberra taxpayers for the damages uh, that occurred to that accommodation unit? Mr. Gentleman. I'll take that on notice, Madam Speaker. Supplementary, Mr Kane. Uh, Minister, what is the total estimated cost of this right so far for Canberra's taxpayers, including damage assessments, contracted engineers' reports and operational costs? Mr Gentleman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, there's quite a bit of detail in that question. I will take it on notice and come back to the Chamber. Thank you. Questions without notice? Mrs Kickett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to Minister for Corrections. Minister, following the AMC riot on the 10th of November 2020, another serious fire was lit on the 14th of November, causing the loss of 28 beds. All four corrections officers who responded to the fire had out-of-date training. Two had their fire training cancelled a few months earlier. One officer recalled that the fire was so hot that it was melting their boots. After an incident like this, a formal debrief must occur, but no such debrief happened. These serious work safe failings contributed to the Inspector of Corrections issuing several recommendations after his review of the incident. Minister, why are you risking the lives of officers by requiring them to fight fires without up-to-date training? Mr. Gentleman. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, I'll refer Ms Kicker to my previous answer on trading, where the opposition said it wasn't important, but it is, as we've just heard from Mrs Kicker, Madam Speaker. Uh, and I mentioned in my previous answer the detailed levels of uh, operational training that is occurring uh, with the uh, aspects of fire, with aspects of breathing apparatus and safety training for those detainees. Supplementary, Mrs Kickett. Minister, have you provided AMC staff with protective heavy-duty equipment for protection against heat, fire and chemicals as per recommendation one from the inspector's report? Mr General. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I understand that's still being uh, worked on with AMC staff and the Why? Commissioner. So uh, I'll be able to come back to the Chamber with the number of PPE equipment that's been uh, circulated so far uh, in detail. Mr Kane. Uh, Minister, why was there no formal debrief for officers after the incident, given this is a requirement of the Incident Reporting Notifications and Debrief Policy 2020, to ensure lessons are learned from incidents such as these? Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, that's a matter I'll have to take up with AMC. I haven't been briefed on whether there was a debrief uh, or not. Um, but, of course, if it's a recommendation or a condition of the Code of Operation at AMC, it certainly should occur. I've had recent, uh, of course, conversations with a number of staff at AMC and, of course, the union and their delegates as well, uh, who would like to see some changes in the way we operate the AMC, and we'll certainly take those on board. Questions without notice, Dr Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, my question is to the Minister for Health. Minister, can you please update the Assembly on the ACT's vaccination rollout? Ms Stephen-Smith. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Dr Patterson for the question. And I am, of course, pleased to inform the Assembly that the ACT's COVID-19 vaccination program is continuing to progress both efficiently and safely. Since our program began on the 22nd of February this year, a total of 142,779 vaccine doses have been administered through ACT government clinics. And of course, that is uh, complemented by the rollout through primary care and the direct rollout into residential aged care as well that the Commonwealth is responsible for. This is an incredible achievement to date and combined with the Commonwealth Government's expansion of the role of primary care in administering vaccines, more than half of the ACT's adult population has now received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. On the 29th of June, the ACT's third COVID-19 vaccination clinic commenced operations at the Canberra Airport precinct. Our health services have been administering COVID-19 vaccines seven days a week and we're increasing our vaccination capacity so that more Canberrans can get vaccinated. Recently, the capacity of ACT vaccination clinics was increased to more than 14,000 Pfizer doses a week. This is more than double our previous capacity. We've reserved 2,000 appointments each week for important high-risk groups, including healthcare, disability and aged care workers. The ACT government recognises that these workers are essential to our community and that it is vital they have the ability to get vaccinated as soon as possible. We're expecting to receive an increasing supply of COVID-19 vaccines in coming months from the Commonwealth. This will support the ACT to open even more appointments and continue to expand eligibility. Getting vaccinated provides protection to recipients of the vaccine and helps reduce the risk of COVID-19 to vulnerable patients and residents and the wider community. Dr Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, how is the Territory increasing the number of people who can access the vaccination? Ms. Stephen Smith. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Dr. Patterson for the supplementary. Well, as members may be aware, on Saturday the 17th of July, the Chief Minister announced that from Wednesday the 21st, 30 to 39 year old Canberrans were able to register through the digital health record consumer portal, MyDHR, the ACT government's online booking system for COVID 19 vaccinations. More than 20,000 30 to 39 year olds took up the opportunity to register their interest. This is another excellent indication that Canberrans are ready and willing to get vaccinated to protect themselves and their loved ones. This call to registration was possible due to the excellent organisation and preparation of our public health officials. This morning, those 20,000 30 to 39 year olds received a text message to tell them they could now book their COVID-19 vaccination. The opening of eligibility for COVID-19 vaccination appointments to 30 to 39 year olds is an exciting development for the ACT government COVID-19 vaccination programs. 
Of the 70,000 30 to 39 year olds in the ACT, 16,000 have already received their first COVID-19 vaccination dose as part of phases 1A and 1B, or at least their first dose. We are now, now we are encouraging the remaining 54,000 30 to 39 year olds to roll up their sleeves to protect themselves, their families and their community. Yeah. Madam Speaker, vaccines are the only way out of this pandemic. There is no other viable alternative to protect yourself and the people around you from very serious illness as a result of COVID-19. I encourage all eligible Canberrans to receive a vaccination. Supplementary, Dr. Um, sorry, Mr. Patterson. <laughs> Mr. Thanks. Patterson. Close enough, Madam have, Speaker. Yes, we all know. <laughs> Minister, how is the ACT planning for the expected increase in vaccines in the final quarter of the year? Ms. Stephen Smith. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Mr. Patterson for the supplementary. The ACT government is continuing to plan for the anticipated increase in supply of COVID-19 vaccines from the Commonwealth. This increased supply will place us in a position to increase our vaccination appointments to more eligible Canberrans. A recent successful change in the patient model of care in ACT government clinics has significantly increased throughput and resulted in more Canberrans having access to a COVID-19 vaccine. In the last fortnight, the Essential Access and Sensory Clinic, which has, has almost also doubled its weekly appointments. This is in response to excellent community uptake and stakeholder feedback. More planning is underway to review current clinic models and prepare for future expansion of ACT government vaccination clinics. This will enable us to be ready for the expected increase in COVID-19 vaccine supply in coming months. Further planning and policy efforts are also focused on improving equity and access to COVID-19 vaccination within high-risk groups, such as, as I previously mentioned, aged care and disability residential care workers. Getting vaccinated provides protection to these recipients of the vaccine and also helps to reduce the risk to vulnerable people. The ACT government is also committed to ensuring equity of access to COVID-19 vaccines to those Canberrans who are less likely to engage with health services. This includes homeless and housing insecure populations, culturally and linguistically diverse communities, people living with drug and alcohol dependencies and mental health challenges, and in congregate living arrangements, including secure facilities, supported accommodation and refuges. Madam Speaker, Canberrans can be confident that the ACT government will continue to deliver a safe and effective vaccination rollout in partnership with the Commonwealth, primary care and pharmacies. Thank you to all the health professionals who are part of this incredible effort. Questions without notice, Ms Clay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Transport, Canberra and City Services. Minister, I've been speaking to many West Belconnen residents who are concerned about the active travel connections between West Belconnen, the town centre and the rest of the city. I have some concerns about the William Hovell Drive duplication, but I'm pleased to see that dedicated bike lanes are included, as well as an off-road shared path. But on similar trunk roads, we've seen quite high rates of accidents for people riding bikes. Can you please advise what infrastructure will be used to separate bikes from cars in the on-road cycle lanes? Mr Steele. I thank uh, Ms Clay for her question and note her interest in active travel. The ACT government is investing in our road network, including through the duplication of William Hobble Drive, which will be a key uh, road that will service the growing region of Gin and Derry, but also uh, Malongolo as well. As part of that duplication work, the ACT government uh, is taking the opportunity to establish a new off-road shared path connection between uh, West Belconnen, Malongolo and the rest of our shared path network. This seven kilometre active travel uh, route will run from Drake Brockman Drive uh, through to uh, Bindubi Street and will actually go beyond the uh, section where the duplication will be occurring uh, in order to link it through to the rest of our shared path network, which is will be an entirely off-road uh, ride um, from those regions, which will help to improve safety and provide another option for people who are looking to take that route, particularly commuting into the city on a bike. And we're hoping that'll encourage more people to take it up. Of course, the other uh, central links, um, which have been identified in our transport strategy, uh, which go through uh, Belconnen and which are our trans uh, public transport uh, links are also important and we're continuing to uh, invest in those uh, as well. Off-road uh, off shared paths aren't the only part of uh, this connection, of course, on-road shared paths are a feature of, our, of all of our road upgrades as well, but we want to provide the opportunity and option for people to go uh, off-road where they can. Of course, under the transport strategy as well, we've committed to undertake uh, further work and consultation with the community 
uh, on standards for active travel along mid-block sections as well as uh, key intersections. And we're looking at how we can improve safety uh, in the design of those feature features that goes beyond Australian standards. Supplementary, Supplementary. Ms. Clay. Uh, Minister, what infrastructure will be included to protect bike riders when they're crossing the roads? Mr Steele. I think the member for her question and uh, with the off-road cycle lanes we'll be utilising many of the underpasses that already exist uh, on uh, William Hobble Drive so that people can safely pass from one side of the road uh, to the other in, in certain sections uh, and as well as connecting with the Bicentennial Trail, the equestrian links uh, as well as the rest of the shared path network. So there should be no reason to have to cross the road and of course further up the network, the road network, uh, there may be intersections that are established and those will have safe crossing points for pedestrians. Supplementary, Mrs Kickett. Uh, Minister, when will construction happen of the duplication of William Harwell Drive? Following Mr. detailed design, Madam Speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Questions without notice. <laughs> Ms Castle, oh members, your thank you, Madam Castle Speaker. Yep, yep. My question is to the Minister for Corrections. Minister, between October 2020 and April 2021, 208 strip searches were carried out on women at the AMC. Almost 60% of them were conducted on Indigenous women. The data released via FOI also revealed that women at the AMC are strip searched at a rate of roughly 30 a month. The population of women at the AMC is about 20. Julie Tongs and Atkos have both pointed to this data as evidence that a commission of inquiry into systemic racism in the entire ACT justice system is needed. Your government has repeatedly dismissed any such inquiry. Minister, does this data on disproportionate strip searches of Indigenous women constitute evidence of systemic racism in the ACT justice system? Mr. Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank Ms. Castley for the question. And, and I will say that the government has not rejected that uh, claim. And in fact, uh, we are leading uh, a response in the justice sense of the amount of uh, Indigenous over representation uh, within our whole justice system, Madam Speaker. The Attorney General uh, is leading that work. And indeed, uh, as a government, we're responding, of course, uh, to the inquiry for. Um, uh, Ms Tongs and the roundtable recommendations, uh, Madam Speaker, so uh, I'm pleased that that work is starting. I, I do recognise the negative impact that searches can have on detain detainees and that this is especially so for women. Uh, women offenders often have higher levels of complex trauma, family and sexual violence and a disadvantaged backgrounds. And as a government, we're committed to providing appropriate supports to female detainees at the AMC. However, searches need to take place uh, at time to ensure the safety and security of staff and detainees at the prison. ACT Corrective Services is currently procuring a body scanner, uh, which will mean that in future the number of strip searches of detainees will be minimised greatly. Uh, this is good news and will be welcomed by detainees and staff alike, as searches can be uncomfortable for all parties involved. Ms Kestley. Minister, why is there an unacceptably high level of strip searches that occurred under your watch, and even worse, the close to 50 a month that occurred under Minister, Mr Rattenbury? Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, uh, between October 2019 and 30 June 21, these are the stats I have, 51% uh, of searches on female detainees were of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, female detainees. 49% of the searches were non-Aboriginal uh, Islander uh, and Islander female detainees. Uh, these searches resulted in uh, 12 detections of contraband, eight on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander females and four on non-Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander females. Uh, in terms of population, on 30 June 21, uh, there were 21 female detainees at AMC. Uh, Madam Speaker, of course, searches are used in correctional facilities uh, right across the world uh, to ensure the safety of staff and detainees. If uh, searches occur at a rate, uh, and it's particularly when they're moving, so for example, uh, if detainees are going to a court appearance, then they will be uh, searched before and sometimes after the court appearance too, to ensure there are no um, uh, foreign uh, parts on their body, Madam Speaker, as I said, for the safety of all concerned. Dr Patterson. 
Madam Speaker. Minister, I was wondering if you could further outline how the government is committed to ensuring safe conditions for female detainees. Mr Gentleman. Yes, Madam Speaker. Um, as you heard from uh, the Minister for Women and Barry this morning, we're working as best we can to support uh, women detainees in the AMC, whether it's or not their personal uh, situations with searches or whether it's their situation for accommodation within the AMC. Uh, we have moved women back to uh, the uh, proposed built women's facility at AMC and the recent visit I had with Minister Barry uh, gave us some very good feedback from those detainees about the quality of life that they are now having at the AMC. There's more work to do though, Madam Speaker. We need to provide uh, more opportunities for learning uh, amongst that cohort uh, and more opportunities for privacy as well. Questions without notice, Mr Kane. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Corrections. Minister, in a round table with you and other ministers, Aboriginal leaders were asked to determine what form the investigation into Indigenous overrepresentation into the justice system should take. They unanimously requested a commission of inquiry. In response, Minister Stephen Smith and the Attorney General wrote that a commission would require significant expense and that its recommendations are, quote, reasonably likely to mirror those of previous inquiries and reviews, many of which are yet to be implemented by your government. When asked about overrepresentation, the chair of the AMC Oversight Committee recently stated that one cause is, quote, the white community thinking they know what's always best. I hope we can stop thinking that the white community has the answers because we clearly don't. In your role as Minister for Corrections, have you advocated for the requested commission of inquiry? And if not, why not? Mr. Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I've worked with my colleagues, the Attorney General, uh, Minister Rachel Stephen Smith, uh, and of course Emma, on the um, response to the roundtable, uh, and we're still working through that process. Uh, there will be, uh, I think, a number of opportunities for Aboriginal people to be able to take the forum forward uh, in our responses, Madam Speaker, and of course they have called for it, and the government has responded to say it should be Aboriginal-led. Mrs. The question was whether he has advocated for it or not, and that was not answered in his answer. I can't direct the minister how he answers the question. He responded to the question appropriately. He didn't provide that, but he responded appropriately. Mr Kane, supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Minister, if a commission of inquiry is unlikely to reveal anything new, as your government claims, can you explain specifically why the ACT has the highest Indigenous incarceration rate in Australia? and why that rate is growing faster here than in any other jurisdiction. Mr Gentleman. Oh, Madam Speaker, I reject the premise of the question. We have not said we will not find anything new. Every inquiry finds something new, Madam Speaker, and it, that's how we learn uh, on the actions that we should take and the resources we should put forward into overrepresentation, Madam Speaker. I think the work that the Attorney General, Rachel Stephen Smith, and the government is doing in response to this uh, is appropriate, and of course it will have resourcing as well. Mrs. Kickett. Minister, what right does your all white government have to ask Aboriginal leaders to um, determine the form of a review into overrepresentation? Yes. Um, yes. I was. I was directing from a quote. Well, you didn't present it as a quote. It was the pardon? quote. What right? Can you, if you're, if you're responding to the point of order, members, members, Mr. Rattenbury, do you want to take, do you want to stand and make your comment? Well, I think the chief minister was taking point of order first, Madam Speaker. I'll... No, I'll speak after the chief yes. minister. So the point of order, Madam Speaker, is it's very clear in standing orders that questions cannot contain imputations, uh, and that is exactly what that question did. Mr Rattenbury? Madam Speaker, I take a slightly different approach to the Chief Minister, but I think that um, starting to refer to groups in the Chamber by racial titles is actually mm. not a slope that we want to slide down. I think it's quite disrespectful and not how we want to talk about people in the ACT in the way that uh, 
Mrs. Kickett is seeking to represent it. I think uh, it's unhelpful and it's unedifying. Madam Mrs. Speaker, Jones. Um, we are constantly being given descriptions of different people in the community by their racial attributes by the government. So if people want to make the point that was made by Christine Nixon in this place and refer to her intelligent assessment of what's going on in this government, then I don't understand how there can possibly be a point of order when a piece of fact that she has pointed out, that she has considered, is being stated by the Shadow Minister. Um, can you repeat the question? Because you, you've stood and you've said that this was a quote, but you've not said it, this is a quote. You've just labelled white government, is what I heard, and I would agree that that is absolutely inappropriate. Minister, what right from the Oversight Committee Chair when she said the white community thinking that they know what's always best is that what you have to ask from the original beginning to determine no, you've the rephrased form your of question your, you've rephrased your question no it's out of order you've rephrased it <laughs> so questions without notice mr braddock Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Multicultural Affairs. Minister, the ACT Canberra Languages Schools has written to the both of us about the impending loss of access to teaching spaces in my electorate of Yarrabee. I would like to know what is the government doing to support the ongoing affordable access by community languages to classes in the ACT? Ms Chan. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Mr Braddock for the question uh, and that we uh, both acknowledge uh, how valuable language is and the important role that community language schools play in ensuring that multicultural languages are maintained and promoted. Um, Madam Speaker, just some broader overview before I get to the, the detail of the question for those who might not be aware. Uh, the ACT government investment in community languages schools is over $275,000 annually and CSD works with the association to provide annual funding grants to over 40 schools representing 34 languages and over 2,000 students in the ACT. Uh, to the detail of the question, uh, we have recently undertaken a review into community language schools, uh, part of which is subject to a, a motion tomorrow. Uh, and I note that Mr Braddock's motion calls for the review and the response to be tabled at the end of October uh, of this year. The government is uh, currently working on a cross-directorate uh, response to the review uh, because, as uh, Mr Braddock noted, uh, community language schools operate in a range of venues, including uh, in schools. We are aware um, that there are some concerns about the current use of facilities, uh, including with schools and CSD, uh, in addition to responding to the report. Uh, it's also um, working with the ACT Education Directorate on the current issues uh, that have been raised uh, with me and with Mr Braddock. Uh, of course, the ACT government supports the community use of public school facilities, um, but we need to ensure that uh, there is a real balance there um, with the community use as well as uh, the, the important school operations and that public schools are community hubs and their facilities enrich the lives of all local residents, uh, not just those who attend the school. Supplementary, Mr Braddock. Thank you. I would just, while I was thankful for the support that the ACT government provides to community languages, I would just question in terms of how the provision of grants to do community languages is then returned to the government in the form of higher fees for community-owned spaces. Is that a business model that's going to continue? I will give you before. Can I just remind members that the second supplementary is direct with no preamble. I gave you some grace there, Mr Braddock, but not next time. To the answer, Ms Chain. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. This was uh, subject uh, to the review and the tabling of the review and the response to the review will address that. Mr Davis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, will the multi-purpose community centre that's planned for Gungahlin include spaces for community groups to book for classes? Ms Chain. That's a question for the Chief Minister. <laughs> Mr Barr, you are responding to that question. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As the 
project is developed, there will be an opportunity for community engagement in relation to the internal spaces and configuration within the new centre. Uh, so that it is quite likely, Mr Davis, that that particular use would be able to be accommodated within the new centre. Thank you, members. Questions without notice. Mr Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Human Rights. Minister, can you please update the Assembly on the action taken following the motion passed on 31 March in relation to territory rights? Ms Chang. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, restoring territory rights is about our democratic rights. It's about giving citizens in the ACT and the Northern Territory the same rights as those who live in the states. Since the ACT Legislative Assembly unanimously passed the motion on 31 March, I've continued to pre pre press the case. It is the last question, Madam Speaker. Come on. Um, Not members, to you, to Mr. Yeah. Hanson. Me members, members. Ms. Chain. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I've continued to press the case and momentum is building. Last month, the Northern Territory Attorney General and I published an opinion piece in the Canberra Times calling on the federal government to finally show some leadership on this issue and restore our territory rights. It'd be nice if they'd respond to our letter as well. I'm pleased to see so many Canberrans supporting territory rights and the Canberra Times launching their own Our Right to Decide campaign. We've received some valuable support from across the political spectrum over the past little while. Federal Minister Simon Birmingham, for example, put his support for territory rights on the record back in 2019. And last week, Mr Rattenbury and Mrs Jones were both great panel members at the Politics in the Pub discussing territory rights. The Federal Labor representatives for the ACT have all been particularly vocal in support of territory rights. For example, Andrew Lee recently sponsored a private member's motion in... Members, do not distract someone when they're on the floor. In the House of Representatives, calling on the government to repeal the law blocking the territories from legislating on voluntary assisted dying. And Senator Gallagher has also been very vocal. Resume your seat. Point of order. Uh, well, I actually literally can hardly hear Ms yes. Chain because of the chatter. Uh, members, if we were all silent, Ms Chain would be heard. Ms Chain. Uh, and Senator Gallagher has also been very vocal in the media. <laughs> Doctor, <laughs> members, we're getting to the end, I know, but there are more questions to go. Mr Pedersen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, have you written to the responsible federal minister about territory rights? And if so, what has the response been? Ms Chain. Ms Chain. Thank you. Mr Hanson, can we have one question time when I don't call you to water? No. <laughs> yes. Ms. Ms Chain. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I note that uh, once upon a time Mr Hanson actually considered this issue important. On the 3rd of March, the Northern Territory Attorney General and I jointly wrote to three responsible federal ministers drawing their attention to the human rights implications of the territories not being able to legislate on voluntary assisted dying. And we asked the ministers to take action to fix this. We wrote to the then Minister for Regional Development uh, and the, Minister, the Assistant Minister for Territories, Nola Marino, and the then Attorney General, Christian Porter. We've not received a response when there was a cabinet reshuffle. So on 23 April, the Northern Territory Attorney General and I wrote to the incoming Federal Attorney General to highlight that we'd not received a response and we've still not received a response from any minister and today it marks five months. All we've had is a note from the Attorney General's department saying they've referred our correspondence to Ms Marino, but we've since heard informally that the Attorney General has decided she is the responsible minister after all. It's deeply disappointing that the federal government has been bouncing the issue among ministers when all they need to do is agree to make a simple legislative change. While ever they continue to stall, they are preventing the territories from having a meaningful conversation about our end of life choices, all while the states are able to progress voluntary assisted dying laws for themselves. Mr Davis. Very much, Madam Speaker. Minister, what or who are the current greatest threats to securing territory rights? Ms Chain. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, uh, there is a, a probably a greatest hits list here. 
but I think what is incredibly frustrating... Members, enough. Please change. Madam Speaker, I think the greatest threat overall here is the conflation of voluntary assisted dying with our democratic rights and with restoring territory rights. And Mr Hanson, that is enough. Ms Chair. And Madam Speaker, I implore members in the federal parliament to be aware of this issue, to be aware how it affects Canberrans and how it affects uh, all of the citizens of the Northern Territory how unfair and how untenable it is that uh, our rights are different to those of, uh, who reside in the states, uh, simply because uh, something was inserted into our self-government acts uh, more than 24 years ago. It's frustrating, it's sad, uh, and there are people who are suffering as, as a result, and it's those who cannot distinguish between the two issues uh, and those who are not standing up for us, including the ACT Liberal Senator and Zed Seselja, who could be actively campaigning for territory rights, but instead is actively campaigning against Canberrans and thus abandoning them. That is so incredibly frustrating to many members here. Mr Barr. Further questions can be placed on the notice paper. Thank you, Madam. I agree. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Barr. So, are there matters arising from question time, members, before we move to papers? No matters arising. General report number seven, entitled Procurement Exemptions and Value for Money, pursuant to a continuing resolution to 6A, 10th of April 2008, as amended in August of 2008, I present a report from the Ethics and Integrity Advisor for the period 1 July 2020 to the 30th of June of this year, pursuant to continuing resolution 5AA of 31 of October 2013, amended 3rd of August 2017 and 22nd of August 2019, I present a report for the Commissioner of Standards for the period of July of last year to the 30th of June this year. Pursuant to subsection 2281 of the Legislation Act 2001, I present Assembly Committee for the Consultation Appointments of Statutory Provisions, nomination 2021 number two. Also, for the information of members, I present correspondence from the following committees in relation to referral of bills pursuant to resolution of the Assembly of the 2nd December of last year and amended of the 30th of March of this year, and that being Standing Committee on Economy, Gender and Economic Equality in relation to Work Health Safety Amendment Bill 2001, 2021, Standing Committee on Education Community Inclusion in relation to the Senior Practitioner Amendment Bill, Standing Committee on Health and Community Wellbeing in relation to the Carers Recognition Bill 2021 and the Domestic Violence Agencies Amendment Bill, and Standing Committee on Justice and Community Safe in Relations to the Crimes and Legislation Amendment Bill, and finally, Member Standing Committee on Planning, Transport and City Services in relation to the Road Transport Safety and Traffic Management Amendment Bill of 2021, number two. And I will call Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Pursuant to Standing Order 211, I present papers in accordance with the schedule circulated. Thank you, Mr Gentleman, and again. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Pursuant to Legislation Act 2001, I present subordinate legislation in accordance with the list circulated. Thank you, Mr Gentleman, and again. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Pursuant to Standing Order 211, I move that the Assembly take note of the Government's response to the report entitled Respect at Work, Sexual Harassment in Australian Workplaces. Question is that that motion is agreed, and I'll call Ms Berry. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker. Today I'm tabling the ACT Government's response to the Australian Human Rights Commission's Respect at Work National Inquiry into Sexual Harassment in Australian Workplaces. The Respect at Work report provides a clear evidence-based and survivor-centred approach to responding to workplace sexual harassment. Our response to this report sets out the ACT's long-term commitment to creating a culture of respectful behaviour across all workforce workplaces in the ACT. In our response, we have provided an overarching position to each of the 55 recommendations made in the Respect at Work report. This will guide our future and ongoing work to understand, prevent and respond to sexual harassment at work based on the principles of respect, equity, diversity and human rights. 
Madam Speaker, all individuals and workers have a fundamental right to feel safe and protected in their workplaces and in the community. This includes safety from psychosocial hazards. Sexual harassment denies victims this right and often has profound and destructive impacts for all aspects of their lives. Distressingly, sexual harassment remains pervasive across workplaces and the broader community, regardless of setting, level, industry or location. In 2018, the ACT Human Rights Commission found that over four in five Australian women and half of Australian men over the age of 15 had been sexually harassed at some point in their lifetimes. This is confronting and an unacceptable reality. The unjust injustice of this is undeniable. We must show that as a government and as an ACT community more broadly, that we reject sexual harassment in any and all circumstances and are committed to continuing work to promote respectful workplaces free of sexual harassment. Mr Assistant Speaker, the ACT government has already taken significant steps to prevent and respond to sexual harassment in workplaces and across the community and to promote equality and respect. Fostering gender equity in Canberra workplaces is a key priority under the second action plan of the ACT's Women's Plan 2016-26, which I launched in March 2020. To achieve this, we are providing enhanced support for women, improving opportunities for women in traditionally male-dominated building and construction industries, and promoting programs to improve gender equality in workplace leadership and participation. This will make a vital contribution to developing respectful and equal cultures and practices in workplaces across the ACT. We have also developed respectful relationships education across our ACT schools to promote attitudes and behaviours which reject violence and value respect and equality. Addressing the social and cultural drivers of gender-based violence through education is critical to prevent sexual harassment. Led by the experts in the sector, I have recently established the Sexual Assault Prevention and Response Program to reinvigorate and redirect our response to sexual assault. The Prevention Working Group and the Workplace Reference Group under this program have already made excellent progress in developing advice to guide our future responses to workplace sexual harassment in the context of pre preventing and promoting uh, gender equality. However, the ACT cannot address sexual harassment alone. Sexual harassment is everyone's business and responsibility. We are therefore committed to working with our federal, state and territory partners to develop national solutions to workplace sexual harassment. We have submitted this response to National Cabinet and I look forward to working with all Australian governments and my colleagues in the Women's Safety Task Force to develop collaborative and coordinated responses to sexual harassment in the ACT and across Australia. The ACT is contributing to the, de to the development of the next national plan to reduce violence against women and their children, to continue the progress made under the current plan to make Australia safer for all. Sexual harassment is not inevitable, it is preventable. Every Canberran and every Australian can contribute to addressing to eliminating it. I am confident that in the ACT, we can come together to build a society where people feel safe and protected. And I look forward to working alongside our community to drive meaningful change in workplaces and long-lasting change to cultures of behaviour. This response is an important step along this path. And I thank all individuals who have been involved in the consultation, development and drafting of this significant response, and I commend the response to the family. So, members, the question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I declare the ayes have it. Uh, I call Mr Gentleman. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. Pursuant to Standing Order 211, I move that the Assembly take note of the approval of variation to the Territory Plan, number 379. No members, the question is that the motion be agreed to. Mr Gentleman. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. Uh, this variation implements the outcomes of the Gungahlin Strategic Assessment 2013 for matters of national environmental significance protected under the Commonwealth's uh, Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999, or the EPPC. The land is to be incorporated into the Canberra Nature Park 
as a nature reserve by the name of Najung Mada. It is the 39th reserve in the Canberra Nature Park. It's always a pleasure and a privilege as Minister for Planning and Land Management to be able to continue adding to Canberra Nature Park. To create this new nature reserve, Variation 379 rezones Gungahlin Rural Block 820 and part of the old Well Station Road track from a range of existing urban zonings under the future urban area overlay to the non-urban NUZ3 Hills Ridges and Buffers zone. It also replaces the future urban area overlay with the Nature Reserve public land overlay on the Territory Plan map. Mr Assistant Speaker, the draft variation 379 was released for public comment between December 20 and February 2021. It attracted four public submissions. These submissions were generally uh, supportive of the variation and raised matters related to the future access and management of the Najung Mada Nature Reserve. A report on consultation was prepared by the ACT Planning and Land Authority and responded to the issues raised in the submissions. Given the support for the proposal, no changes were made to the draft variation as a result of the public consultation processes. Under section 73 of the Planning and Development Act 2007, I referred the draft variation to the Standing Committee on Planning, Transport and City Services. Mr Assistant Speaker, the Standing Committee advised me on the 15th of July 2021 that it had decided not to conduct an inquiry into DV 379. I approved Variation 379 because it implements the recommendations of the Gungahlin Strategic Assessment and secures a significant area of land for the Najung Mata Nature Reserve. I now table the approved variation to the Territory Plan 379. So, members, the question is that the motion be agreed to. Those with that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I declare the ayes have it. Clark. Private members to business, notice number one. Dr Patterson. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. I wish to move the motion appearing in my name on the notice paper. This motion addresses the issue of vaping or e-cigarette use in our community, in particular by children and young adults. E-cigarettes are battery-powered devices that deliver an aerosolised solution with or without nicotine. To date, there are over 7,000 e-liquid flavours available worldwide and over 400 different e-cigarette brands. These e-cigarettes heat liquid flavour or nicotine to the point it becomes a vapour, then it is inhaled. E-cigarettes do not contain the typical carcinogens present in tobacco smoke. However, there are unknown long-term health impacts of the solvents, flavours, additives and contaminants that can be found in the vapour that is inhaled through e-cigarettes. At the end of the day, we don't know if vaping causes cancer, we don't know if vaping increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. Currently in Australia, people buy liquid nicotine from overseas websites. This industry of devices, liquid nicotine and flavours is largely unregulated globally, with international studies evidencing serious concerns around mislabeling as well as targeting and marketing of these products to young people. There is much debate in the community about the potential e-cigarettes have to reduce tobacco-related harm. One argument suggests that e-cigarettes are less harmful than tobacco cigarettes. Another argument uh, supports the view that e-cigarettes, which don't contain nicotine, could fulfil the habit and behaviour of smoking without the harmful effects. However, there is currently insufficient evidence to demonstrate whether e-cigarettes are effective in this purpose of smoking cessation. A recent study by the ANU Centre for Epidemiology and Population Health, published in September last year, notes that the substantial majority of smokers who quit successfully do so unaided and no e-cigarette products have been approved by the Australian Therapeutic Goods Administration as smoking cessation aids. The report further notes that currently there is insufficient evidence that nicotine delivering e-cigarettes are more effective smoking cessation aid than no intervention non-nicotine non e-cigarettes or standard nicotine replacement therapy. Simi similar conclusions have been reached by ma re recent major national and international reports reviewing this evidence. 
Before a product can claim that it can help with quitting smoking or managing nicotine withdrawal symptoms, it must be assessed and approved by the Therapeutic Goods Administration for safety and efficacy. Currently, no brand of e-cigarettes has been approved by the TGA for this purpose. Counter to this position, e-cigarettes, uh, the position of e-cigarettes helping people to quit smoking, e-cigarettes have the potential for the reverse effect, creating pathways and behaviour which can lead to nicotine addiction, particularly in young people. The NHMRC states that there is some evidence from longitudinal studies to suggest that e-cigarette use in non-smokers is associated with further uptake of tobacco cigarette smoking. The ANU report I referenced earlier further states that among people who have never smoked or are current non-smokers, those who use e-cigarettes are, on average, around three times more likely to take up smoking of conventional cigarettes and, and transition to regular tobacco smoking as those who have not used e-cigarettes. To this point, much of our success in reducing smoking rates across the country has largely been that young people are not taking up cigarette smoking. Our public health and legislative reforms are working. However, e-cigarettes and vaping may work to undermine these efforts with anecdotal evidence suggesting that young people in our community are vaping. The National Health and Medical Research Centre, the NHMRC, is currently funding Australian research into this matter and more broadly into the effects of safety and efficacy of e-cigarettes. A key report that has just been released by the World Health Organisation highlighting the dangers of novel nicotine products. It notes that nicotine is highly addictive. Electronic nicotine delivery systems are harmful and must be better regulated. Where they are not banned, governments should adopt appropriate policies to protect their populations from the harms of electronic nicotine delivery systems and to prevent their uptake by children, adolescents and other vulnerable groups. Another recent study, this one undertaken by the University of Queensland, has analysed the impacts of the portrayal of vaping on TikTok. TikTok is a platform primarily used for young people and one middle-aged Liberal member of the Assembly. The UK study noted that TikTok's community guidelines restrict uploading videos featuring the depiction, promotion and trade of drugs or other controlled substances. Advertising of tobacco and alcohol pro products is also pro prohibited on the platform. However, the findings of the University of Queensland study suggest that TikTok was not acting to control vaping promoting video content. We need national regulation and legislation to address situations such as this. The University of Queensland study called for age restrictions to reduce young viewers' exposure to videos internationally or inadvertently advertising vaping products and behaviour. Predominant medical associations, including the World Health Organisation, the Australian Medical Association, the Therapeutic Goods Association, the Public Health Association and the Cancer Council of Australia, have all published position papers raising their concern with e-cigarettes and vaping. The World Health Organisation calls for caution surrounding their use, urges governments to apply precautionary principles and notes the need for further studies and research into various aspects and impacts. The ACT's legislation and regulation around the use of e-cigarettes and vaping is among some of the most progressive in the country and well ahead of the national regulation and legislation. In the ACT, under the Tobacco and Other Smoking Products of, uh, Act of 1927, it is an offence to supply vaping products to people under the age of 18. It is an offence to be reckless about whether the person to whom the vaping products is sold is under 18, for ex including failing to check for identification. It is an offence to purchase a vaping product for someone aged under 18, and it is an offence to display advertisement for e-cigarettes and vaping products. Under other ACT legislation, the Medicines, Poisons and Therapeutic Goods Act, of 2008, it is an offence to commercially sell or supply nicotine for use in e-cigarettes. 
These measures, particularly those around advertising, packaging and marketing of e-cigarettes and vaping products, are intended to prevent non-smokers, including young, young people and children, from the uptake of smoking. Nationally, the advertising of vaping products, including packaging, is not regulated. In 2020, the ACT government made a submission to the Federal Government's Australian Senate Select Committee on Tobacco Harm Reduction, calling for effective internet safeguards to prevent children from purchasing vaping products. National regulations or nationally recognised approaches to flavoured uh, nicotine vaping products. The regulation of e-cigarette packaging and product names to ensure their use is not marketed to appeal to young children. The display of health warnings or advisories consistent with evidence as validated by the NHMRC. And requirement for childproof packaging for nicotine liquid and nicotine salts. These reforms, uh, these reforms have not yet occurred or come into effect. One aspect of these recommendations is asserting the importance of childproof packaging for nicotine substances. Nicotine is a poison. It is a highly toxic substance. I would like to point the Assembly to the Victorian Coroner's Report of July 2019. The report outlines the devastating circumstances of the death of an 18-month-old baby, referred to as Baby J as a result of the accidental ingestion of liquid nicotine that was being mixed for e-cigarette use. The coroner stressed that not enough had been done to educate the community about the risks associated with e-cigarettes and the toxicity of liquid nicotine. Despite the ACT legislation effectively making it illegal for people under 18 to vape, this is something that is occurring in our community. I originally received a couple of emails from, from concerned parents that their children had obtained e-cigarettes at school. I investigated this fairly further by posting widely, wi widely on Canberra's Facebook notice boards, encouraging parents to contact me if they felt that this was an issue among teenagers in the ACT. I received many emails from concerned parents who reported widespread vaping amongst teenagers, our children, in the ACT. It is imperative that we act now. Kids will always be kids and want to push boundaries and try new things. We cannot let another generation be, be sucked down the path of those previous generations. Smoking is still the biggest cause of preventable death around the world. It is important to acknowledge the Commonwealth, uh, the Commonwealth moves to further regulate e-cigarettes. From the 1st of October, you will no longer be able to legally buy these products from overseas websites without talking to a GP and getting a prescription. So today, um, I would like to uh, commend everyone who has worked on this issue over the last few years, including my colleagues, um, Ms Rachel Stephen-Smith as Minister for Health and Ms Yvette Berry as Minister for Education, as well as the staff of the relevant directorates. I move this motion today on behalf of my constituents and the ACT community to protect our children from the, this potential harmful product that threatens to normalise smoking behaviour to another generation, undoing all the pro progress we have achieved. We must support those in our community with nicotine addiction to quit smoking. We already have many effective programs in place, uh, such as the great work undertaken by organisations such as Quitline and the Cancer Council. While we await the outcomes of NHMRC studies and others, there is more we can do right now, based on what we know about vaping and e-cigarettes. I move that this Assembly call on the ACT Government to continue to develop programs that educate and inform Canberrans, particularly young Canberrans, about the risks of e-cigarettes to prevent their uptake and use. I move that this Assembly call on the ACT Government to review relevant ACT legislation to ensure that current arrangements are contributing to minimise the harm being caused by e-cigarettes and vaping across our community and particularly for young people. I further move that this Assembly call on the ACT Government to advocate again to Federal Ministers for amendments to Commonwealth legislation to regulate e-cigarettes 
by amending the national tobacco control legislation to expand the scope of plain packaging and advertising legislation to include non-tobacco smoking pro products. To restrict the type of e-liquid flavours and de vaping devices permitted to be sold in Australia, so that those that are less likely to appeal to children and young people, and requiring child safe packaging. I also move that this Assembly call on the ACT Government to seek consideration by the Health Minister's meeting on stronger national measures for vaping products. Lastly, I move that the, ACT government, uh, the Assembly call on the ACT Government to report back on these issues uh, to the Assembly no later than the first sitting week in December 2022. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister Rachel Stephen-Smith. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. And I rise to speak to Dr Patterson's very important motion and thank her for bringing this matter to the Assembly for debate. Mr Assistant Speaker, Australia has led the world when it comes to tobac tackling tobacco smoking and the harms it causes. We've taken on big tobacco before and we have won. Plain packaging for cigarettes, for example, was extremely controversial. And I want to acknowledge the commitment of the then Labor government to this historic reform, and particularly the efforts of Nicola Roxon as the health minister who introduced the legislation, and then as attorney general, as the legal fight escalated internationally. Within Australia, the ACT is a leader in tackling tobacco smoking and reducing the impact that it has on the health and wellbeing of our community. We've taken big strides, both at the na national and territory level, to reduce the rate of people smoking in the community and the number of people who take up smoking in the first place. Currently, around 8.2 per cent of adults living in the ACT are daily smokers and 0.6 per cent of secondary school students. To put this into context, Mr Assistant Speaker, in 1998, 22.5 per cent of Canberrans over the age of 14 were daily smokers. In a little more than 20 years, the ACT has seen a reduction from more than one in five adults smoking to fewer than one in 10. However, our efforts to reduce the terrible lifelong health burden caused by tobacco are being threatened by e-cigarettes and vaping. Unfortunately, young people are attracted to these products. And make no mistake, Mr Assistant Speaker, this is by design. E-cigarette sellers have recycled the tactics that were used to market tobacco to children in the 1950s, including celebrity endorsements, attractive promoters, sweet flavours and cartoons. For adults, there's encouragement to switch rather than quit. Vaping devices are designed to look cool and attractive, incorporating edgy artwork. Vape liquid la labels often include cartoons, bright colours and child-oriented confectionery names like gummy bears, sour worms and jelly beans. Sellers describe their products using work that's strongly linked to food and pleasure, such as juicy, sweet, fizzy, tangy, frosty, yummy, luscious and treats. And concerningly, it appears to be working. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare reporting that in 2019, one in five Australian non-smokers aged 18 to 24 had tried e-cigarettes, mostly out of curiosity. In addition, we know that in the United States, almost 20% of high school students and nearly 5% of middle school students are using e-cigarettes. This rate of use is occurring in a relatively unregulated environment and we do not want to see those figures here. We're increasingly hearing reports, as Dr Patterson has talked about, of increasing adolescent use of e-cigarettes in the ACT, and this is indeed hugely concerning. We don't know how many ACT adolescents are vaping because the last data was collected in 2017 and the Australian Secondary School Student Alcohol and Drug Survey has had to postpone its next data collection to 2022 due to COVID-19. But this hasn't stopped our work to reduce daily smoking rates and the number of people who start smoking. A key priority to our plan, in our plan to improve the health and wellbeing of the ACT community, the Healthy Canberra Plan, is to reduce the damage from tobacco. To achieve this, the plan identified a key aim, having fewer children and young people using smoking products, including e-cigarettes. There, there is strong and consistent evidence that non-smokers who use e-cigarettes are more likely to go on to smoke combustible tobacco than non-smokers who do not use e-cigarettes. E-cigarettes are a gateway to smoking. In addition, it is already clear that vaping irritates the respiratory tract, is likely to have long-term systemic effects on the cardiovascular system, and may lead to cancers of the respiratory tract. 
It will be many years before we do truly know the full health effects of e-cigarettes. So, Mr Assistant Speaker, what are e-cigarettes? The Commonwealth Department of Health describes them this way. E-cigarettes are devices that deliver an aerosol by heating a solution that users breathe in. The aerosol is commonly referred to as vapour. Using an e-cigarette is referred to as vaping. E-cigarettes are battery operated and may look like cigarettes, cigars, pipes, pens or memory sticks. The liquids used in e-cigarettes may contain a range of toxic chemicals, including those that add flavour, and sometimes contain nicotine, even if they are labelled as being nicotine free." End quote. Mr Assistant Speaker, we know that nicotine exposure during adolescence can harm the developing brain, impact learning, memory and attention, and increase the risk for future addiction to other drugs. Vaping can also potentially expose both the vapour and bystanders to other harmful substances. These include heavy metals, volatile organic compounds and ultrafine particles that can be inhaled deeply into the lungs. ACT Health has developed a fact sheet on the health impacts of e-cigarettes for children, young people and adults. Information like this is a critical part of making sure Canberrans know the risks. However, in the face of the industry's underhanded tactics, we know that without effective controls on advertising and marketing, health messaging can only achieve so much. To help achieve our goals, we continue to invest in grants and programs to address nicotine and smoking related harms through our health pr pr promotion grants and partnerships with community organisations. Mr Assistant Speaker, the ACT Government recognises that the regulation of e-cigarettes is complex. Responsibility is spread across ACT tobacco legislation and medicines and poisons legislation, as well as Commonwealth legislation. In 2016, my predecessor, my predecessor Megan Fitzharris MLA, introduced the Smoke Free Legislation Amendment Act 2016 to this Assembly to protect the health of the public from the potential harms associated with personal vaporisers. This Act made the ACT the first jurisdiction to regulate e-cigarettes. As a result, under the Tobacco and Other Smoking Products Act 1927, the ACT treats e-cigarettes in the same way as tobacco products and applies the same offences for non-compliance. Regulatory measures also apply to all e-cigarettes, regardless of whether they contain nicotine. But this does not stretch to Commonwealth legislation. For example, online marketing approaches used by e-cigarette companies would be prohibited under the Commonwealth's Tobacco Advertising Prohibition Act or the Tobacco Plain Packaging Act if these were considered tobacco products. Another example, although one that is soon to be rectified, is that liquid nicotine is classed as a Schedule 7 poison and is regulated under the ACT's Medicines, Poisons and Therapeutic Goods Act 2008, which makes it illegal to supply nicotine, e-cigarettes and liquid nicotine without a prescription from an Australian medical practitioner, but currently Commonwealth law is less strict. From the 1st of October this year, however, changes to Commonwealth Poison Standard will take effect, aligning the Commonwealth instrument with our law. This means Australians will, uh, Australians will no longer be able to buy or import nicotine e-cigarettes or nicotine vaping products from overseas website without a valid doctor's prescription, reinforcing the need to have a doctor's prescription before purchasing nicotine e-cigarettes from any source. From the 1st of October, also child-resistant closures for nicotine vaping products will also become mandatory to reduce the risk to children of accidental ingestion. And Dr Patterson has spoken about just how terrible the outcomes of that can be. These changes are welcome and will provide some additional protections to young people by reducing their access to nicotine e-cigarettes. However, we know that there are currently significant imports of these products occurring, and it is unclear how effectively border measures will control the illegal supply of these products into Australia. Mr Assistant Speaker, I consider that it is critical to protect Australia's tobacco control achievements as well as to protect children and young people from initiation of tobacco and e-cigarettes. As Dr Patterson notes, in November 2020, the ACT Government made a submission to the Select Committee on Tobacco Harm Reduction calling on the Commonwealth to introduce improved protections for children, including effective internet safeguards, a national regulatory, regulatory approach to flavoured nicotine vaping products e-cigarette packaging, health warnings and childproof packaging for nicotine liquid and nicotine salts. We advocated for the Commonwealth to regulate non-nicotine e-cigarettes to further protect children and young people. 
The Commonwealth changes that come into effect on the 1st of October will go part way to addressing our request for health warnings and childproof packaging for nicotine liquid and nicotine salts. However, these requirements will only apply to a product supplied in Australia and not to e-cigarettes imported from overseas suppliers using the personal importation scheme. This means that ACT children may still be at risk of poisoning from products legally imported under this scheme. The changes will also not place any controls on e-cigarette products that do not contain nicotine, even though purchases of non-nicotine products may add nicotine to them. It is likely to be several years before we know whether Commonwealth amendments to tobacco advertising and packaging legislation will address the current issues with internet supplies, flavours, packaging and non-nicotine e-cigarettes. That is why this motion and the ACT's government work in partnership with the Commonwealth and other jurisdictions is so important. It is also why I recently wrote to the Commonwealth Minister for Health seeking that health ministers get a report back on the analysis of the harms of e-cigarettes that we requested in 2019. Mr Assistant Speaker, that work has been disrupted by COVID, but it is absolutely critical that it continue apace. Ms Jones. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. Uh, and I thank Dr Peter Patterson for this debate today. And I think it goes to, very much to the heart of um, something that maybe my generation and older don't understand if we're not smokers because we haven't necessarily had a lot of access to these devices. We've certainly seen them used in the community, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we are um, au fait with all the details of what the companies that are pushing these things are trying to achieve. So going back to the prevalence of smoking in Australia, especially amongst young people, we know it's thankfully declined in recent decades. Between 1991 and 2019, the percentage of people in Australia that were daily smokers declined from 24% to 11%. The reduction of smoking by young people has also fallen significantly. In 2001, 15.4% of 14 to 17 year olds in Australia smoked. In 2019, that number had fallen to 3.2%, a reduction of almost 80%. In the ACT, efforts to counter the uptake of tobacco smoking amongst young people have been successful. Between 2007 and 2019, the percentage of people in the ACT aged 18 to 24 who smoked declined from 21.1% to 9.9%. Despite these successes, there is a real risk that uptake of vaping, particularly amongst young people who have never smoked, could lead to a generation of people that face currently unknown specific health consequences um, of extended vaping. Concerningly, there is a trend towards young people taking up vaping, even those who have never smoked, as I mentioned. In, this, in its report, the National Drug Strategy Household Survey 2019, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare noted Young adults were most likely to be attracted to these products. Nearly two-thirds of current smokers and one in five non-smokers aged 18 to 24 reported having tried e-cigarettes. Frequently um, of use also, frequency of use also rose among smokers between 2016 and 2019. Daily use rose from 1.5% to 3.2% and at least monthly in use increased from 34 to 7.8%. That report warned as follows. Between 2016 and 19, the percentage of the Australian population that had never smoked but had nonetheless tried vaping rose from 4.6 to 6.9 per cent of the Australian population. While vaping is often represented as an alternative to smoking that can assist smokers quitting, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare also warned that although more than two-thirds, 69 per cent, of electronic cigarette users were smokers when they first tried an e-cigarette, nearly one in four considered themselves to have never smoked at the time. Younger users were far more likely to report having never smoked than older users, 39 per cent of 18 to 24-year-olds, compared with less than 10 per cent of people aged 40 and over. Let me emphasise that one in four people between 18 and 24 who vaped regularly were never cigarette smokers. Concerningly, the risks of vaping are presently unknown. A 2020 study by the Curtin University and the Telethon Kids Institute, commissioned by the Australian Lung Foundation, tested 52 vaping liquids sold over the counter in Australia. That study found that 100% of e-liquids had between 1 to 18 chemicals, which have unknown effects on the respiratory health. Uh, none of the brands had a complete accurate ingredients list, which would be non-compliant with European Union labelling regulations. 21% of e-liquids contain nicotine or nic nictrine, despite it being illegal to sell e-liquids containing nicotine in all Australian states and territories. 
62% of new e-liquids and 65% of vaped e-liquids contained chemicals likely to be toxic if vaped repeatedly. The Morrison government via the Therapeutic Goods Administration has taken substantial steps to restrict access to vaping fluids that contain nicotine by closing gaps in the current regulatory regime in Australia. Currently, while the sale of vaping fluids that contain nicotine is illegal in all states and territories, the importation of vaping fluid containing nicotine is not prohibited. From the 1st of October 2021, the importation of nicotine e-cigarettes and liquid nicotine for vaping will require a valid prescription. It is important to note that this change will not prevent access to vaping fluid to persons who have a prescription from their doctor. Uh, the Canberra Liberals do not oppose the motion, but note the efforts that are already underway to reduce the risks from vaping. Many of those efforts are squarely on the in the responsibility of the Commonwealth and are currently being progressed via the Therapeutic Goods Administration and other agencies such as the Australian Consumer uh, Competition and Consumer Commission. In relation to marketing and the safety of e-cigarettes, we will support the motion and look forward to the reporting back to the Assembly of the, um, of the findings of the investigations. Mr Davis. Thank you very much, Mr Assistant Speaker. Uh, the ACT Greens will be supporting Dr Patterson's motion, calling on the ACT Government to educate and advocate for the prevention of the use of e-cigarettes or vapes. There has been increased and important attention in recent weeks to the uptake of vaping by people who otherwise would not be likely to start smoking, including younger people. I appreciate Dr Patterson bringing that important conversation to the Assembly in this well-considered motion. Australia has a strong track record of leading the way on legislative and taxation reform that has driven down the rate of smoking. This approach has also included our ban on the importation of liquid nicotine and, as the motion rightly points out, should be extended to include plain packaging for vaping paraphernalia, banning advertisements for said products and requiring child safe packaging. Vaping is considered by some, including some experts, to be a potential method of harm reduction when used as a smoking cessation or replacement product. Indeed, the invention of e-cigarettes in the early 2000s was motivated by an interest in providing a safer alternative to smoking. For those who are already current smokers, that may indeed be the case, and seeking opportunities to move smokers off extremely harmful tobacco should be encouraged. However, the reality is that e-cigarettes pose far more problematic uh, for our health than the issues they allegedly seek to solve. As an appealing tasting and smelling product that does not have the same stigmas and social taboos as smoking, vaping is used as a tool by tobacco companies to encourage and initiate nicotine addiction, which will most likely lead to smoking and therefore a long-term reliance on their products. Statistics collected by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare evidence the growing trend of vape uptake amongst people over 18, with a doubling of usage between 2016 and 2019. With a smoking rate so low, and a policy landscape that has already been so successful in reducing smoking rates, we have everything to lose in allowing vaping to be a pathway towards the initiation of smoking. The focus of this public debate, and reflected in Dr Patterson's motion, is the fear that young people are particularly at risk due to both the peer pressures and the savvy social media presence of companies such as Juul, who have been criticised and litigated in the United States for their role in promoting nicotine addiction in younger people. In this debate, we should be careful not to directly equate younger people to poor decision making merely due to peer pressure, nor assume that young people are at fault for the sophisticated marketing that they have been subjected to. Indeed, Millennials and Gen Z have been driving down the trend of underage drinking and drug use for which previous generations have been notorious. This proves that young people respond well to targeted and appropriate public health messaging and are indeed leaders of important social and cultural change. Today's young people are also much less likely than previous generations to take up smoking. This is precisely why tobacco companies consider them to be a new marketing opportunity and challenge. The fact that young people have been able to be targeted by nicotine companies evidences a gap in the policy and legislative regime that is our responsibility to fix, and that is why the ACT Greens are pleased to support Dr Patterson's motion. Before I end, I would like to take this opportunity to highlight a largely unspoken issue. The ACT does have one of the lowest smoking rates in the country, with our daily smoker rate stubbornly sitting at about 8 per cent. This claim to the lowest rate in the country is largely due, largely due to the socio-economic status of our population. 
We know that smoking unfortunately correlates to other measurements of marginalisation, such as poverty, sexuality, drug use and intergenerational trauma. We know that people who enter the criminal justice system are more likely to be smokers, and those that do not smoke are more likely to pick up smoking within prison. This is an intergenerational issue too, with people whose parents smoked while they were growing up so much more likely to smoke as well. Alongside doing great work to prevent the uptake of smoking through this motion, I would also like to take the opportunity to encourage the ACT government to commit to implementing an effective smoking secession strategy that target marginalised groups. In Atoda's budget submission, they have rightly pointed out that while the government has committed to further developing approaches to reducing smoking rates among high-risk population groups, it remains unclear about how they will go about implementing this commitment. While I am aware that smoking cessation work is partly done through the Healthy Canberra Grants Program, to be successful in supporting these smokers, we need an overarching and strategic approach to cessation among the stubborn 8%, especially given the particular and nuanced needs within these communities. I look forward to continuing to participate in this discussion as the ACT Green Spokesperson for Health, Young People and Drug Harm Reduction. I once again thank Dr Patterson for her motion, which the ACT Greens proudly support. Thank you, Mr Davis. The question is that Dr Patterson's motion be agreed to. In closing, Dr Patterson. The Deputy Speaker. Um, I would also like to thank Minister Stephen Smith, uh, Ms Jones and Mr Davis for their input in the debate. Um, I'm very glad that this motion has uh, received tripartisan support and I think it's testament to the fact that this is a really important issue and we don't want to be going backwards on it. I also wanted to say I agree with Ms Jones and Mr Davis' point that um, you know, uh, unless you're vaping as a, an adult, then the ins and outs of these devices can be quite foreign to you. However, that's exactly what this industry targets in children and in the advertising on these social media platforms that are um, yeah, particularly pitched to children and, um, and also has a lot of content from overseas on these things. So, um, yeah, in wrapping up, I'd like to say thank you very much for the support of this motion today. So the question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. Declare that the ayes have it. Clark. Private Member's Business, notice number two. Mr Kane. I move the motion standing my name on the notice paper relating to e-invoicing. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Mr Kane. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, today I'm calling on the Labor Greens government to implement e-invoicing across the ACT public service by the 1st of July 2022. E-invoicing e is the digital exchange of invoices between a buyer's and supplier's accounting systems. It enables shortened payment and processing times, fewer manual errors, and it is more secure than a paper-based system. E-invoicing is an innovative game changer that could reduce the cost of doing business by up to $20 per invoice, according to Deloitte Access Economics. In Australia, with an estimated 1.2 billion invoices exchanged annually, almost, and almost 90 per cent of small and medium businesses are still processing paper and, or PDF invoices, there are big productivity gains to be made. <clears throat> And yet when asked about when the ACT government would implement e-invoicing, the answer from the Minister was that he's not sure. Madam, Spe uh, Madam uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that's not good enough. The Labor Greens government should provide certainty on this and commit to a 1 July 2022 implementation. Another compelling reason for this is that e-invoicing should form part of Canberra's COVID-19 economic recovery. In a time when small businesses are struggling and government has an opportunity to put in place the digital infrastructure that could help drive our recovery, their response was to run the rotable, failed, choose CBR scheme. Imagine how that $2 million could have assisted with the preparation and scoping work needed to get e-invoicing up and running as soon as possible. Something that would have supported many more businesses in Canberra than just a handful. 
Another key reason to target 1 July 2022 is an implementation date is that the Commonwealth Government has mandated this date for all of its departments. No doubt there are many businesses and organisations in the not-for-profit sector in Canberra that provide goods and services to both the Commonwealth Government and the ACT Government. It would be very efficient for them to be able to use a single digital productivity enhancing system for invoicing. <clears throat> Mr Deputy Speaker, why aren't we taking advantage of our location and leveraging the benefits being introduced by the Commonwealth Government? We have all of the know-how and resources at our fingertips to make this a reality. <clears throat> Another really important reason to get this done, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that the implementation of a system like e-invoicing is simply good governance. All supplies to government should be paid on time, and it is a fact that not all of them are going back several years. Madam, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I say that again. This Labor Greens government, which claims to prioritise fair working conditions, is not paying all of its suppliers on time. <clears throat> and that is a statement from a answer to a question on notice that I've received. Businesses rely on cash flow, so the knock-on effect of this for business owners and staff is real. Implementing e-invoicing as soon as possible would be an important step forward ensuring all supplies to the ACT government are paid on time. And this is something small business advocates have been saying is needed for a long time now. Indeed, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Council of Small Business Associations Australia has been advocating for the adoption of invoicing for many years <clears throat> and have played an integral role in the Commonwealth Government's work in this area. But of course, this Labor Greens government has a track record of complacency and incompetence when it comes to creating a business friendly environment in our city. Instead of taking sensible action to provide benefits for all businesses, they prefer failed schemes like choose CBR. In April, they rejected my colleague Ms Cassley's motion calling for a ministerial advisory council for small business. That voice to government would no doubt be calling for common sense measures like e-invoicing. Again, a missed opportunity for, by this government. Canberra businesses are facing a skills shortage, but young people moving to Canberra for work can't afford to rent or buy a house here. This Labor Greens government locks small business out of its energy abatement schemes, adds red tape through union-backed systems like the Secure Local Jobs Code, and couldn't or wouldn't tell me how often they extend their panels rather than allow new applicants to tender. Time and again, I hear uh, Mr Deputy Speaker from businesses, organisations and constituents that this government has opportunities to deliver cutting edge digital systems and it just sits on its hands. A sign of indolence and complacency. Mr Deputy Speaker, e-invoicing e is just one part of the bigger picture of measures that should be put in place for our business community, as well as for the not-for-profit sector and the Canberra economy at large. We should be using this digital innovation as one of our COVID recovery measures, and we must absolutely ensure that supplies for the ACT government are paid on time. In closing, I implore this Labor Greens government to provide certainty right now by aligning its time frame for the implementation of e-invoicing to the Commonwealth Government's 1 July 2022 target. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr Kane. The question is that Mr Kane's motion be agreed to. Mr Steele. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I welcome the opportunity to discuss how our, how our government is continuing to support small businesses and local jobs in Canberra. Mr Kane's motion makes reference to the importance of assistance to business and we absolutely agree, which is why our government has a range of programs and initiatives in place to support local businesses, particularly small and medium enterprises. As we know, it has been a difficult year for business in Canberra and across the country and to this end our government has stepped up with a range of assistance measures, applying rates relief for commercial properties, we've made rent reduction support available for tenants of commercial properties directly impacted by COVID-19. We've provided payroll, payroll tax waivers and exemptions for business that have been unable to trade due to health restrictions. And we've waived food business registrations, outdoor dining and liquor licensing fees, and we'll continue to waive these until the 31st of March 2022. 
Access Canberra's Business Liaison Line has played a critical role in providing timely advice and guidance to business about the current public health directions in place. The service works closely with the Chief Health Officer to provide updates on travel requirements, COVID testing and the rollout of vaccines. To ensure all this assistance is, 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 is as accessible as possible, the ACT government has proactively reached out to business and as of 15th of July, Access Canberra had undertaken 8,700 site visits and sent over 200,000 direct emails to businesses to assist them in complying with public health directions. So our government is and has been standing beside Canberra businesses and supporting them through this very challenging period during the pandemic. And Mr. Assistance, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as part of the ACT government's support for businesses during COVID-19, we also announced that the standard payment timeframe for supplies to government would be reduced from 28 days to 14 days. Of course, where a supplier reaches an agreement that payments be made more frequently, payments are made in accordance with that agreement. In addition to halving the processing times for a significant number of businesses, we've also been seen steadily, steady progress in the percentage of invoices paid within standard timeframes. And of course, the vast majority of the ACT's invoice payment process is already automated. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, not only are businesses getting paid faster, but an even larger number of businesses are receiving those payments within the government's improved timeframes. To be precise, 94% of ACT government invoices are currently paid within 14 days. It's also important to point out a number of key pieces of information which are not reflected in Mr Kane's original motion. When it comes to the development of e-invoicing, we, we should acknowledge that a significant body of work has been undertaken at the Commonwealth level by the Australian Tax Office. The OTO has been consulting with state, territory and federal government departments to develop a statement of requirements for e-invoicing implementation. This is a process the ACT government has been actively engaged in. As the Commonwealth begins to implement an e invoicing process across their agencies, there will no doubt be lessons to be learned through that process which will be applicable and beneficial to the ACT uh, when we come to look at e invoicing. With this in mind, I move the amendments to reflect this Commonwealth led piece of work on e invoicing uh, through an amendment to uh, Mr Kane's motion. While the ACT supports this e-invoicing initiative and continues to work with the Commonwealth on it, it is prudent for us to monitor the implementation at the Commonwealth level, which is yet to be finalised. There may be risks in that implementation. There are with any major IT uh, implementation uh, process. So far from providing certainty that Mr Kane is after, we're keen on reducing the risk as much as possible by uh, seeing how it is implemented at the Commonwealth level before we undertake it here in the ACT. The ACT government is very supportive of reducing the processing costs and payment times for businesses, which is why we've already halved the standard payment times for invoices. We also support a reliable and automated system, which is already in place for much of the processing chain for invoices. There may be more work to do here, but we recognise the importance of working together with the Commonwealth and the ATO to get this right. I therefore move the amendments circulated in my name to Mr Kane's motion. Thank you, Mr Steele. The question is that Mr Steele's amendment to Mr Kane's motion be agreed to. Minister Rattenbrook. Thank you, Mr Citizen Speaker. I rise on behalf of the Greens to make some comments and respond to Mr Kane's motion today concerning the economic benefits of e-invoicing by the ACT government. Now, we will be supporting the amendments moved by Minister Steele this afternoon as I think they are both reflect the intent of Mr Kane's motion but also add some additional information. Uh, and they also reflect the work that's being undertaken to, uh, regarding the rollout of e-invoicing in line with the national approach to this issue. I think this is, uh, we welcome the opportunity to talk about this and thank Mr Kane for bringing, the forward motion, bringing forward the motion. Uh, as the amended motion or the amendment makes clear, the government has made some very useful progress in automating its invoicing and I think has made some real inroads in reducing payment times. I was I'm particularly pleased to see in Minister Steele's uh, amendment that he notes that the vast majority of the ACT's invoice payment process is currently automated, uh, that the ACT government reduced the standard payment terms from 28 days to 14 days for suppliers in 2020, and that 94 per cent of invoices are paid within 14 days. I think these are really important measures for small business. And cash flow is important. Uh, not having to spend the time chasing up people who have not paid their accounts those sort of things uh, really make a material difference. And I think these are uh, positive steps that have already been taken. 
Uh, but as Mr Steele has also noted in his remarks, uh, the government is of course now working as part of the Commonwealth process uh, to move to a more uh, comprehensive e invoicing system. And with my portfolio responsibility from, as Minister for Consumer Affairs, I certainly am conscious that simpler, faster and more transparent systems are beneficial for both consumers as well as suppliers. Uh, and so I certainly think that these are important initiatives and ones that are worth pursuing. Uh, certainly as the Greens, uh, we are very happy to see uh, the end of paper invoices as much as possible. It cuts, cuts waste uh, and so not only makes life simpler and easier for people, but if we can cut out a bit of excessive sending around of documents and the like, then this can only be a positive. Uh, certainly e-invoicing reduces compliance and administration costs, uh, particularly for small businesses, and I think that's a benefit for the whole community. And I note that and welcome the fact that Mr Kane had in his motion uh, not-for-profit organisations or community organisations. You know, so often they have, well, they're either they've got a lot of volunteer involvement uh, or they really want to be spending their resources on the important community so, uh, services that they are providing. So again, any imp improvement in efficiency, uh, reduction of administration is very positive for those organisations. So. Uh, I acknowledge the work that has already been t undertaken by the ACT government to make more rapid payment administration systems uh, and the work that is highlighted in Minister Steele's amendment about the ACT government's involvement in the ongoing Commonwealth processes uh, and can simply conclude by saying that we will be supporting the amendment moved by Minister Steele. Thank you. Uh, Minister Rattenbury, the question is that the amendment from Mr Steele to Mr Kane's motion be agreed to. In closing, Mr Kane. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I'll be speaking against the amendment and in support of my motion in closing. And I, I, I do appreciate that we seem to be on the same page here as to the merits of e-invoicing. As, as the members would be aware, most so software packages actually support e-invoicing and just waiting for suppliers and buyers to tick some boxes and make some commitments. So I am disappointed and disagree uh, that, that there's an intent to support this motion in, in its intent because the whole purpose of the motion is to ask the government to make a commitment to a time. That is not an unusual thing to request of a government reviewing any process, finding there's value in change, but not saying when it will happen. This is really disappointing. I think the business community in the ACT, particularly the small and not-for-profit not, not section, need a little bit more encouragement from the government that there will be something happening by a certain time. And so, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I speak in support of my motion that the government should commit to a time for implementing e-invoicing, something which it seems we are all agreed is a highly valuable change to make, but apparently not important enough to commit to a time. Thank you, Mr Kane. The question is that Mr Steele's amendment to Mr Kane's motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no declare that the ayes have it. The question now is that the motion as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. Declare that the ayes have it. I call Ms Clay. No. Uh, Mr. Mr Hanson, sorry. I've skipped one ahead. Mr Hanson, sorry. Uh, thanks, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I present scrutiny report number seven of the Standing Committee on Justice and Community Safety, performing its legislative scrutiny role together with a copy of the extracts of the relevant minutes of proceedings, and I seek leave to make a brief statement. Is leave granted? Thank you. Mr Hanson. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, scrutiny report number seven contains the committee's comments on six bills, five pieces of subordinate legislation, and two government responses, and the report was circulated to members when the Assembly was not sitting. Um, I just like to make a quick comment to thank the other members of the committee, 
I don't normally do that uh, with screening reports, but I'll take this opportunity, Dr Patterson and Ms Clay. Uh, and also for the committee uh, staff, uh, Julia Agostino, who's the secretary, Daniel Stewart, who is our legal advisor on bills, and Stephen Argument, who's the legal advisor on subordinate legislation. I'd certainly uh, thank them for their insights and their enthusiasm. Uh, it's nice to welcome back Anne Shannon as the Assistant Secretary, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Sophie Mellon, who's been uh, standing in uh, whilst Anne's been away. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to, uh, unusually probably, but thank the government. Uh, I think that, uh, by and large, the engagement from ministers and their staff and staff across directorates uh, is very cooperative and collegiate. Uh, they respond to scrutinies. Uh, request for further information, uh, and uh, it is a, a matter of uh, sometimes uh, quick turnaround. Uh, and by and large, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, they do make those efforts and respond uh, fulsomely uh, to the, uh, the scrutiny committee's uh, reports and requests for further information. I'd like to thank them also, and uh, I commend the report to the assembly. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. I call Ms. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Assistant Speaker. I present Report 2 of the Standing Committee on Planning, Transport and City Services, entitled Draft Review Management Plan, Canberra Nature Park, together with a copy of the extracts of the relevant minutes of proceedings. And, and you're moving that? I move that the report be noted. All right. And I'd like to speak to it too. So, so sorry, you're, you're seeking leave to make a statement? No? I seek leave to make a statement oh, if I okay. need to seek Okay, leave. sorry, sorry. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Ms Clay. Thank you. Um, I rise today to table the report of the Standing Committee on Planning, Transport and City Services on the Draft Reserve Management Plan for Canberra Nature Park. As the report notes, Canberra Nature Park is made up of 39 nature reserves, totalling approximately 11,400 hectares in and around urban Canberra. We, the committee, took the view that this was something really important, that yeah. the Canberra Nature Park yeah. is absolutely integral to the ecological sustainability, the character and the amenity of Canberra as a whole. In fact, there are very few parts of Canberra that are not within striking distance of the Canberra Nature Park, and all of Canberra is improved in that way. When the National Capital Plan talks about Canberra's landscape setting and layout within the Territory, and having given it a garden city image of national and international significance, it is impossible to envisage this without taking the Canberra Nature Park into account. In the process of inquiring into the draft plan, we learned a number of important things. We discovered there are increasing risks to the ecological integrity in the Canberra Nature Park from high levels of use, expanding residential development and from climate change. There appears to be a shortfall in resourcing for the Canberra Nature Park, and that constrains compliance, education and conservation activity by the ACT Parks and Conservation Service, who hold responsibility for managing the Canberra Nature Park. And there's a need for a more holistic management of the Canberra Nature Park, including a greater focus on connectivity between the reserves in order to achieve the best possible conservation outcomes for flora and fauna. We also learned that in Schedule 3, the management objectives for the public land in the Planning and Development Act provide that objectives for our nature reserves are to conserve the natural environment and to provide for public use of the area for recreation, education and research. Where there's an inconsistency between those, the objective of preserving ecological, the objective of conserving the natural environment should take precedence. This means that conserving the natural environment is without question the overriding objective for managing our Canberra Nature Park. Many submitters noted in this iteration of the plan that the superior status of the natural environment appears to have given way to other things, recreational use in particular, in ways that weren't contemplated by the Act. And we need to keep in mind that that is a really dangerous thing for future generations, for wildlife and for our nature. For this reason, we recommended that the plan be amended to set out clear, concise, measurable propositions throughout, that it provide clear articulations across its goals and actions, that it include reserve plans comprising measurable actions and goals in the body of the plan. And taking into account the size and the importance of the Canberra Nature Park and the number of goals and actions set out in the draft, we recommended staffing and other resource requirements be included in the plan and in budget papers. We don't want to see high aspirations undermined by a lack of resources. 
In conducting this inquiry, we found that comments made on to the consultation process had not always been reflected accurately and sufficiently in the draft plan. We recommend that future management plans accurately reflect the matters brought forward in consultation. Thank you. And we were also concerned at the pressure on the Canberra Nature Park brought about by high use, residential development and, in particular, by climate change. Taking this into account, we recommend that the ACT Parks and Conservation Service continually monitor the Canberra Nature Plan Reserve Management Plan and ensure that it is responsive to the fire and pandemic events which have recently had such a significant effect. The Canberra Nature Plan is an incredibly important and unique asset which should not in any way be taken for granted. We as a committee consider that the draft plan we considered could be improved upon as a guide and a test of the management of the Canberra Nature Plan and we look forward to the Minister's response to the recommendations we've made in this report. Thank you Mr Assistant Speaker. Thank you, Ms Clay. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. Declare that the ayes have it. I call Ms Birch. Thank you, um, Deputy Speaker. Pursuant to Standing Order 246A, I wish to make a statement on behalf of the Standing Committee of Administration and Procedure. On Wednesday, the 2nd of June this year, the Assembly considered a motion relating to the matter that was also subject of an inquiry before an Assembly committee. The Assembly referred the conventions and the practices around the interaction between the Assembly and the operations of Assembly's committee to the Standing Committee on Administration and Procedure to consider whether standing orders needed to be amended. At its meeting on the 21st of June and the 15th of July this year, the committee considered the issues around the discussion of matters within the Assembly that were also being considered by committees. There was some concern that the prohibition of discussing committee matters in the Assembly could constrain debate, and conversely, the Assembly debate could also impact on the work of the committee. Members will recall that in the 9th Assembly, the issue was canvassed and Report 13 of this committee in July of 2019, it and the report concluded that there is nothing to prevent members from discussing matters that are subject to a committee inquiry in the Assembly. The Assembly is free to discuss any matter it chooses, subject to standing orders and continuing resolutions. If a member wishes to lodge a notice of motion or a bill that closely relates to the subject matter there is currently under inquiry by an Assembly committee, the Assembly is free to debate the matter if it chooses. However, if the Assembly does debate such a matter, such debate should not preempt the findings or a possible recommendations of the committee or reveal private deliberations of the committee and evidence given in camera. Ultimately, members, it is the Assembly that determines whether it is the Assembly or an Assembly committee where matters are progressed, and the committee of this Assembly remains the same view uh, that it had of the Assembly, and I hope that that is provides guidance for us for the rest of this term. Thank you, Ms Birch. I call the clerk. Oh, Ms. Oh, she? Sorry, I've missed that one too. Ms Clay. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. Pursuant to Standing Order 246A, I wish to make a statement on behalf of the Standing Committee on Planning, Transport and City Services. I rise today to advise the Assembly that the Standing Committee on Planning, Transport and City Services is currently seeking further information on notice that will, if received, allow it to complete its inquiry into Gear Lane shops. Thank you, Ms Clay. I call the clerk. Executive Business, Order of the Day number 1, Senior Practitioner Amendment Bill 2021, Resumption of debate on the question that this bill be agreed to in principle. And I call Mr Milligan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I note the shortness of this bill and advise that the Canberra Liberals are supportive of the amendments. However, I note that the implications of COVID-19 may have had some impacts, including reduced ability to monitor and document issues by both the senior practitioner and service providers, a possible increase in restrictive practices due to administrative and staffing pressures, and reduced likelihood of new or unidentified restrictive practices being reported. The government promised to provide a summary interim report to the Assembly covering the work that has been undertaken so far before the end of February 2022. Regardless of the ambiguity over timing in this statement, 
It is unfortunate that reporting and statistics on events during an extensive COVID affected period will not be made available for another eight months. The lack of a comprehensive report may mean vital remedial action is not taken in a timely manner or that critical funding is deferred. Consultations with the consumer advisory sector and the ACT reveal a high level of concern about the aim to defer reporting as several recent major inquiries have revealed significant shortcomings in relation to services provided to residential residents of care and aged persons facilities. We need to know whether care standards have slipped. There is a need to ensure continued fairness for these, for those with disability. Mr. Assistant Speaker, the likely passing of the Carers Recon Recognition Bill will ensure will enhance interests by carers in their rights. Recognition is needed to address under-resourcing. It is also important that stronger consideration to be given to the right to protection and safety for both the person with a disability and for others involved with caring and further services. Delays in identifying systemic issues should not be overlooked. The responsibility for reporting falls mainly on public servants and institutions, all continue to operate during the ongoing COVID situation in the ACT. I am fearful that the extra time to be provided for reporting will give the government more opportunities to broaden the scope and definition of restrictive practices on vulnerable people at the expense of failing to remedy existing poor practices. Nonetheless, Mr Deputy Speaker, I confirm that the Canberra Liberals will support this bill. Thank you, Mr Milligan. The question is that the bill be agreed to in principle. Ms Berry. Uh, thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker, and, and I want to thank everybody who's contributed to the debate on the Senior Practitioner Amendment Bill. The Senior Practitioner Act 2018 focuses on the protection of human rights through the regulatory oversight of the use of re restrictive practices. The Act is in its infancy, and as it has required practices to be embedded and in reporting infrastructure built around it to ensure proper implementation and data collection. In my portfolios, I have seen the commitment of public schools to reducing and eliminating restrictive practices in the ACT. The Education Directorate continues to work alongside the Office of the Senior Practitioner to the application of the Senior Practitioner Act in educational settings. This amendment extends the time frame for the review of the Senior Practitioner Act. This extension will allow for more data to be collected and enable the further time required to allow practice changes to be embedded. This amendment will also allow government to continue to consult with workers across all settings where the Act applies, including unions like the CPSU, the UWU and the AEU. These workers are experts in what they do, and it's important that the government understands their perspectives on the implementation of the Act and any potential changes. Knowing more about how the Act is working will lead to better policy development and a stronger approach to reducing and eliminating restrictive practices in the ACT. I want to thank Minister Davidson for her continued commitment to ensuring that the rights of people who are subject to restrictive practices are protected, and I look forward to the review of the Act in 2023, and I commend the Bill to the Assembly. Thank you, Ms Berry. The question is that the bill be agreed to in principle. Ms Stephen-Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. Well, in 2018, following extensive consultation with overwhelming support from community members, I introduced the Senior Practitioner Act with the paramount purpose of protecting people's human rights. A restrictive <coughs> practice is defined by the Act as a practice that is used to restrict the freedom, rights or freedom of movement of a person for the primary purpose of protecting that person uh, or others from harm. As we know, restrictive practices are most likely to be used on the most vulnerable members of our community, children and young people, people with disability and older people. The reduction and elimination of restrictive practices is incredibly important, and the senior practitioner has and will continue to play a significant role in regulatory oversight. This amendment is minor but important. Extending the time frame to review the operation of the Act will allow for a quality and thorough review to take place with the intent. 
Since the Act's introduction in 2018, we've seen a direct impact in the ACT community through better education and awareness of restrictive practices. ACT government agencies and community services providers have gained insight into the use of restrictive practices that will be, and that insight will be essential throughout the review process as the Office of Senior Practitioner continues to mature. Mr Assistant Speaker, I was keen to speak today particularly to acknowledge the contribution of the inaugural Senior Practitioner, Mandy Donnelly. Mandy recently returned to Victoria but has left an indelible mark on the ACT. Mandy's practical approach has supported all sectors covered by the Act, the most comprehensive restrictive practices oversight regime in the country, to understand their legal obligations and, more importantly, how they can better support the people that they work with. Mr Assistant Speaker, the impact of COVID-19 has been profound and evident across the ACT community. We have heard this from the community services sector with implications for service delivery, increased demand and resourcing. By extending the timeframe for the review, a comprehensive process can take place in line with the intent of the Act across all sectors covered. I want to thank Minister Davidson and the officials who've worked on this bill for their commitment to the human rights of people who are subject to restrictive practices and assure Mr Milligan uh, that there is no ill intent here and that he needn't worry about the ACT government's commitments to the rights of the most vulnerable people in our community. We're pleased to, I'm pleased to support this bill today and look forward to the review in 2023. Thank you, Ms Stephen Smith. The question is that this bill be agreed to in principle. Ms Davidson? Thank you to everyone who has contributed to the debate on the Senior Practitioner Amendment Bill 2021. This bill confirms the ACT Government's strong commitment to pr promoting human rights and regulating, reducing and eliminating restrictive practices by ensuring the Senior Practitioner Act is reviewed in an effective and robust manner. The Senior Practitioner Act 2018 commenced on the 1st of September 2018. The Act created the new role of Senior Practitioner as well as providing a formal framework for the reduction and elimination of restrictive practices. The current Act requires that a review of its operation be carried out and a report provided to the Assembly as near to 1 September 2021 as practicable. This has not been possible due to a number of factors. The bushfires in 2020 and the COVID-19 public health emergency impacted the availability of resources, financial and personnel, to undertake the review within the intent of the Act. Compounding this, while the Act has been in place since September 2018, it is really in its infancy and as it has required practices to be embedded and reporting infrastructure built around it to ensure proper implementation and data collection. There has been a significant level of change since the establishment of the Act, including the commencement of the criminal offences provisions on 1 July 2020 and the impact of thin market pressures. The changes also include the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission transitioning the ACT to their regulatory framework for NDIS participants on 1 July 2019, as well as the inclusion of aged care providers in the register of the NDIS Commission from 1 December 2020 bringing those based in the ACT under the ACT Senior Practitioner. The ACT is the only jurisdiction in Australia to have regulatory oversight of child protection services, disability and education and care under the same legislation. Many of the providers operating within the sectors covered by the Act are new to a regulatory approach to the authorisation, reduction and elimination of the use of restrictive practices. Additionally, the Office of the Senior Practitioner has been utilising manual data collection methods which are time consuming both in reporting and interpretation of the data. The Senior Practitioner has worked tirelessly over the last 12 months to deliver a data system to digitise data collection. In June 2021, the new Restrictive Intervention Data System platform had a soft launch, meaning providers, as prescribed by the Act, will now move to an online and electronic database to create positive behaviour support plans and report against restrictive practices, whether these be routine or emergency uses. These factors have resulted in a lack of trend data and a complex context in which to gauge the effectiveness of the Act's implementation and the efficacy of the provisions in reducing and eliminating restrictive practices. It is expected, as providers further embed practices within their organisations, to see an increase or a levelling out of the number of plans which include a restrictive practice and the individual instances of use of restrictive practices before we will see a reduction in their use. This bill seeks an amendment to section 54 to provide further time to allow the changes to have stabilised and for RIDS to be embedded into practice. I am confident that this amendment will mean a more robust review of the operation of the Act will be undertaken, including consideration of the professional expertise required to undertake such a review 
and importantly, how the experiences and voices of people who are subject to restrictive practices will be documented, explored and analysed to tell us about the effectiveness of the Act and identify any areas for improvement. This will ultimately provide a more holistic picture of the restrictive practice landscape in the ACT. As previously committed, I will provide an interim update to the Assembly on the implementation of the Act, and I've asked the Community Services Directorate to provide me with an interim update by December of 2021. I again want to thank the individuals and organisations who are involved in the consultation, the development and the review of this bill, and I also want to thank the officials who've worked on this bill and the Scrutiny of Bills Committee for its consideration. I commend this bill to the Assembly. Thank you, Minister Davidson. The question is that this bill be agreed to in principle. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. Um, declare that the ayes have it. Is it the, the wish of the Assembly to dispense with the detail stage? Oh, I think that's a yes, yes. Um, the question is that this bill be agreed to. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I declare that the ayes have it. Uh, Mr Gentleman. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I move the Assembly do now adjourn. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. Ms Stephen Smith. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise with great joy uh, this afternoon to uh, celebrate the performance of Australia's equestrian eventing team at the Tokyo Olympics. And I do want to take this opportunity just to acknowledge the incredible performance of the team bringing themselves up from sixth place after the dressage in the team's event into the silver medal position. Uh, and Andrew Hoy, of course, an absolute legend of the sport, winning the individual bronze. Uh, I also I want to start by acknowledging uh, Stuart Tinney, who was the reserve rider um, and didn't quite make, was out of the team at the very, very last minute. Stuart, of course, will be known to people as the, one of the 2000 Olympics gold medalists, and if the rules had been the same as they have been in previous Olympics, would have been the individual medalist as well. Stuart Tinney is an uh, absolute uh, backbone of the sport here in Australia. Um, he is a real professional. He and his family work incredibly hard um, to support the sport here. Um, and it was sad for him that he missed out on a spot to actually ride, but I have no doubt that he was standing behind the others, um, giving all the advice he, and support that he could as they rode through uh, to their medal winning performance. Kevin McNabb, the least well known of the three riders who did compete, is a Queenslander. His name's Kevin, he's here to help and help he did with the equestrian team. Um, and his horse, Dom Kidam, performed um, an outstanding, uh, made an outstanding performance, both cross country and in the show jumping. Shane Rose, uh, the next rider, rode a horse called Virgil, well known for over jumping everything. Uh, he gave us a couple of heart-stopping moments on the cross country, but he, he brought it home clear within the time uh, and then had one rail down in the show jumping. Shane also is one of the absolute backbones of the sport here in New South Wales. He is a driving force for eventing New South Wales and can often be found both organising events and riding five horses in the one day, if not more, if you, if you will let him. Um, he is an incredible uh, force to be reckoned with, Shane Rose. He's had multiple, multiple injuries, um, and yet he keeps coming back to compete with different horses at the top level of the sport. And Andrew Hoy, what can you say? Riding Vasily de Lassos, he was the only, they were the only combination out of more than 60 uh, to finish the whole event on their dressage score. And it's more than a normal event. It's not just dressage, cross country and show jumping. It's dressage, cross country, show jumping and show jumping again. Uh, and two clear rounds in the show jumping, clear without time penalties, cross country, climbing from seventh at the start of the show jumping day into that bronze medal position. Um, at 62 years of age, having started his international competition career in 1978. Andrew is the consummate professional in our sport. And I am so fortunate to have actually uh, been taught by Andrew when he was visiting Australia um, a couple of years ago. Because one of the things about this sport, Mr. Assistant, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is that people work really hard. Equestrian sports are really expensive, but all of these people work their absolute butts off. They ride horses that belong to other people and they make ends meet by teaching and training and they all um, work incredibly, incredibly hard. 
I just want to also acknowledge um, that this was the first time in Olympic history that the individual gold medal had been won by a female rider. So congratulations to Julia Kruweski, um, the German rider, riding a relatively unknown horse. And one of the great beauties of our sport, Madam Speaker, is that men and women compete on an equal playing field and obviously from young to old, people are all competing against each other. And we've seen that in the, um, on the dais at the Olympic Games. So I want to congratulate Julia for being the uh, first female Olympic gold medal, individual gold medal winner. Uh, it's amazing that it's taken this long, but it is fantastic that it has. Congratulations to our Aussie team and huge congratulations to Andrew Hoy. And I would not be surprised, Madam Speaker, if we saw him back again in another four years. Thank you. Question is the Assembly do adjourn. Mr Parton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to bring to the attention of this place the plight of thousands of motorists who have been served speeding fines emanating from the new cameras in the newly minted 40k zones around North Bond Avenue and surrounds um, close to the CBD. Now, Madam Speaker, I think it goes without saying that all three parties in this assembly are on the same page when it comes to road safety, but very, very clearly, this has been an extremely perverse outcome. Thousands of individuals have been penalised, and I think it's pretty clear that for the vast majority of those, there was certainly no intent to break the law. And so, irrespective of the signage and irrespective of any information campaign, it's clear that that campaign did not work. Um, Steve has written to me this week. That's not his real name. Steve's work involves driving a lot. He copped a number of fines in the new speed zones, but as is often the case, they took a little while to find him. So recently, Steve was informed that he had exceeded the speed limit on July 6, July 8, July 12, July 13, July 14, July 14 again, and on July 16. Steve has been fined seven times. Now, when he wrote to me, he said, obviously, I was unaware of the change to the speed zone. With seven fines, I will likely lose my licence and lose my job. Life has been a struggle through the COVID year, and now this. I don't want to be unemployed, but how will I be able to get a job without a licence? My office will be writing to the relevant minister about Steve's specific case. Narelle, um, got just the one fine, but she also wrote to us in despair. Narelle is on a disability support pension. She said, there's no way that I can find an extra $300 out of thin air. I currently have $1.29 to my name. And to make it worse, says Narelle, I'm always an overly cautious, over-the-top safe driver. So, Madam Speaker, we echo the concerns that have been expressed by the NRMA regarding the lack of warning to motorists about these changes. The NRA, NRMA position was that there's little point in having a grace period if indeed you don't send written warnings to those who fall foul during that period. And I think to put this into perspective, Madam Speaker, up until the opening of these cameras in the CBD, the most lucrative camera was northbound on the Monero Highway at Hume, and my understanding is that it raised $1.2 million in the eight months to May. The new CBD cameras, and granted there are three of them, but certainly by all reports are doing 1.6 million per week. So the new speed zone cameras are making 44 times as much money per week as the previous highest. And that seems to me to be a perverse outcome. Thank you. Question is the assembly do adjourn. Ms. Fazzarotti. Madam Speaker. I rise today to acknowledge one of the local co community institutions in my local region, the Madura Football Club, and highlight some of the fantastic work that they are doing to promote grassroots sport and build a strong community. While many of us have got swept up in the excitement of the Olympics and might be a little bit tired after staying up late to watch the Matildas, it's important to remember that these elite athletes emerge from our community sports. The world game, football, or what we used to call soccer, is one of the largest participation sports in Australia, with 1.8 million players in 2019. It's a sport that is growing in, in reputation, particularly in relation to women's participation, thanks to role models like Sam Kerr, Ellie Carpenter and Michelle Heyman. 
Here in the ACT, we have a thriving professional and community competition. In 2020, the total participation of football in the ACT was 33,604, despite COVID-19's ma causing major disruption to the competition during the last season. I'd like to acknowledge the work of a previous member of this House, the late Steve Despot, MLA, who was one of the founding members of ACT Football and the dedicated, and a, and the dedicated team at Capital Football who continue to grow the game across the region. However, we know that footballers are passionate and loyal, and I would like to particularly share some of the achievements of my local football club, Majura FC. This is a true community club where the sidelines are full of community catch-up, the parent coaches are passionate, if not still on a learning curve, and the canteen is legendary the only local football club to boast a variety of vegetarian fare. This is a club that knows its demographic. Like many football clubs, it has a strong history and legacy. While incorporated as an association in 1981, its roots are founded, founded in two of the earliest junior football clubs in Canberra, the North Canberra Soccer Club and the Downer United Soccer Club. Today, this club boasts around 1,300 players across a wide range of ages, from the five-year-olds who play the mini roos and the junior leagues to adults who are trying sport the sport for the first time at the age of 45 in the senior competitions. And each week, you'll see the club's white and royal blue strip competing on football fleet fields throughout the Territory. Like most grassroots football clubs, Majura FC's volunteer-led. Every week, parents and friends of the club contribute in a myriad of ways, from coaching and managing teams, to setting up fields, to washing uniforms, to running the Madura's famous canteen, to operating the barbecue, not to mention managing the day-to-day -day affairs of a, beauty, of a busy community club. I was very touched and excited to be invited to be one of the co-patrons this year. While my co-patron, Grace Ma of Canberra United, is a legitimate football superstar, I think that I qualify as the other face of football, the soccer mum. One of the most exciting things that's happening in local so soccer, including at Madura FC, is the growth of women's football. Club stalwart Rhonda Park Parkin is one of the leaders that kicked off women's football in the region, and her work was acknowledged in 2018 when she was inducted into the ACT Women's Honour Roll. In recent years, a Majura FC Skills Academy for players for the under 10 to under 12s category has commenced, and consistent with its ongoing focus in developing female footballers, Almost 80% of the players registered for the Skills Academy in the under-12 category are female. Over the last weekend, I joined co-patron Grace Ma and referee Delphine de Mosky to promote a new campaign to stop abuse of referees in the game. Reduce Abuse is a, is a capital football campaign aimed at uniting the game and, and everyone that is involved in it. In the last five years, there's been a number of campaigns and initiatives aimed at stamping out disrespectful behaviour and abuse of referees. This has seen some improvement, but sadly, abuse is still occurring. This is an, this is an important campaign that will ensure that football continues to grow as a positive force and is fun for all players, volunteers, spectators and referees. Football does have the power to unite us, regardless time, of backgrounds Ms. and beliefs. Ms Fazzarotti, your time has expired. Question is that the Assembly do adjourn. Ms Davidson. Madam Speaker, I rise today to talk about a subject that regulars at Woden Community Council meetings will have heard me speak about frequently over the past decade. The need for multi-use indoor sports courts in the Woden Town Centre that are accessible and affordable for informal volunteer-run community sports groups. Over recent years, the options for indoor sports in the Woden Valley have progressively disappeared. Woden's basketball stadium was demolished, Woden CIT closed, and school sports halls are not enough to meet the growing demand for indoor courts for hire. Many clubs have had to leave Woden to find a venue, and some have closed down when they were unable to find space to play. 
A September 2019 report from the Office of the Commissioner for Sustainability and the Environment highlighted the need for suitable indoor facilities increasing in the future as a result of climate change. We certainly saw this in the summer of 2019-2020 when some summer sports clubs looked for indoor spaces to maintain their training and fitness while unable to play outdoors due to the bushfire smoke. Basketball, netball, futsal, gymnastics, badminton, roller derby, fencing, dance, yoga and many other sports and activities all use similar indoor spaces. As a roller derby skater trying to maintain a happy relationship with a badminton player, which are two sports in strong competition for the same spaces, I can assure you that the increasing pressure on venues for hire is not conducive to harmonious communities. What the Woden Community Council want, and what I have advocated for publicly since at least 2014, according to the Canberra Times, are indoor sports courts in the Woden Town Centre that are accessible by public transport, affordable for volunteer-run community sports groups, and flexible for use for a diverse range of sports. I look forward to one day seeing a return to a multi-court space shared by basketball, roller derby, fencing and badminton players all at the same time. Having a bit more sp space to play means we can focus on competing within our own sports instead of with each other. So I would encourage anyone interested in seeing this idea progress further to take a look at the e-petition currently on the Legislative Assembly website and share it with your friends and local sporting groups. Thank you. Question is the Assembly do now adjourn. Ms Clay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recently had the pleasure of visiting Blewett's Block in Stromlo. I was delighted to visit with the Canberra Ornithologist Group and Friends of Blewett's Block. They showed me around, they pointed out all of the birds I would have missed, and they were even kind enough to lend me some binoculars. We saw lots of other locals enjoying the area on bushwalks, and it certainly seems like a well-loved place. We saw more birds than we expected on a cold morning. Almost at once we were greeted by a scarlet robin, and then a feeding flock of brown, yellow-rumped and buff-rumped thornbills, a grey shrike thrust, spotted pardalotes and weeble. Later on and further up the hill, we saw white-throated tree creepers, two brown falcons and a grey currawong. Blewett's block has high conservation values and it supports high-quality Commonwealth and ACT critically endangered yellow box Blackleys red gum woodland. Canberra Nature Map notes many rare and uncommon plant species that grow there, including late mauve double-tail, double rufous midge orchid, montan leafy greenhood, pink caps, milkmaids, medusa bog's edge and many more. Blewett's Block has many resident birds, and it's also sometimes visited by other threatened woodland birds, like the vulnerable painted honey eater, the little eagle, and it's a seasonal home to the scarlet robin. It's a core breeding area for our vulnerable superb parrots, and it features old growth trees with hollows that are so important for hollow nesting species. And we lost so many of those during our black summer. We really need to take care of the ones we have left. Blewett's Block is also home, and is in fact a national hotspot, for the nationally vulnerable pink-tailed worm lizard. I would love to see Blewett's Block become a bird hotspot in the Malonglo River Nature Reserve and to see it protected from urban development. As we develop Malonglo, we need to make sure we are protecting our wildlife corridors and make sure we are setting up sufficient fire buffers and ecological buffers. Anyone who hasn't visited Blewett's Block yet should get out there and take a look at this beautiful nature area. Question is the Assembly do now adjourn? Mrs. Kicker. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. For many Canberrans, the best place to be at 4 a.m. on a cold winter's morning in Canberra is snuggled up deep under the Duna. But Bromby Fitness, Galapu Galvai Vai, are doing their best to change that. I rise today to thank this community group for all they are doing uh, to help improve the physical and mental well being of their members. Brumby Fitness's Tongan name means Club of the Weak or Elderly. And the group started earlier this year with just five men, one of whom, Doni Duulakidao, was recovering from surgery following serious health issues. Determined not only to recover, but to get stronger, Doni started training at the gym every morning with four mates. As they saw improvement in their own lives, these five original members all of them Australians of Tongan heritage, started thinking about their own families and their community. And as interest spread, Donny and his mates welcomed all comers. They currently have over 50 active members. Over the past several weeks, it has been my privilege to join in as well. 
What a great experience for everyone involved, especially at 4 a.m. Gym sessions run six days per week, still starting at 4 a.m. on weekdays and 4 a.m. on Saturdays. On Mondays, the focus is on weight training and PT. Tuesdays are for more weights and box feet. Cardio and Zumba sessions are held on Wednesdays, followed by weight training and yoga on Thursdays. Participants can enjoy more weight training, plus my, one of my favorite classes is step on Fridays, and Saturdays are considered fun exercise days. Richard Dalmo Beau, a third year medical student, uh, helps members track and track their progress by weighing and measuring them each week. He also provides basic health and nutrition advice. Brumby Fitness, however, don't just focus on physical health. They share a strong desire to improve mental health as well. They do this in part simply by building a strong community and giving people opportunities for social engagement. The pandemic has certainly highlighted for nearly all of us the central importance of belonging to a supportive community. At true to their tongue and name, Brumby Fitness welcome everyone, no matter the current fitness level. Parents have started bringing their children. Special attention is given to make the experience safe and inviting for women and seniors as well. In the process, what started off as five mates keen to improve their health has grown into something that looks and feels more like a family. Everyone is welcome. Everyone is supported and everyone ends up walking out into the cold Canberra morning feeling better physically, feeling better mentally and more prepared for whatever the day holds. Madam Speaker, I express my gratitude to the leadership of the Brumby Fitness, Fihi, Mote, Iwele and Sale, for seeing beyond themselves and their own needs to the needs of the broader community their enthusiasm is infectious. I wish them the very best as they continue to build a strong organization that brings people together in such a positive way. And I also like to thank Diane, the manager of Club Lime at Philip, for all that she has done to make sure that this community meets together on a daily basis at 4 a.m. Thank you. Question is the assembly do now adjourn. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The Assembly stands adjourned until tomorrow at 10am.